All right. Good afternoon. Good evening. It is a pleasure to see everybody here. It's time for the event everybody's been waiting for, especially me. It is time for... Woo! Yes, indeed. Uh, KS-10 AVTR. Short for Kanawa Shoujo 10th Anniversary VTuber Reading. Yes, that's right. Woo! This game is... T this game is 10 years old now. Who can believe it? Yay! So, Yay. Yeah, I feel old. Hell yeah, let's go! Ooh, let's, <laughs> let's go! go. Yeah. Let's go! Yeah. It's, uh, it's more amazing it got done in the first place, to be honest. So. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, that is a feat and a marvel to the anonymous that worked on it. Yes, Especially because like they didn't get paid for it. Like getting people to do stuff that they're paid for is hard <laughs> enough. Yeah, yep. this is this was like the biggest passion project I've ever seen be that successful. Yep. Quote direct quote from the Yeah, direct quote from the devs when somebody asked them if uh, they were accepting donations. They literally said money would kill us. <laughs> Although they also had the uh, excuse that it was a multinational team, so uh there was no practical way to split up the profits anyways. Right. So uh yes. Thank you everybody for coming and especially thank you to the wonderful cast I have gathered here. Again, I took a uh a lot of time, asked around a bunch, had to make sure uh, the right people were playing the right characters, and I think I've gathered a good cast here. Which is the perfect segue to allowing them to introduce themselves from left to right. Starting with... <laughs> oh, my left. Wait, your left or my left? Wait, no, those are the same left. Is it me? Yes, Micers? you. Oh, thank goodness. Okay. Hi, my name is Callie Calico. I'm a magical hook girl. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm supposed to be at home under house arrest, but don't tell my parole officer, okay? <laughs> do, I, do we tell them who we're playing? Yes, well, yes. Well, they already we'll know. All right, uh, today I'm going to be Emmy. And I, I get to make this joke at least once. Um, Lieutenant Dan, what, what did they do? Where are your legs, Lieutenant Dan? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I need to have my castaway moment. Uh, that's actually not where I... God. <laughs> I don't know if I... I was literally just about to say that's not where I thought they were going, but of course. So, uh... Happy New Year, Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. So, uh, I suppose that means our, uh, next, uh, cast member will be introducing themselves. Yes. Hi, so you're so welcome. My name's Ada Wilcott. I'm a sheep doer from the heart of Wales who wants to be an idol, and I'll be playing Lily Sato in uh, this dub. I'm really looking forward to it because um, Katawa Shoujo was like the first ever visual novel I read. It was like a wee Barbie. I probably shouldn't have, but it's, it's very important to me, so I'm I'm very happy to be playing the role of Lily. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, so uh, I should probably explain, uh, those of you who played the game probably know that Lily isn't Welsh, but I could not find a Scott in time, so you get Welsh, Lily. Fucking suck um, it up. But I got him. <laughs> Anyways, uh, <laughs> next castmate, please. Hello, my name is Freya. I'm a Plague Doctor VTuber, and um, I will be playing Hanako. And also, like Ada, uh, this was my very first visual novel, so it's very near and dear to my heart. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Thank you for uh, accepting the invitation, of course, of course. So, next up. Girl, I wanted to be a magician, but I, I didn't do very good at it, so now I'm just some clown on the internet, and I'm, 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 I'm gonna be Misha, I get to be pink! Yes, yes, of course. So, uh, I will admit, uh, Momoko was actually something of a uh, last-minute substitute, so, uh, not only, uh, she basically, uh, decided to just, uh, I sort of blindsided her, asking her, uh, hey, listen, I need, uh, some last-minute help, so, uh, you think you could uh, hop on this project? And she did. She helped. And I appreciate that quite a bit. I'm just glad I can I, I can actually do it. Yep. Yep. Alright. Next up. What up? I'm Toma Keys, your liminal space monkey. I never learned how to read until Katawa showed you. <laughs> yes, that, that, That's a joke. That's a joke. I actually, I, I actually did laugh. I did laugh. It was a you good got a, one. You got a sensible I, chuckle out of me. 
Thank you. Thank you for understanding my humor. Right. So, uh, who she's playing to be rather self-evident by her, uh, lovely PNG, but if she would like to say so anyways. Yes, I will be playing the part of Ren Tezuka. Yes, indeed. There were no, any number of artists I could have chosen to, uh, play her, so, uh, but she just wound up being the, uh, best out of the bunch of, uh, who I asked around, so you get the mocha okay as we're in. Thank, thank you. I'll be you, uh, lend a hand, Toma. I, uh, I will. <laughs> I, mm, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Yep. More puns. More puns. Wonderful. Can I get a Can I get a round of applause, please? A hand, if you will. Just, oh, can Jesus. I get some pachis? Get <laughs> some pachis uh, in the chat, please. Pachis in the chat. Oh, jeez. God, oh. God Almighty. So, uh, <laughs> second to last. Second to last. Hello, everybody. I'm on. Uh, I am everybody's favorite part-time hero, part-time VTuber, full-time dummy head, Yushikin, and I'm going to be playing the role of Nakai Hisao. Uh, I'm really excited to do this. I'm, a little, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to lie, I'm a little nervous, but hey, you know, it be like it is. Right. Yep. He's playing the protagonist. Plenty of pressure on him. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. I think we can do this. I believe in it. Right. He'll put his heart into it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Just, <laughs> just <laughs> don't strain yourself. Just don't strain yourself. We need to beat him with pennies afterwards if he doesn't do well. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. oh. Yep. <laughs> Which Not leaves? Uh, you, yep. Yep. Which of course only leaves one last person to introduce. I am Cliff McConnor. I am some fool who makes music and drinks a bunch. And today, I have corralled a bunch of uh, other VTubers to read this. Uh, Wonderful visual novel that was very near and dear to my heart. So, I'm going to be level with you all. Uh, this was, uh, this visual novel, it would not be an exaggeration to say that it honestly saved my life. This came out, uh, this came out during what was easily the worst period of my life. So, it brought me, uh, it was a bit of a light in the darkness for me, so... When I learned it was turning 10 very soon, I was like, you know what? I need to do something special for this. I need to mark the occasion with a gigantic project. Doesn't matter what it is, I gotta do something for it. And what you're looking at is that something. I think it'll uh, turn out pretty well. Lord knows I put in the work for it. Yeah, you've been, you've been working really hard. Yep. I'm really proud of you. You got this, man. Save the, uh, save the pride for after the stream, will ya? Anyways. So. I'll think about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll think so. about it. Well, Forgive um, me for not shaking your hand, but, you yeah. know, pat, pat yourself on the back. You did good. I will, uh, I will do this. I will do this. Uh, so anyways. Uh, I can see you've done your best. <laughs> I certainly tried to. So, at any rate, I think with all this, uh, so, uh, actually there's a couple of disclosures I need to make. Uh, I've already said so in chat, but I will say, uh, I would like to apologize for, uh, any follow alerts or, uh, subscriptions or, uh, first time chatters I miss. Uh, I put those off just for the sake of not, uh, distracting us from the reading. So, uh, I will, uh, I think I'm going to do it Hall Alive style. I will, uh. Thank everybody after the stream in a segment after uh, we've split off for the day. So, just uh, know that I do appreciate you. I still uh, thank you very much for uh, helping everybody uh, for your support and especially for your viewership. You will get your proper thanks in time, just uh, not immediately. Bear with me. So, with all that introduction, all the explanation out of the way, I think it's time for us to read some kind of a shoujo. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Wait, yeah, what's Kata? What this I've been waiting for? What's Kata was shoujo? Uh, <laughs> some uh. Kata shoujo? I don't know. Some weeb shit. Kata shoujo. Oh, Kata shoujo. Can we say like the 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 funny the funny thing about the name? Um, 
uh, about you, you guys know, like, like Katawa, you're not supposed to, like, y actually use that to, to describe uh, these yes. kind of girls, right? It's yes, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. See, how much of this game's backstory can we explain without falling afoul of Twitch terms of service? I know, I know. I, 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 I can't remember like how actually like inappropriate it is, but technically, technically, it's not a it, for being a weave game. It's it, it, this is English. This was like made by a bunch of English speakers. So like, so like, there's probably not like great. Um, I think the like, best way to put it is that this game is more infamous than it is famous. Pretty much, yeah. pretty much. Uh, yeah, but it's not like it's not like terrible. It's still like it's no, 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 no. It's yeah, not yeah, no, no. terrible. It just it's it's repeti it's it's yes. reputation precedes it. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. The original artist for the concept was writer. You kind of like writer. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. but it is made by like like English speaking like first. It's not like Japanese translated to English. Also, like a lot of visual novels are. Exactly. Exactly. Right, Just for right, anyone right. who doesn't know, you know. Right. Although that said, uh, Garrett Short in the chat actually has the uh, right uh, idea. Its origins are very inappropriate, which uh, we alluded to. But again, there is only so much we can explain without uh, the Twitch cops deciding to bust out my door. So, again, uh, again, that's enough explanation, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, start the game. And, by extension, the reading. Three, two, one, there we go. Also, let me know if the game, uh, how the game volume is. Uh, okay, music might be a little quiet, so uh, let me go ahead and, uh, there we go. All right. So, narrator. That's me, I forgot to mention that. <clears throat> a light breeze causes the naked branches overhead to rattle like wooden wind chimes. This is a popular retreat for couples in the summer. The deciduous trees provide a beautiful green canopy, far out of sight of teachers and fellow students. But now, in late winter, it feels like I'm standing under a pile of kindling. I breathe into my cupped hands and rub them together furiously to prevent them from numbing in this cold. That's how long am I expected to wait out here, anyway? I'm sure the note said 4 o'clock p.m. Ah, oh, yes. The note. Slipped between the pages of my math book while I wasn't looking. As far as cliches go, I'm more a fan of the letter in the locker, but at least this way it shows a bit of initiative. As I ponder the meaning of the note, the snowfall gradually thickens. The snowflakes silently falling from the white-painted sky are the only sign of time passing in this stagnant world. Their slow descent upon the frozen forest makes it seem like time is slow to a crawl. The rustling of dry snow underfoot startles me, interrupting the quiet mood. Someone's approaching me from behind. Someone that I just realized I never cast. So, uh... Who's waiting for this mysterious little lady here? Quickly. Anyone, anyone, come on. I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Sure thing, sure thing. It's how you... You came? A hesitating, barely audible question. However, I recognize the owner of that dainty voice instantly. I feel my heart skip a beat. It's a voice I've listened to hundreds of times, but never is more of an, than an eavesdropper to a conversation. I turn to face this voice, the voice of my dreams, and my heart begins to race. Bright. Iwanako? I got a note telling me to wait here. It was yours? Damn it. I spent all afternoon trying to come up with a good line, and that was the result. Pathetic. Yes. I asked a friend to give you that note. I'm so glad you got it. A shy, joyous smile that makes me so tense I couldn't move a single muscle even if I tried. My heart's pounding now, as if I were trying to burst out from my chest and claim this girl for itself. Here we go. Q. Oh, uh, here we are, out in the cold. Once again, the wind stirs up the branches, like a confidence noise is music to my ears. Iwanako flinches ever so softly against the gust of the wind. 
As it passes, she writes herself, as if supported by some new confidence. Her eyes look with mine, and she lazily twirls her long, dark hair around her finger. All the while, the anxious beating in my heart grows louder. My throat is tight. I doubt I can even force a word out if I tried. You? You see... You? I wanted to know... You? If you'd go out with me? I stand there motionless, save for my pounding heart. I want to say something in reply, but my vocal cords feel like they've been stretched beyond the breaking point. You. Sal? I reach up to try to massage my throat, but there's only some spikes of blinding pain along my arms. Uh, hold on. Turning up the music a little more. Uh, there we go. Should be good now. You. Sal! My whole body <laughs> freezes, save for my eyes, which shoot open in terror. You. Kiss out! <laughs> yep. The beating in my chest suddenly stops, and I go weak at the knees. The world around me, the canopy of bare branches, the dull winter sky, it will not go running towards me. These all fade to black. The last things I remember before slipping away are the sounds of Iwanako screaming for help and the incessant clatter of the branches above. Yep. Ends before it begins, many such cases. And now, first cutscene. I'm gonna go ahead and talk over this. So. There were a lot of animated cutscenes in this game, as uh, those of you who played the game might remember. They were all the work of a single man. Mike and L. Very talented gentleman. Uh, there was actually a blog post on the old blog about all the work he put in. I very... Yep, that Mike and L, Elliot. <laughs> He's very talented, isn't he? Yes, very talented. Again, he animated every single animated cutscene in this game by his lonesome. And furthermore, he actually had to keep it a secret for most of the development cycle. They did not want anybody to know he did these until the game released. Again, uh... Were professionally done, though, if you ask me. Yes, they were very professionally done. He was just a insanely talented dude. Again, I very strongly recommend looking up that blog post about him. Uh, as a matter of fact, let me see if I have time to link that. Nice. No, probably not. At any rate, uh, yes, do look at it yourself and say, um... I recommend the blog in general, the development blog. It was, uh, very, uh, yep. Uh, yes, Shapefish, they will be saved. Not to worry. Anyways, uh... <clears throat> it's been four months since my heart attack. And that whole time, I can probably count the times I've left this hospital room unsupervised on one hand. Four months is a pretty long time when you're left alone with your thoughts. So I've had plenty of time to come to terms with my situation. Arrhythmia. A strange word, a foreign, alien one. One that you don't want to be in the same room with. A rare condition. It causes the heart to act erratically and occasionally beat way too fast. It can be fatal. Apparently I've had it for a long time. They said it was a miracle I was able to go on so long without anything happening. Is that really a miracle? I guess it was supposed to make me feel better, more appreciative of my life. It really didn't do anything to cheer me up. My parents, I think, were hit harder by the news than I was. They practically had two hemorrhages apiece. I already had a full day by then to digest everything. To them, it was all fresh. They were even willing to sell our house in order to pay for a cure. Of course, there isn't a cure. Because of the late discovery of this condition, I had to stay at the hospital to recuperate from the treatments. When I was first admitted, it felt as if I was missed. For about a week, my room in the ward was full of flowers, balloons, and cards. But the visitors soon dwindled and the, all the get-well gifts began trickling down to nothing shortly after. 
I realized that the only reason I'd gotten so many cards and flowers was because sending me their sympathy had been turned into a class project. Maybe some people were genuinely concerned, but I doubt it. Even in the beginning, I barely had visitors. By the end of the first month, only my parents came by on a regular basis. Iwanaka was the last to stop visiting. After six weeks, I never saw her again. We never, had much, we never had that much to talk about when she visited anyways. We didn't touch the subject that was between us on that snowy day ever again. The hospital, uh, it's not really a place I'd like to live in. The doctors and nurses feel so impersonal and faceless. I guess it's because they're in a hurry and they have a million other patients waiting for them, but it makes me feel uncomfortable. For the first month or so, I asked the head cardiologist every time I saw him for a rough estimate of when I'd be able to leave. He never answered anything in a straightforward way, but told me to wait and see if the treatment and surgeries worked. So I hardly observed the scar that the surgeries left on my chest, slowly changed its appearance over time, thinking of it as some kind of omen. I still ask the head of cardiologists about leading, but my expectations are low enough now that I'm not disappointed anymore when I don't get a reply. The way he shuffles around the answer shows that there's at least some hope. At some point, I stopped watching TV. I don't know why, I just did. Maybe it was the wrong kind of escapism for my situation. I started reading instead. There was a small library in the hospital, although it was more like a storeroom for books. I began to work my way through it, one small stack at a time. After consuming them, I'd go back for more. I found that I liked reading, and I think I became a bit addicted. I started feeling naked without a book in my hands. But I loved the stories. That was what my life was like. The days became increasingly harder to distinguish from each other, differing only by the book I was reading and the weather outside. It felt like time blurred into some kind of gooey mass I was trapped inside, instead of moving within. A week had go by without me really noticing it. Sometimes I'd pause in realization that I didn't know what day of the week it was. But other times, all the things that surrounded me would painfully crash into my consciousness through the barrier of nonchalance I'd set myself, set up for myself. The pages of my book would start to feel sharp and burning hot, and the heaviness in my chest would become so hard to bear that I had to put the book aside and just lay down for a while, looking at the ceiling as if I was going to cry. But that happened only rarely. And I couldn't even cry. Today, the doctor gives in and comes in and gives me a smile. He seems excited, but not very. It's like he's trying to make an effort to be happy on my behalf. My parents are here. It's uh, been a few days since I last saw them. Uh, both of them are even sort of dressed up. That's supposed to be some kind of special occasion. It's not a party. There is this ritual the head cardiologist has. Uh, he takes his time, sorting his papers, then setting them aside as if to make a point of the pointlessness of what he just did. Then he casually sits down on the edge of the bed next to me. He looks me in the eyes for a moment. Hello, he sound. How are you today? I don't answer him, but I smile a little back at him. I believe that you can go home. Your heart is stronger now, and with some precautions you should be fine. We have all your medications sorted out. I'll give your father the prescription. The doctor hands a sheet of paper to my dad, whose expression turns wooden as he reads it quickly. So many. I take it from his hand and take a look myself, feeling numb. How am I supposed to react to this? The absurdly long list of medications staring back at me from the paper seems insurmountable. They all blend together in a sea of letters. This is insane. Side effects, adverse effects, contraindications, contraindications, and dosages are listed line after line with cold precision. I try to read them, but it's so futile. I can't understand any of it. Attempting to, attempting to only makes me feel sicker. All of this? For the rest of my life, every day? I'm afraid this is the best that we can do at this point. 
However, new medications are always being developed, so I wouldn't be surprised to see this list fade over time, over the years. Years? What kind of confidence booster is that? I'd have felt better if he hadn't said anything at all. Also, I've spoken with your parents, and we believe that it would be best if you didn't return to your old school. What? Please, calm down, he said. Listen to what the doctor has to say. Calm down? The way he says it tells me he knew full well that I wouldn't like it. Am I going to be homeschooled? Whatever my concern shows, it's ignored. We all understand that your education is paramount. However, I don't think that it's wise for you to be without supervision. At least not until we're sure that your medication is suitable. So I've spoken to your parents about a transfer. It's a school called Yamaku Academy that specializes in dealing with disabled students. Disabled? What? Am I... It has a 24-hour nursing staff and is only a few minutes from a highly regarded general hospital. The majority of the students live on the campus. Think of it as a uh, boarding school of sorts. It's designed to give students a degree of independence while keeping help nearby. Independence? It's a school for disabled kids. I'm trying to disguise that fact. If it was really that free, there wouldn't be a 24-hour nursing staff and you wouldn't make a hospital being nearby a selling point. Of course. Of course, that's only if you want to go, but... Your mother and I aren't really able to homeschool you. We've been out there and had a look a couple of weeks back. I think you'd like it. It looks like I really don't have a choice. Compared to other heart problems, people with your condition usually tend to live long lives. You get a job one day, and this is a good opportunity to continue your education. This isn't an opportunity. Don't call it an opportunity. Don't call it a goddamned opportunity. Well, uh, you should be excited at the chance to go back to school. I remember you wanted to return to school, and, well, it's not the same one. A special school? That's... an insult. That's what I want to say. It's a step down. It's not what you think. All the students there are pretty active in their own sort of way. It's geared towards students I can still get around and learn, but just need a little help in one way or another. Your father's right, and many of the graduates at the school have gone on to do amazing things. A person doesn't have to be held back by their disability. One of my colleagues at another hospital is a graduate. I don't care. A person doesn't have to be held back by their disability. That's what a disability is. I really hate that something so important was decided for me. But what can I do about it? Our normal life is out of the question now. It's funny, I'd always thought my life was actually kind of boring, but now I miss it. I want to protest. I want to blame this lack of reaction on shock or fatigue. I can easily yell out something now, something about how I can go back to school anyways. But, no. I don't say anything. The fact is that I know now it's futile. I look around the room, feeling very tired of all this. The hospital, doctors, my condition, everything. I don't see anything that would make me feel any different. There really isn't a choice. I know this, but the thought of going to a school for disabled school, uh... What does even like? As much as I try to put a positive spin on this, it's very difficult. But let me try. A clean slate isn't a bad thing. That's all I can think of to get me through this. At least I still have something. Even if it's a special school, it's something. It's a fresh start, and my life isn't over. It would be a mistake to just resign myself to thinking that. At the very least, I'll try to see what my new life will look like. Sip time. I promise I won't hog all scenes. Uh, that was a consequence of me not uh, casting correctly. <laughs> But you get more, uh, double duty for me. So, welcome to Yamaku Academy. <clears throat> the gate looked far too pompous for what it was. In fact, gates in general seem to do that, but this one especially so. Red bricks, black wrought iron gray, and black wrought iron and gray plaster assembled into a hole that didn't feel welcoming at all. I wondered if it looked like what a gate for a school should look like, but couldn't really decide. Probably no. Of course, I didn't want to get stuck on thinking about the gate for too long, so I entered through it with a brisk pace that felt surprisingly good. 
Moving forward feels good. So I walk towards the main building of Yamaku Academy with this brisk pace. I'm alone as my parents are taking my stuff to the dorms, and there's supposed to be someone waiting for me. The grounds are incredibly lush, filled with green. It doesn't feel like the kind of grounds a school would have, more like a park, with a clean walkway going past trees and the smell of fresh cut grass and other park-like things. Words like clean and hygienic pop into my mind. It makes me shudder. I shake them off. Stay open-minded now. It's your new life. You have to take it as it comes. That's what I tell myself. A few big buildings loom behind the leafy canopies. Too big and too many for just a school. Everything seems off. It's different from what I thought I knew about schools. It's an uncanny valley. Even though I was told this is my new school, in the back of my head, it doesn't feel like one. I wonder if the feeling is real or caused by my expectations of a school for the disabled. Speaking of that, I don't see anyone else here. It's kind of eerie. It makes me wish that there was somebody here that I could anchor myself to something tangible, instead of having this feeling that I stepped into another dimension. The trees hum with the wind and the green hues flashing all around me catch my attention. <laughs> It makes you think of hospitals again, how they say that the operating rooms are painted green because green's a calming color. So why am I feeling so anxious to smell all this greenery? Only after I stand in front of the haughty main building, I surprise myself by realizing why the gate bothered me. It was the last chance I had to turn back, even if I had no life I could return to. But still, after entering, there was absolutely no way I could go back anymore. Feeling nervous and with this realization set in my head, I open the front door. A tall man with bad posture notices me as I enter. We're the only people in the lobby, so it's only logical. It must be, uh, Ni... uh, Niki? Yep. Nakai. Uh, so you are, excellent. I'm your homeroom and science teacher. My name is Muto. Welcome. We exchange a handshake that's neither firm nor sloppy, and he looks at his watch. The uh, head nurse asks you for a brief check-in visit, but there's no time for that now. Oh. Should I go later? Uh, yes. Afternoon is probably fine. Uh, we should get going and introduce her to the rest of the class. They're waiting already. Waiting for me? I don't really like being the center of attention, but I guess it's inevitable in a situation like this. Somehow, not knowing what's waiting for me makes me feel really nervous. Thinking of this, I almost miss what the teacher's saying. Do you want to uh, introduce yourself to the class? And just like that, we've hit our first decision. So, like any uh, expert visual novel player, I'm going to go ahead and create a safe state. Just so that we can come back to this choice later. Why is obviously the second male choice? Yep. Yeah, why would I want to do that? Gross. Disgusting. Well, fortunately for you guys, uh... I don't recall if I revealed the itinerary, but... Uh, to the viewers, anyways, but... Either way, we are going for the, uh, Sigma male choice. Why? Do I have to? Of course not, that's, uh, why I asked. Right. Let's go, then. My heart is pounding on my chest and it keeps me thinking about my condition as I follow the teacher up the stairs. The third door down the third floor corridor is marked as the classroom for Class 3-3. Muto opens the door and enters. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry I'm late again. I hesitate for a split second at the door, freezing on the spot. Ah, get a grip. This is a big step, I know that, but there isn't any point to worrying so much about it, at least not this soon. I follow the teacher into the classroom and look around, partially so I won't have to meet the curious gazes of my new classmates. It's pretty spacious. The ceiling is unusually high, and there's lots of space left over for around. There's lots of space left over around and in between the desks. An entire wall taken up by blackboards and the high, old fashioned windows only make it seem larger. The students' desks are just standard wooden desks with a shelf underneath for books and wooden chairs with metal frames. Simple and efficient. I stop walking in front of the classroom and face the other students. 
they all look normal, like students at any other school. But then, why would they be here? They're probably like me and have something wrong with them, only it's just not immediately obvious. Then I notice that one of the girls seems to be missing the thumb of her right hand. It's a little jarring. Despite the natural tendency to listen to when someone's talking to you, I tune out of the teacher's speech halfway through the class. I notice a flash of dark hair and see that someone is looking at me. A girl with really long, straight hair that's pretty eye-catching. As she sees me looking back at her, she covers her face with her hands as if it'll make her invisible. There's one boy with a cane leaning against the lockers at the rear of the class. It's weird seeing someone so young with a cane. Another girl seems to be making some weird hand motions. Sign language? She peers at me over the rims of her glasses and goes back to whatever she's doing. She's kind of cute. So is a cheery looking girl with pink hair sitting next to her. She's really hard to miss. I don't know how I didn't notice her the moment I walked in. Please welcome our newest classmate. He claps his hand and so does everyone else, except one girl in the first row who has only one hand. I cringe a little, but hide it by bowing in thanks for this applause I didn't deserve. After the applause, there's a brief silence that nobody seems to want to be responsible for breaking. The teacher soon realizes that he should probably say something. Uh, he opens up with some unintelligible noise, shuts up as he loses momentum, then starts introducing me. Nobody seems to be too interested. Maybe I should have said yes to the self-introduction thing. Good eye, Goose. Probably realizing he doesn't know anything about me, he just ends up saying my name wrong again and asks me to write it on the blackboard. I do that and turn back to face the class, feeling awkward. I listen to the teacher as he drones about getting along while letting my gaze sweep across the classroom. Everyone seems to be listening to him intently, and when he's done, they clap their hands again, which feels like a weird thing to do. The first row girl claps on this round with her one hand against her other wrist that ends in a bandaged stump. It makes me feel a little bad. We're going to be doing some group work today, so uh, that'll give you a chance to talk with everyone. Is that okay with you? Yeah, it's, yeah, uh... It's uh, fine with me. My mistake. Uh, say that line again, please. Yeah, it's fine with me. Don't ask, I'm sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. then, uh, that's good. You can work with Hakamichi. She is the class representative. She can explain anything you might want to know, and, uh, who else would be able to do that better, right? How can I know? The teacher passes out the day's assignments and announces that we'll be working in groups of three. It hits me that I don't know who Hakamichi is. Slow. The teacher seems to catch my helpless expression. Oh, uh, right, uh, Hakamichi is right there. Uh, she's an A, Hakamichi. As he calls out her name, the cute, bubbly looking girl with bright pink hair and gold eyes waves her hand at me. I take a seat next to her, by the window. You. Hey, I guess you're Hakamichi, right? It's nice to meet you. Thank you. Oh, the, oh, the Discord didn't pick up my laugh. Oh, no. <laughs> Here we go. What? I'm cut off guard by your laughter. It's nice to meet you too, but... I'm not Hakamichi, I'm Misha! This is Hakamichi! Shichan! Giggling, Misha points to the girl next to her, the one I saw using sign language before. It looks like she's been staring at me this whole time. She nods once nonchalantly to show that she acknowledges my presence, but only barely. She has short yet carefully, neatly brushed hair, a pair of oval-shaped glasses balanced on the tip of a dainty nose, and dark blue eyes that seem to alternate every few seconds between analytical and slightly bored. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. She immediately looks at Misha, who smiles and makes a few quick gestures with her hands. Hakamichi nods and makes a few gestures of her own. I start to wonder if the teacher was messing with me when saying things like, you'll be able to talk to people and who better to explain things to you. Thank you. I can see you're a little confused, right? But I understand why you would think I was Shichan. Shichan is deaf, so I'm the person who translates things back and forth through her. I'm like an interpreter. She says it's nice to meet you too. You're the new student, aren't you? 
Well, Shichan, of course he is. If he wasn't, he would have been standing up here for no reason, right? Right? Misha looks at me with a weird expression, then continues. We don't know much about him, but maybe we'll find out later. Maybe I should have introduced myself after all. Uh, anything would have given a better first impression than the teacher's drone and fumbling with my name. We knew there was going to be a new student, but we didn't know you would be here today. So soon, Heechan, right? Heechan? Yep, it makes, doesn't it? Did I say that out loud? It's a surprise. I've never liked that nickname. I don't really see how. I wonder why everyone seems to think so. Yep. How come AJ taps her fingers on the desk to get Mesa's attention? They gesture back and forth with each other excitedly, their hands a blur. Mesa seems a little overwhelmed. Mesa stumbles with the hard word a bit, making it stick out in her otherwise fluid translation. Thanks, that'd be pretty helpful. Yeah, I just kind of came straight to class today. about where you're going. I guess I didn't bother to do that, or just didn't care enough to do so. I didn't look forward to this, even if I committed myself. I didn't look forward to this, even if I committed myself to going along with it half-assedly, but anyway. I don't say anything, and Misha signs something that ends in a shrug. What was that? It seems like it was about me. I feel like slumping over in my seat. Both of them are smiling, but that shrug hit me unexpectedly deeply. Stops. <laughs> okay, maybe that's too casual. Maybe she's a name with me more appropriate. Yep, yep, she's an A is fine. Okay, that'd be a lot easier for me. I feel a lot more at ease. Both of them seem so friendly, so I feel like an idiot for being so apprehensive earlier. Especially about Shizune, uh, who I assume would be all business. Well, she still seems like that, just less so, I guess. Huh? Oh, right! We haven't even touched the assignment! We should start work now or Shichan will get mad! The assignment is also kind of long, so we should start now if we want to finish it before the end of class. She's when I glares at the two of us impatiently. I don't need to know sign language to understand that. Okay, okay, I get the message. After class, we can take a walk around the grounds together. It's a nice day today, okay? The assignment's actually very challenging to get through, combining aspects of being both difficult and unnecessarily long. 
Still, we finished a few minutes earlier than anyone else in the class, despite our late start. Shazay and Misha are really capable. They're quite different, though. Uh, the class rep is as calm and professional as she looks, while Misha's a lot more playful and girlish. That's why I'm sort of a little more easily distracted. To be honest, the two of them did most of the work. I feel guilty about that. The clock tower bells ring, signaling the end of the period. Time for lunch. Without knowing what else to do, I follow Misha, who's beckoning me into the hallway and down the stairs. We descend even below the lobby where I met Muto, down to the bottom floor. Just like everything else in the school, the cafeteria seems too spacious and oddly modern in contrast to the classic exterior. Its big windows open to the courtyard, towards the main gate. You cut out a bunch, you're gonna have to do that line again. Oh, sorry! It's the cafeteria! Her enthusiastic statement of the obvious makes people around us stare, but Misha doesn't seem to care, that, so we proceed to the line. There's a rather long list of menu options, which seems great until I realize that many of them are to accommodate, accommodate students who need special diets. How nice. It almost feels like I'm back at the hospital, eating proportions measured with scientific precision to meet the needs of the patients. Stop misclicking, please. I pick something at random and follow Susan into a table, sitting opposite of her. As I nibble indifferently at the food I'd rather not eat, Misha pokes me in the side to get my attention, and points to Susan A. I don't understand signs, so the point escapes me. Maybe looking at a person who talks to you is proper and polite? Do you want to know something? What? About anything! We're your guys, so you should ask if there is something! Hmm. I wonder. Yes, we wonder indeed. So again, uh, we have an intent here, we're on a mission here, so... We're doing a bit of a dick run here. Why the fuck are you deaf? Oh no! So you're... So you're... <laughs> Just ask why someone's deaf? That's rude! So, uh, you're deaf as a post, right? She doesn't intrigues me and I kind of want to ask something about her. But I can't really ask her about something that personal, can I? Uh... I can't come up with anything else to ask, so I just focus on my food while the girls talk between themselves. Misha and Susan and I sign back and forth very animatedly, throwing sideways glances at me, but Misha refrains from translating. Maybe they're talking about sacred girl stuff or something. I quickly notice a conversation in sign is not enough to fill a silence. We arrive in the classroom early, but we're not the first. That dark-haired girl I noticed before slumped over to... <laughs> God. Sorry. Uh, that dark-haired girl I noticed before slumped over at her desk in the last row. She jumps a little when Misha crashes into the room with the elegance of a rhino. She shrinks deeper into her seat. I can feel her tension all the way from here, as if she were slowly turning to stone just from her presence. Misha and Susan either don't notice or don't mind it, as they walk directly past her to their seats and begin to converse. You're trying to get me banned off a twice, woman, come on! I'm left wondering about her, even... I'm left wondering about her, even when the classroom slowly fills with other students and, finally, the teacher. Getting into the rhythm of school feels strange. It's as if my brain remembers how this is done, but my body doesn't. Towards the end of class, I start yawning and counting the minutes left. I shouldn't be this tired on my first day of school. Maybe it's a long time spent in the hospital that made me like this. I've been feeling physically weak and lifeless. Before long, the final bell rings. School is finally over for the day. Beside me, Misha and Susanne are having a short conversation. After a bit of deliberation, Misha turns to me. Around here, I'm sure of it. 
Uh, wait, the teacher said I have to see the nurse. Uh, where do I have to go? Is that so? We can at least show you that much. Come on, the nurses have their own building. We have to go outside. We join the flow of students making their way down the stairwell and outside with the girls pointing up the other senior classroom in the same hallway as ours. When we get outside, the girls make their way to the smaller building right next to the school. It's built in the same style, so it looks like it's actually part of the main building. This is the auxiliary building here. There's a lot of official and important stuff inside, like the Yamaku Foundation office and all the nurses' offices. They even have a swimming pool! How is that official? Building for stuff that has nothing to do with actual education? I guess it's necessary for a place like this. I walk in, hoping that this really will be only a quick visit, like the teacher said. On a white door on the left is a green cross with the text head nurse and a nameplate. Uh, pardon me, gotta find. Uh, where is it? Uh, there it is. So, that's probably brought this up uh, a bit ago, but we have a few cast members who could not make it to this particular stream, slash, cannot, uh, aren't here yet, but will be here later, so, for these people, I have to work with the pre-recorded lines. So, first I will introduce, uh, yeah, we'll get to that. A voice from the inside responds to my knock almost immediately, but I can't quite make it out. It sounded a bit like an invitation to open the door, so I invite myself further in. The room isn't large, and it smells strange. A friendly-looking man turns around in his office chair to face me as I enter. His desk is neat and tidy, but the bin under the table is overflowing with used medical utensils, and there are at least uh, a dozen coffee cup rings lingering around on the desk. Hello there. What can I do for you today? He's young looking and sort of rugged, but the dimples in his cheeks wash that impression away when he smiles. Um, are you the nurse? Why, yes, I am. Uh, it says so on the door, no? You can call me by my name, or just the nurse, like everyone else. Alright, uh, we're not gonna do some last minute volume balancing. Uh... Okay, that's as loud as I can possibly put it, so. Okay, I missed a line back there, but fuck it. Of course, uh, I check off my confusion, realizing I should probably grab his extended hand. His handshake is rather firm and friendly. Q. Oh. Right. Uh, I'm a new student, and my homeroom teacher told me to come and meet you. My name is Hisao Nakai. His eyes light up with revel. His eyes light up with revelation, and he snaps his fingers. Please get the right file. Oh, you're that Nakai. I was just reading your file in the morning. Some kind of chronic arrhythmia and related congenital heart muscle deficiency, right? My mistake, guys. Uh, let me play that line again. Oh, you're that, Nikai. I was just reading your file in the morning. 
Some kind of chronic arrhythmia and related congenital heart muscle deficiency, right? Is that better? He just wants me to sit down in a vacant armchair in front of his desk. Uh, yep. yes. Good. Well, you've probably been briefed about the school enough, so I'll just go over this quickly. We have all kinds of facilities available, mostly physical therapy and such. There's always someone from my staff around, even at night, so never hesitate to call us if there's a problem. The famous 24-hour nursing staff. Wow. This is like a hospital. Well, not exactly. For instance, we don't do brain surgery here. His joke feels so out of place that I'm left thinking why he even said it. Yeah, just that it's really weird to have so many medical people at a school. You'll get used to it. I'm not so sure of that myself, but I don't let the nurse know it. Now, let me just find your file again. <sighs> well, he switches for something from his computer and shuffles stacks of paper around, I let my gaze wander around the room. It's the epitome of generic, I'd like to say. Beige walls and ceiling, gray, dark gray, laminate flooring, and all the equipment you'd expect from a school nurse's office. Even the ridiculous educational posters are hanging on all four walls, reminding me to eat properly, three times a day and from all the food groups. Smiling. The nurse draws a thick file from a stack of similar files and opens it. Alright, uh, there it is. So, you already have medication for the arrhythmia. Just remember to take your pills every morning and evening, or it won't be much help. Apart from that, do you do any sports rash stuff, like... I don't know, boxing? He grins for his own joke, but I don't. Uh, well, I played soccer occasionally with some classmates. Uh. Alright, I'm afraid I'm going to have to recommend you refrain from doing that. At least for the time being. Oh. My lack of reaction makes him raise an eyeball, but really, I'm not too bothered by him forbidding me to kick a ball around. I guess I never did it out of burning passion for the sport, just to have something to do. <laughs> well, you're not going to be the next Captain Zubasa with that attitude. Any kind of concussion might be very dangerous to your heart, and risking another attack is not a good idea. Was the previous one caused by a sudden concussion to the chest area? There's no mention of the cause in your papers. Uh, not exactly. I set up the question acceptably and he glances at me over his papers, with a more serious expression on his face. Still, you need to keep your body healthy, so some exercise would do you good. We have physical therapy and such available as I said, but I don't think you really need such heavy measures. Just get some light exercise regularly. Brisk walks, or even light jogging, jumping rope, that sort of thing. Swimming, maybe? There's a pool here. So I was told. You were? Very good. At any rate, I'm sure you've been told this before. You just need to take care not to overexert yourself. He wags his finger to emphasize the point. No need, really. I've heard this a thousand times already. Absolutely no unnecessary risks. Take care of yourself. Okay. He goes over my papers one more time and sets them on the desk, obviously content. Good. That's it, then. Come meet me if you ever need anything. I mustered out before I even realize it. A quick visit indeed. Alright, uh, I need to call a brief intermission. There's a... Uh, Something I need to do real quick, so uh, please uh, bear with me. I will be, uh, we will be right back momentarily. Please bear with us.
Sorry.
And we're back. Thank you very much uh, for your patience. Uh, Hello. Let's just go ahead and uh, jump back into it then. I end up standing in front of the main building and an auxiliary building. Although, to my eyes, I still look one and the same. It's the first real look I get at the other students, so I watch people coming out of the school, going towards the gate or the dorm. Everyone seems to know where they're going. And I still keep thinking that most of them don't look too special for being students at a special school. Then again, neither do I. Does that make me one of them? One of us? I still got some more to prevent me from getting lost. It's around dinner time, but I feel tired instead of hungry. The weariness of me only grows as I trudge towards the dorms, set a little way apart from the main building complex. There's a garden of sorts between the school and the dorms. Shrubbery, flowers, and that overbilling smell of fresh-cooked grass that fills the atmosphere. It dawns on my tired mind that the smell feels novel because I haven't been outside at all for so long. The dorm building is big and made of red brick. Like the others, it feels way too pompous for what it is, so I push forward, going inside. It takes more time than necessary to fish out the key I was given from my pocket. Thank you. Room 119. Despite the ornate exterior, the inside of the dorm is fairly new, functional, and boring. Just like in the main building, the halls and doors are wide to accommodate wheelchairs. The same goes for the elevators at the ends of the hallways. I poke my head around the corner of the common room door. Inside, a few students are watching television. One nods and gives a quick hello before turning back to the TV. Seems all of the girls around here are sociable. Suppose that's perfectly fine with me. I climb the stairs to the upper floor. Here, small corridors branch off in the main hallway. Each of these minor halls seems to have a toilet and shower, as well as four rooms. About halfway down the hall, I spy room 119. The nameplates on the rooms adjacent to mine are blank. I guess there are just two of us here. Light shines from below the door of room 117, so I knock lightly. Hello? Is anyone home? From inside, I hear a few movements, then the clicking of way more locks than I thought these doors had. After a moment, the door squeaks open. A bespectacled boy is standing in the doorway. He's looking at me very intently through extremely thick eyeglasses. Hmm. Who is it? Alright, unfortunately these files are a bit on the quiet side, so, uh... Hmm. Who is it? Yeah, that one was quiet. You'll have to forget me. Blind? No, at least not completely. Why would he have glasses if he was? He leans closer to me until our noses are almost touching. His breath stinks of garlic. Oh, sup, dude. Uh, Name's Kenji. Uh, whoops. Uh, Hisauna Kai. I'm moving into the next room. I thought I should introduce my... His face suddenly blight brightens in realization, and he stands back upright, thrusting his hand out in a smiling greeting, almost straight into my diaphragm. Oh, sup, dude. Name's Kenji. Thank you. Ah, uh, hi. I take Kenji's sweaty hand and shake it, still a little rattled by the sudden change of attitude and vehement welcome. There were some suspicious-looking people going in and out of your room earlier. Thank you. It was probably my parents. Your parents? You sure? Because they could have been some other people, too. You can't judge a book by its cover. His out of place proverb is left hanging between us awkwardly as I try to think of some way to respond. I'd say the chances are high enough. He shudders and makes some exaggerated hand gestures. <laughs> You're a brave man, Hisao. Me? I don't think I could trust the chances. The only one I trust is myself. Does that mean I shouldn't get to know you, either? He thinks about this for a while. A wise decision. Damn. You're smarter than you look. But 
Probably. What do you look like? I hope not smart. He squints his eyes and leans closer again, but I lean backwards to dodge it. Never mind, it doesn't matter. With that, he turns, fumbles around for a moment in search of the door handle, and shuts the door behind him. I slide the key into the lock of the door, marked 119. Uh, before we move on, uh, that was the voice of Halbernacht, by the way. Halbernacht, I don't think uh, he was included in this cast list you see here. Which was apparently formatted like shit, so I should probably fix that real quick. Police work. Alright, uh, pardon the interruption, let's get back to it. Yes, indeed, he was. That's the reason I picked him up, but unfortunately he uh, couldn't make it to the stream, but again, that's the magic of pre-recording. Bleak beige walls, white linen, a dust made of some type of light wood, ugly curtains. Uh, let me turn the music back up real quick. Uh, there we go. It's no one's room, impersonal like my hospital room was. My bags are sitting at the front of my bed, looking a lot emptier than they did this morning. The closet's sitting open, stocked with my clothes. Also, it seems that like there are a number of school uniforms hanging there as well. A notice pinned to the sleeve of one of the shirts. Hi, Hitan. We've unpacked your things and made your bed. They said that if your things don't fit, then you should go to the office tomorrow. If you have any problems, you can always call us. Love, Mom and Dad. Well, at least we don't have to worry about unpacking. I kind of hope they would have, but then there would have been something to do. It's still too early. I put the note down on the desktop and lie down on the bed, feeling drained. Lying there makes me want to read something, but I have nothing with me. I wonder if the hospital can me for wanting to read whenever I have nothing to do. The restless urge just keeps growing until I have to stand up. Maybe it's stress or something. I was pretty nervous about it before coming, and for the entire day, too. I still am, I think. Damn, I have to distract myself somehow. So I won't be this unnatural all the time. Tomorrow I'll go borrow some books from the library. Yeah, I'll do that. But for now... The bottles of medication is neatly arranged on my night table cast my eye. I pick up one and shake it to see the contents rattle inside. Then read the glued on pharmacy label. Hisao Nakai. Two tablets daily to stay alive. It doesn't really say that, but it could just as well. It's kind of twisted having your life depend on chemicals like this. I resent it a little, but what choice do I have? With a sigh, I begin my new daily ritual of taking the right number of pills from each bottle, being careful to check the correct dosages. I lie down again, feeling hollow and uncertain, and after that I keep staring at the blank, unfamiliar ceiling for a long time. It doesn't start looking any more familiar, not even after darkness falls and long shadows draw across my room like fingers. The streets feel slightly more comfortable, warm, and nest-like against the chill that passes from room temperature here. Soon, the lighter shade of darkness that is the ceiling looks like every ceiling does at night, and it becomes the only thing I recognize anymore. The night beckons me to sleep, and I feel the coldness of unfamiliarity and fear creeping up my spine once again. I keep drifting further away from the world that I knew. <coughs> tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. I wake up in a strange room. Solid morning light shimmers against the gray lights, the light gray ceiling. I'd forgotten to draw the curtains closed last night. I? This is my room, isn't it? My room. This is the third room this year that I'm supposed to call mine. Various things around here remind me that, indeed, it's me who's supposed to be the one living here. My bag's on the floor, my new school book's on the desk, my numerous medications on the night table. 
I stare at the bottles for a moment, deliberating until I open a bottle, shake out a pill, and pop out a tablet from a foil sheet. I download with the chairs of water without thinking about the chemistry. My uniforms are in the closet. I slink out from under the sheets and stretch my back before dressing up. Putting on a new school uniform feels like dressing in someone else's clothes. The artificial smell of generic detergent invades my nose, but I feel like a fresh cloth against my back is a good one, a natural one. It feels like a school uniform, as it should. It's not much different from what I used to wear before. I go through the other things, too. Uh, so far, this place seems more or less like a normal school. Except for the people. I think back to my talk with Kenji yesterday, Misha's constant laughter, and she's in a sweeping sign language gestures. Well, I've only met three students so far. Maybe they're... Maybe they aren't that normal, but I'm sure others are. Or perhaps people like them are what passes for normal around here? Yeah, what does pass for normal around here? What do people do? I don't see a lot of kids hanging around after classes yesterday, uh... So maybe there are clubs? If so, I wonder if I should join one. All over class, the question remains on my mind, so I decided to ask Shizune about it only split into groups. After all, she did say if I had anything I wanted to know, I should ask her. Very helpful, very helpful. She crosses her arms and shifts her gaze slowly to Misha, who looks more preoccupied with trying to grind the eraser of her pencil down so the top is perfect and evenly flat. Hang on, sorry, Discord does not like to pick up me laughing. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Shichan, is there something you wanted from me? Oh, I see! Hmm, that's a good question, Hichan. My first thought is what that means. My first thought is that she means she doesn't know, which is worrying. Maybe I'm being too negative. You think, buddy? Well, anyway, Misa, please don't prove me right. festival about Misha freezes <laughs> I don't know Hishan the truth is it's a local event and I'm not from this area so <laughs> she starts signing desperately to season a asking her to bail her out season a adjusts her glasses at the end of an of the grandiose floors and starts signing hard and heavy Misha puffs her chest out as she shouts Shizune's words out at me with a disproportionate amount of pride. Too loud. I can see heads turning to look in our direction. Not so loud. Human beings evolve with each new generation. The ideals and beliefs behind a festival will inevitably change with time. Now it's about delicious fried food and amusing little games that you play to win prizes. <clears throat> the teacher clears his throat very loudly, batting his long wooden pointer against his other palm like a baton. He shoots a pointed gaze at us. Finally noticing where we are, Misha stifles a yelp and quickly quiets down. She says doesn't seem embarrassed at all, though, brushing it off without a care. We are in the middle of class and should start work. It could have been my eyes playing tricks on me, but I think I saw a suspicious glance exchange between them. 
Misa's tone has also changed, although it doesn't have another word anyway. Yeah, I was thinking about it. Misha and Sis and I look at each other again. I'm about to ask what they have in mind when something dark flutters in my peripheral vision, catching my attention. Out of the corner of my eye, I see the girl with long, dark hair get up from her desk and slip silently towards the door. It doesn't seem like she was working in any group, and no one seems to notice her but me. I glance at the teacher, who is also looking at the dark-haired girl go. Why doesn't he say anything? Huh? Is something wrong? You got cut off at the beginning. Oh, sorry. Heat is something wrong? Do I look as uneasy as I feel? Or was Misha just looking at me, looking after the girl who left? N no, n nothing. Okay, well, like we were asking, you don't have any plans for lunch today, do you? I thought I would go to the library and pick up some books. Not really. Do you want to have lunch together then? Sure. The rest of class passes uneventfully. The girl with the long hair never came back. Very descriptive, Aso. Before I have the time to put any more thought into where she could have gone, the teacher informs us that it's time to stop working. Susan looks more than a little annoyed that we only just barely managed to finish all our work on time. I'm just glad we finished it at all. It's not a contest or anything. Impossible. Really? Really. I've noticed this before, but it's kind of funny how Misha is always moving her hands and signing not only everything she says, but what anyone else is saying at any given time. Obviously, it must be so shizzy I can understand it. Her eyes dart back and forth between Misha's hands and me. I don't know who I'm supposed to be looking at. I'm talking to Misha, but that might be wrong. Maybe I should face Shizune. I'm used to looking in the direction of the person whose voice I'm hearing, but... Really. She says that I can't hear me, but it would be disrespectful to talk to her only through Misha. Then again, isn't that what she's doing? No, she's at least looking at me. This is all very confusing and we'll take some time to get used to. Q. Q. Sorry, I thought I had my thing unmuted. It's not a contest, because contests are competitions over a prize. If there's no prize on the line, it's not really a contest. She's in his eyes flash dangerously with a competitive glare. She stares at me as if surprised that I'm challenging her. I think maybe this is a contest to her. I never noticed before how dark and blue her eyes are. It's truly an alluring gaze. Very sure. <laughs> You're wrong, Heechan! Because I don't want to be the slowest one in the class. Therefore, what's on the line is my confidence and my abilities, and the prize is the satisfaction of proving them! <laughs> so Sunday pushes her glasses up the bridge of her nose in a very matter of fact way. I'd argue more about the bell rings, and she quickly gets up and picks up her bag, looking at me expectantly. I'd almost forgotten that I was supposed to have lunch with them. You got cut off. Damn it. Where do you want to eat? The cafeteria. Plane? Well, I guess. At my old school, I liked to get outside near the back of the building. It was a good spot, but I didn't find it until near the end of my freshman year. I wonder if there's a similar place to eat here. Misha seems to imply as much. Shizuri and Misha pull me towards the cafeteria, which is surprisingly not packed. Maybe some students favor eating in classrooms or outdoors. I saw some of my classmates had box lunches. After we finish eating, Misha picks up where we left off earlier. Oh, he 
pizza and you wanted to know about clubs and stuff, right? Right? <laughs> right, Shichan. Okay, I guess it makes sense to ask first. Exchanging little nods of confirmation, they turn to face me again, and Misa straightens her posture as she's about to deliver a speech. Shichan, do you have anything you're really interested in? I used to play soccer, but I'm not really into it. I don't follow the teams and players or anything like that. As of late, I usually just read a lot. There is a book club, right, Shichan? Right? But it seems like they have all the members they can possibly have right now. Sorry, Shichan. It's a really popular club. Ah, okay. But, more to the point, Shichan, what does this mean that you don't have anything already in mind? Not really. Good! Great! That's great, Heechan! Really great! <laughs> Why is it so great? No reason! Well, Heechan, other than clubs in the upcoming festival, there is one other thing! I see. I didn't know the school had a student council. It was a very melodramatic setup, though, just to tell me that. I'm pretty sure the two of them know this because Susan A looks a little embarrassed about it, and Mesa's laughing. Susan A quickly retakes control of the discussion in a matter of speaking. After all, it's still Mesa who has to voice whatever she says. I'm starting to get the suspicion that Shizan and Misha might not exactly be the most unbiased people to talk about this with. As if reading my mind, Shizan quickly adjusts her glasses and signs something to Misha. I can't tell if she's being genuine or if this is just a really good acting job. Both of them seem to be trying hard to look their cutest, although they already are pretty cute to begin with. Well... Not a game here. Susan seems very intrigued by this when Misha assigns it to her. The aggressive glint returns to her eyes. two both have the same incentive, and therefore the same goal, which is to get me to join the student council, right? Yep! 
Yeah, that isn't my goal. But what this means is that both of you can team up and I'll be at a clear disadvantage. <laughs> so, I'll have to decline. It's hard to tell where Susan's influence ends and Mesa's thoughts begin. In order to atone for hurting a young girl's feelings, you should definitely join the student council. No. How about a game of paper football instead of freshman four man? Paper football? the boys from the slightly older boys? Anyway, I'm not gonna play that either. Just the fact that you know about it means you're probably surprisingly good at it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. How'd you know, Hichon? Susan I frowns at Misha, it's telling me that she probably wasn't supposed to admit that so readily. I wouldn't say that I'm happy with her attempts to get me into the student council, but I'm a little curious about what the student council does here. I'd never been on one before, even known anybody who was a member, so it interests me. I also kind of like Susan Amy, so maybe it wouldn't be that bad. Hey, how about Risk, the game of world domination? I don't know what that is. It's really fun, he shot You fight for control of the world with armies and everything! Sounds like Shizune would be good at it. If you want to play, we can after school! Ah, really, Shichan? We can play just for fun, Hichan. Shichan hasn't played in a long time, so if you want to, there are no strings attached! Oh. Well, okay. Wait, why there? Because that's where we keep the game! <laughs> I grimace to tell them how much I don't like this, but it's more for show than anything. So in the end, I agree, but only after getting Susan to acknowledge that I don't mean anything concrete, just by accepting to take a look around and play a game with her. Once ends and we go back to class. During afternoon classes, the long-haired girl comes back and sits down in her seat without a word. Again, no one seems to notice, or if they do, no one says anything. I want to ask Mesa about it, but I don't want to be nosy. After school, Susan and Mesa quickly find me over the first floor lobby and latch onto me, covering each flank like I might try to escape. I feel a little offended, but I've been considering it. Nevertheless, I'm a little disturbed that enough people have made a break for it in the past that they're on their guard. What's with the escort? This doesn't make me feel very comfortable. In fact, it makes me feel like a dangerous prisoner being transported to a cell. Q? Sorry, I was taking a drink. Uh. I don't know, Misha. This all seems a little sinister to me. I start thinking that when I sit, I start thinking that when we sit down to play the game, they'll tie me down and torture me until I agree to join the student council. Well, that's highly unlikely, but still, for some reason, it just seems like it'd be so plausible. Getting to the student council room is as simple as turning two corners from where we started. What? That's it? 
this makes you guys being on so on top of me seem a little silly. Life is threatened. Her expression on changing, Misha signs something amusedly to Suzanne, who makes a baffling face and puts her hands behind her back, looking pleased with herself. Mm, ha, ha, ha. Misha feigns deafness and hums cheerfully. Stop that, I know you heard me. You have no excuse. I'm like Suzanne. Suzanne opens the door to the student council room. It's a very plain, sparsely decorated room, although it is quite large. Maybe even a little larger than a classroom. There's a big table in the center surrounded by chairs, and a smaller desk prominently placed in the back that I assume is Susan A's. There are a few regular desks and chairs stacked to one side as well. Extras, perhaps? Aside from the tables and chairs, the room doesn't have much else to offer. Just a couple of filing cabinets and bookshelves stacked with old school records and documents. Not much else. In fact... Nothing else. This is a pretty bleak room. They could at least put a potted plant in here or something. But the, modest, but the most noticeable thing that this room doesn't have is other people. Are we early? No. What do you mean, no? Does it mean nobody else is coming today? Before I manage to ask why that's the case, Susan A claps her hands together, very energetically. Hichon, let's play Riz! Come on, you promised it! You, you have to! <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Do you want to know the rules? We can explain to you while we set everything up! While Mesa's talking, Susan A takes out what looks like a board game from behind one of the filing cabinets and throws it out on the table. Actually, this looks kind of interesting. After Misha spent a little too long for her liking running through the basics with a somewhat vague and confusing tutorial, Susan cuts in and declares that the game has started with a decisive motion, slicing her arm through the air. Susan's aggressiveness is rubbing off onto me. I start feeling more competitive than I intended to be when I agreed to this. Halfway into the game, while I try to ponder how to defend against Susan's assault from two fronts, she breaks my concentration by drumming her fingers on the table to get my attention. Hee-chan! She chan wants you to know that you're taking too long to make a move! She chan also says that she'll let you keep Australia if you agree to join the student council! So this is a game with no strings attached. Just the fact that she would dangle that over my head as an offer means that she knows I care about the outcome of this game. And anyway, no. She trying to admires your fighting spirit and would be benevolent dictator who will spare your people if you agree to join the student council. <laughs> You're so competitive, Shizune. She seems to take that as a compliment. I would expect the student council president to be a little more magnanimous. That's correct. Magnanimous? She doesn't seem to know what the word means or how it's signed, so she pulls out a piece of paper and writes it for Susan A, who, in return, signs it back to Misa. Misa presses her index fingers against her temples, as if trying to physically imprint the word into her memory. Suddenly, Susan A bursts into a flurry of gestures. Misa looks daunted by the pace of her heated signing. Tell her I will crush her world empire with my rebellion. Uh, okay. Those eyes of her shine with childlike mischief. She says you have no chance if you keep playing like this. No, you won't. Well, I'm sure we all know what I would pick if I was in this situation. Good old monstacado. Yep. Good old. 
if you uh if you aren't defending your uh risk nation with fucking blue eyes white dragon then what are you doing unfortunately again asshole run so time to turtle up it's like this is just trying to psych me out we have a board again i have a pretty good defense set up and i'm not gonna wreck it doing something reckless a few turns later i lose the game anyway Shizuna adjusts her glasses victoriously and allows herself to tentatively pump a fist in the air in celebration. <laughs> he shot you lost when you allowed me to take North America! I mean, she shot, not me. Getting control of North America is ambitious because it provides a five army bonus, but you can attack it from three fronts, so you must defend them all. I thought you'd have more guts. How disappointing. Ambition, Heechan. Your play needs to be more daring. Ambition, ambition. I was really excited when you took South America, but then you switched to playing defensively just because you gained a small advantage. That's no good, Heechan. You didn't take enough risks, and when you did, you didn't follow through. That's terrible, Heechan. Damn, what's with her if I play too carefully? There's nothing to rub it in my face. I wonder if you'd even be any good for the student council. What's with this reverse psychology? I guess they don't have to worry about joining or not in that case. Giving up just like that? I expected more of you. Seriously, is this any trying to taunt me into joining the council? Besides, I don't even want to join. It's only my second day. I can't make that kind of commitment. I haven't even taken a look at any other clubs yet, and these two, they're a little weird. Fine. I'll consider joining the council, but I want to take a look at the clubs before I decide. Really, Heechan? You're not just saying that to make us feel better? Yeah, yeah. I'm just not sure what I want to do. Okay, Heechan, but we're not going to give up so easily. You said maybe. There's still a chance you'll come around. Come on, we can really have fun. We can play more Risk and maybe one day you can beat me. Unless we graduate before that. That doesn't make me feel any less reluctant about joining, you know. <laughs> Surely you are not that horrible at board games. Maybe we can play a game you know then, to give you a handicap. I might have just said that to make you feel better, after all. Damn. <laughs> Aw, that's cold, Heechan. I take a glance at the clock on the wall and realize I've spent far longer playing Risk than I expected. Sorry, I think I have to go. I want to go to the library. It's not closed yet, is it? Susanna scratches her head and gestures at Mesa. How are we going to be able to determine whether the library is open? There's a clock right there on the wall. It should be, unless the librarian is absent. I think you're right, Shichan. We think the library is open. It's on the second floor. Can't miss it. Do you want us to show you where it is? No thanks. It's okay. See you tomorrow. Bye bye! One flight of stairs up, and I run into problems. The second floor hallway is a carbon copy of the third floor one. Wide, of course, and plain, like always, only hallways can be. The problem is that the library's whereabouts are not as easily determined as one would think. The classrooms are marked with signs stating which class they belong to, but then there's a plethora of other, unmarked rooms. Is the library one of them, or is it just somewhere down the hallway? I bet on the ladder and choose my direction at random. After I turn around the corner, an unmarked door draws my attention because it's not closed. It's not open either, though, just barely a jar so that I can see it's open and nothing else. It makes sense for the library door to be invitingly open, while well, this one's not quite that... it's good enough. 
At the very least, it means that someone's inside and I can ask for directions, for, no matter how embarrassing it is. I gingerly push on the center of the door with my fingertips, every muscle in my arm ready to pull back at a moment's notice. The feeling of being an outsider to the school can't be shaken from my mind, so much so that I instinctively fear doing something wrong by entering. The door slowly creaks as if groaning from a deep sleep, though it's much easier to open than I anticipated. Leaning over and poking my head even further inside to gain inside of the room as fast as possible, the make hello on my lips is quickly snatched away. Where's my choir at? This is not as I was expecting. I mindlessly let the, door, let the door open to its full extent, taking in the sight of the solitary figures taking center stage in the otherwise abandoned room. The situation steals my voice, leaving me standing at the doorway, staring at the beautiful girl. Evidently having taken her time to assess the situation, the girl gently puts down her teacup and opens her eyes, but doesn't look at me. Hello there, may I help you? Staring directly in front of herself, the movement of her lips seems to break the silence. The movement of her lips seems to break the silence rather than the words. However, it's the soft, measured voice that reminds me she's a being separate from the room itself. Not only is she likely the tallest girl I've ever laid eyes on, but even among the foreigners I've met, she's strikingly distinct. Uh, hi. Sorry for intruding. I was just kind of lost. She takes a moment to formulate a response before speaking. Every action she takes feels as if it's carefully choreographed beforehand. Kids, take a seat. Unexpected, considering that I'm intruding upon her. Um, thanks. I slowly step towards another seat opposite her, uh, the girl resting in the teacup and the saucer on the wooden table in between. The way she doesn't track my movements with her head is telling. That and the slight cloudiness to her eyes means that she must be at least partially blind, like Kenji. Come to think of it, her voice doesn't have any detectable accent either. I guess she must be half Japanese. You deaf, bro? As I take my seat, her oh, composer. Yeah. <laughs> As I take my seat, her composer takes me slightly off guard. Her air of relaxed confidence makes the silence entirely comfortable. The calming atmosphere is so very different from a student council office. I take it you're new to Yamaku? Uh, yeah, I just transferred in yesterday. I get the distinct feeling my speech patterns don't match the formality of hers, accentuated by her restrained bow of greeting. One which I hasten to match, before realizing the futility of the action. Lisato, pleased to meet you. So, you sound okay. She gives a nod before gesturing roughly in the direction of her teacup. Would you care for a drink? Sure. As much as it pains me, I can't keep step with her formality in the proceedings. She gives a kind nod, taking the request in stride. Without another word, she steps off the chair and prepares a second cup of tea from a collection of supplies laid out along a shelf. A brush here, a brush there, her left hand often lightly touching the side of whichever container she's pouring into. It seems to be a process she's followed dozens of times before. As I lean sideways to uh, see her on her back, she seems to use her long, dainty finger to measure the right amount of water in the cup. It's one thing to see the different disabilities the students in my class have, but it's quite another to see how everyone seems to adapt. She has said to have no problem working together to communicate to me, and Lily herself seems to have workarounds for problems I'd have never thought of. While I feel slightly guilty about her doing the work, she seems pleased to be following the correct process of the offer of preparing the drink. Oh. Her soft voice brings me out of my silent observance. Which room are you looking for? It's not often this classroom is visited at school. The school library. She's an enemy. I mean, some classmates told me it was on this floor. 
She finishes pouring water into the teacup as she nods, a small metallic tapping coming from the teacup indicating it being stirred. I'm aware, Miss Hakamichi, as are most students. To be with them means you're in Class 3-3, no? That's right, in the science room with Muto. She gives a small giggle before setting down the teaspoon and slowly walking towards the table, teacup and saucer in hand. <laughs> He's quite a character. I imagine you'll come to like him. Most do. As she sets down the tea, I gently take it and have a sip. I'm really more of a coffee person, but this seems like a rather bad moment to bring it up. Somebody's ever drank Earl Grey and it shows. Shit's wonderful. Nonetheless, the smell is quite nice. I hardly think it'd be nice to choke down. Thanks, Salto. It tastes really nice. She smiles and quickly waves her hand in front of her face. Lily, please. There's no need to be so formal. She says that in spite of her exceedingly well-bred speech. Oh well. I guess I should try to ask her about herself, as it really does seem as if she's catering to me. So, oh, which class are you from? I imagine it's one of the third-year classes? Correct. I'm in class 3-2, which is on the third floor. Same as yours. It's taught by Miyagi, and it's specifically for both blind and partially blind students. I see. Uh, I mean, uh, s sorry. I feel like slapping myself with a faux pas. Looking at her face, though, she doesn't seem the least bit put off by it. Hi, my. There's no need to change your speech on my account. Uh, sure, sorry. I... Guess I'm really showing my newness here. Sorry, one sec. Take your time. An environment like this would be a big change, so I can't fault you for it. While the same can't be said for everyone, many have come to terms with their conditions. A category which would include her, it seems. Also ready to jump ship from this particular topic, I segue into another. You come here to drink tea often? It's a really nice place. Thinking on it, this might be her version of the place beyond my school that I like to have lunch at. Yeah, fairly often during your lunch times. My duties as a class representative don't leave enough time for an official club, so a friend and I use this room for having tea. Class representative, huh? Compared to Shizune, her mannerisms seem to be almost completely opposite. While Shizune is blunt and fiercely driven, Lily seems relaxed and calm. Almost aloof. Come to think of it, she might be useful for a less biased view of the school's clubs. What kind of clubs are there to join? Hmm. Well, the more popular ones are the track and field club, which uses the field near the school during lunch times. The baseball club, and the book club near the library. There are also normal small ones, though. You know, uh, please. sorry to interrupt, but your mic's uh, doing something kind of strange. Wait, wait, what? What's it doing? It was like, uh, you sounded it underwater for a moment. Oh, gee, sorry. <laughs> Should right, I do uh, it again? Yes, uh, yes, please. Please do. Okay. Hmm. There we go. The more popular ones are the track and field club, which uses the field near the school during lunch times, the baseball club, and the book club in a room near the library. There are also numerous small ones, too, though, such as the art and music clubs. Perfect. At a time when I'm just wanting to get on my feet, rushing into a club right away seems slightly unappealing. I wonder if the school sayer is the same rule as my old one. Is it compulsory to join a club? It isn't, though it is encouraged. Ah, oh, good. That's a relief. I've really let my guard I've really let down my guard around this girl to let such a thing slip out. The fact seems to slightly amuse her. Not wanting my tea to get cold, I finally start drinking it, as Lily does the same. As I look over to the window over her shoulder, I notice the light coming into the room has a distinctly orange tint. Even here, time doesn't stand still. Oh, huh, the time's gone quickly. Sorry? Uh, pardon me. 
Gotta turn that down. There we go. Right. She's blind. Of course you can't see the sun setting. It just looks like the sun's starting to set. It seems to come as a surprise for her. I guess she must have lost track of the time. Sorry, Hisao. I didn't mean to keep you from the library for so long. I quickly moved to allay to her concern. Uh, no, it's it's okay. The library's still open, isn't it? She pauses and takes a moment to think on it. It's probably something I should have asked Shiz anyone I had the chance, but Lily seems likely to know in any case. True. It's open until 6.30 during weekdays. A quick glance at my watch confirms I have well enough time to get there. Hmm. I might get going in that case. It's been nice talking with you, Lily. She smiles and gives a deep nod, her hands still neatly folded on the table in front of her. It was my pleasure. Oh, come to think of it. Shall I show you to where the library is? I couldn't possibly ask for more help. I should be able to find it all right. Well, unless my navigational skills fail me. Which they seem to have a habit of doing. Quite all right. I was going to be talking to the librarian there. I was going to be talking to the librarian there in any case. I could introduce you. This gets better and better. It's uh, pretty hard to deny her offer. If you're sure, then that'd be great. Thanks. As she stands up to follow me, she takes hold of a straight retractable cane that's been slipped in the handle of her bag on the floor. Compared to the cane the boy in my class had, Lewis looks much thinner and longer. His must be for support, whereas Lilith's is for navigation. Together, we leave the peaceful room and enter the empty hallway on the way to the library. Side by side, my pace carefully slowed to match hers, we slowly walk through the hallway. It doesn't take long for us to arrive at the door to the warm-looking room, apparently situated in the center of the floor, rather than either wing. Ladies first. She gives an appreciative smile at the gesture, taking the lead as we file in. To the left is the wooden library counter, with the library proper being on the right. It easily dwarfs my old school's library, with the distinct smell of old books giving the place an almost old world air. There doesn't seem to be a lot of students here. Considering the time, it isn't a big surprise. Everyone's probably either in the school grounds or the dorms. Yuko, are you here? She says it to thin air since the librarian doesn't seem to be present, and of course Lily can't see this. What's unexpected is that it draws a reaction. Something from under the counter thuds against it, followed by a quiet wail. Aww. The origin, apparently the librarian, quickly crawls out and bounces up to extremely rigid attention. Hi, Lily. How can I help you? Her voice is strained in a failing attempt to sound casual, and she's rubbing the back of her head. Good afternoon. What happened just now? I hear the strange sound. It's nothing. I just hit my head. See, I dropped an eraser under the desk, and while I was looking for it, a pencil dropped, and when I was looking for both of them, you came and surprised me. You're alright. I'm sorry, I couldn't know. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry for making you worry. This is nothing. I've had worse happen to me. She's quick to reverse Lily's apologies, almost frantically trying to push aside the possibility that she could be in any way inconvenienced by bashing her head on the counter. Yes. Worse things have happened. <laughs> the girl fidgets with her fingers as Lily doesn't seem to drop her concerned expression, and then she shuffles some papers around on the counter for no reason. A little shorter than Lily, replete with glasses, freckles, and a very troubled look. She seems to fit a library perfectly. Oh, Lily! Did you get my message? Message? Hmm. Oh, the two imported books arrived? Right, right. They finally came. I can't believe it took so long, but... 
I missed her celebrations, partially for managing to change the topic, I'm sure. She notices me from the corner of her eye and freezes on a spot when she does. Oh no, I'm sorry for not noticing you before. Did you need to check out a book? Or, or return one? I'm sorry, I'm sorry! The way she can so quickly shift between moods is a little unsettling. He's with me, Yuko. This is Hisao, a new student. Hisao, this is Yuko, the school librarian. Pleased to meet you. Hisao, right. Hisao, pleased to meet you too. Hisao. For a second, she visibly attempts to engrave the name on her mind so she won't forget. Yuko often arranges to import foreign books in Braille for me. Would you like to tell Hisao a little something about the library? Lily's innocent suggestion is met with an expression of abject terror. I... Please, Lily, I can't. I don't know what he could be interested in. This is too much responsibility. How it's any responsibility at all, I don't get, but her objection is so sincere. I don't doubt for a second that she would rather disembowel herself on the spot than tell me where the light novels are. That's one of my favorite lines in the game, by the way. <laughs> but... So, there are a lot of books in Braille here. I attempt to save the day by asking the first thing that pops into my head. It seems to work at least partially, as Yuko seems to... I don't expect to relax, but at least looks slightly less tense. Well, I think about a third or a fourth of Yamaku's library is either in Braille or audio. Makes sense, given all the blind students that'd be here. If it's only that, how come this library is so big in the first place? Um, well... We get a lot of new books regularly, because the library is adequately endowed. That's probably why. They spend more on new books than on my salary, and then I have to organize and shelve all of them. It's so troublesome, and they weigh so much. I wish I could quit this job. A very awkward silence following this revelation of too much information. Um, I'll go check the aisles then, if you don't mind. It's probably best for all of us if she doesn't keep talking to me. Very well. Meanwhile, Yuko, I would have these books if it's alright with you. My first impression was right. The library is surprisingly big. Ambling down the narrow aisles, I study the spines of the books in random order, occasionally sliding one out to read the blurb, taking it with me if it looks good. In a few moments, I have a respectable stack of books in my arms. I guess I'll never be stuck for choice in here. The normality of the library sinks in. Sure, there are large print and braille books scattered throughout, but it is what it is. A library. It's just the calm mood from the room I had tea with Lillian snuck with us in here. Unless it was here to begin with. So I about that puts me at ease, just like before. I reach the end of the aisle and find a collection of desks set up for study or personal reading. Going a little further, though, I discover a nice, quiet corner at the back. While the rest of the library has the odd student sitting at a desk, either reading or stealthily sleeping, the back is pretty much deserted. As I glance around, I see someone who I recognize sitting on one of several bean bags. It's the dark-haired girl from my class, the one who snuck out of the classroom earlier. She's reading a book, keeping a closer face, which makes it look like she's really into it. From the way she was acting today, I had her pegged as more of a delinquent than a bookworm. In fact, her mysterious disappearance from the class raises all sorts of whys in my head. Intrigue floats slowly but surely towards the surface, and before I know it, I'm walking towards the mysterious long-haired girl. I, uh, guess there's no harm in introducing myself as I would with anyone else here. She's a classmate, after all. Walking over to another beanbag, I take a seat and lay my books beside it. The girl starts, looking scaredly up at me from underneath her fringe. This is the first time I've seen her this close. Underneath, the long, underneath her long, dense bangs, I can see that part of her face. At least a third, if not half, is pretty badly scarred. My eyes are immediately drawn to the scars, subconsciously peeking past her hair until they meet her own eyes. 
For a second, I'm shocked and divert my eyes to the book in her hands, before I realize that looking away probably only makes it worse. It takes too many seconds to collect myself, and I remember what I walked up to her for. So, uh, fun fact. To this day, I still have no idea which of these is the so-called correct decision. One of these is supposed to put you on the route to Lily slash Hanako, but I still have no idea which one's correct. I have no clue either. <laughs> I didn't figure anyone did. Just to... It's all, it's no, all I, wrong. <laughs> I think kind of just like introducing to yourself to her out the blue would be kind of a dick move, if you ask me. That's uh, my logic, too. So... Again, this is the asshole run, so send it. Let's, uh, forget that she's a shy little baby and introduce ourselves the proper way. Hi, I'm new here. It's Aonakai. We're in the same class. Um, I just transferred here the other day. Maybe you don't remember. The girl still doesn't say a word, but simply stares at me, wide-eyed. I'm still getting used to the place, so I'm trying to meet as many people as I can. So, um, what's your name? Cool. Uh, my cutout. Oh. H Hanako. Her speech is stuttering and so quiet that it's barely audible even in the still library. Somehow I think my delinquent impression of her was wrong. Okay. So, what are you reading? She gently tips the book backwards so that I can read the title at the same time hiding her face behind it. She must have noticed me staring before. Life of Pi? I've never heard of it before. What's it about? Uh, boy? And a tiger? On a boat? I can see this taking some time. Sounds interesting. Is it any good? She nods from behind the book, but stays silent. She looks kind of tense, a bit like Yuko earlier, but in a different way. More like... petrified with terror, I'd say. So, the mystery delinquent girl turned out to be anything but, and she's quivering in a way that makes it look like she's mortally afraid of me. The only way out of this, as far as I can tell, is to try to get a normal conversation going. Is it a library book? I'm looking for new ones to read, but there's just so many. Uh, no, it's mine. Uh, oh, so, so, do you come here often? What a friggin' cliche. <laughs> a huge, huge blush spreads on Hanako's face and her eyes widen far larger than I thought it was possible for eyes to do. Uh-oh. Do you interpret my lame attempt at small talk as a feeble attempt to pick her up? I mean, uh... I didn't mean it like that. I... 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 I've got to go through something! Phew! Without warning, Hanako takes off and runs towards the counter. Her hair-like takeoff catches me so off guard that I don't manage to go after her until she has a good head start. By the time I reach the counter, she's nowhere to be seen. Lily and Yuko are happily chatting away. Knowing that I won't be able to catch Hanako myself, I approach the girls. Hey, did you, uh, did you see, uh, notice a girl run past here? Um, maybe. What did she look like? Long, dark hair. Kind of shy. She had, well, some scars on her face. You wouldn't be talking about Hanako, would you? Yeah, that's her. I saw her reading and tried to talk to her, but I think I scared her off or something. Oh dear. Yuko, would you excuse me? I'd better try and find her. Sure. I'll just hold on to these until you come back. Um, 
What's going on? I'm sorry, but I'll have to explain it to you some other time. Right. I'll see you later, then. Lily hastily grabs her cane and hurries out of the library, leaving me alone with Yuko. I don't think I'll ever get the hang of this place. Did I do something wrong? What did you do? Nothing. I just talked to her. Tried to get to know her. Didn't even manage to get started. Yuko sighs and looks softly bothered, even more so than she did before. I guess you weren't wrong so much as tactless. Tactless? That girl is a bit of a special case. It's like she never really talks to anyone. Isn't that a bit strange? I wonder. It's just how she is, I think. Yuko doesn't sound all that convincing. Then again, maybe this is just the norm around here. Everyone has their own problems or else they wouldn't be here. Perhaps I was being a little tactless after all. But how should I deal with these people? Forcing myself to act overly casual, uh, to act overly casually only makes me feel phony. Like, I was supposed to be ignoring the elephant in the room? Yuko fidgets, looking like she wants to say something to that, but resists it. I think it's an elephant only if you feel that way. I guess she doesn't have a good sense of self-restraint. She makes me smile and she blushes heavily. What? Did that sound stupid? No, no, it, it sounded really wise. I guess you're right, it's more about me than anyone else. Neither of us has anything to add, so Yuko fills his arms by shuffling some papers around. People who have papers on their desks really like doing that. Did you find any books? I should be closing soon. I mean, this library should be closing, but I have to do it. I hope that's not too inconvenient for you. Oh, yeah, I want some books, but I left them over there because... Uh, I'll just go get them. Fetch my sack of books from beside the beanbags where Hanako and I were sitting and return to the counter. Wow, you read a lot, don't you? I surprised myself with that too, honestly. At least, when I really think about it. I had a lot of free time earlier this year, so I just kind of started reading books to fill that time. I couldn't do much else. I see. But she doesn't say anything else and just checks out my books for me. I guess this is what they call tact. Holding the library books with one arm, I draw my pocket for the key to the door. A sudden sound from behind startles me. Making me nearly drop the books I'm carrying or the key that I almost managed to get into the lock. Who is it? I turn around to see who's talking to me. It's Kenji. He seems to be in a friendly mood, although the light glinting off his glasses in the dark gives him a sinister look. It's just me. This makes him pause and lick his lips nervously. Who is me? I don't know anyone called me. Are you some new guy again? His voice is strained and quick. <laughs> I don't think so. What? I would remember someone who I met all yesterday. Yes, but we've what? met before. Yesterday? <sighs> I don't think so. I would remember someone who I met all yesterday. When was that? What day is it today? I try to ignore him. Is he joking or what? Prove that we've met before. You live across the hall. You're Kenji. Kenji jumps back, his eyes filled with an uncomprehending fear. How do you know my name? Damn. This can only mean one of two things. Either we have met, and you are telling the truth, and I just can't remember it, or you are a spy. He pauses. A psychic spy. His eyes just 
dart around me, trying to peek into my room, although it's hard to believe I can say anything through those thick glasses. His mood swung from friendly to manic in less than a minute. I'm not psychic. How do I know that? I'm not a mind reader. Kenji points a finger on my face, damningly. Unlike you. Stop that, man. We, we met yesterday. What's, what's wrong with you? I live in this room. Lies. If you think you can pass a Cizel just because I'm legally blind, you are sorely mistaken. You don't even look like him. I mean, the resemblance is real, real slim. Maybe at a distance. But who do you think you're kidding? I want to grab him by the shoulders and shake him. Exasperated, I rub my eyes and let out a heavy sigh. Stay there. Kenji comes closer, one careful step at a time. I stay still, lest he assault me physically, although I doubt he could do much damage even if he did. Oh wait, I see it now. <laughs> Damn, it really is you. Sighing again, and then once for good measure, once again for good measure, I step backwards, just in case. What's up, man? You don't look too good, I think. Something wrong? I don't know, just had something stupid happen to me. A few stupid things, actually, even if you discount this one. I can't get a proper touch on other people here, and I have no idea if it's because of me or because of them. I don't know why I'm telling this to Kenji. It's not like we've had any contact either. That's rough, dude. Yeah. I'm sorry about calling you a psychic spy and all, but you can never be too careful. It's a hard reality we live in. I'm slowly starting to think that Kenji isn't necessarily living in the same reality as the rest of us. You see? This is how it is this world there is no justice you see even when i lose i win because i don't lose the lesson what does that even mean it doesn't matter he dismisses it flatly with a wave of his hand so what happened why the long face do you have a long face it's nothing. I just scared some girl off accidentally. Literally, too. She actually ran away from me. It was my fault, really, I think. I'm not really used to all this yet. A girl? A cute one? Cute? Uh, that's a hard question. She had a nice body and really beautiful hair. But the face... I guess it could go either way. We all know the real answer to this, but again, asshole run. Not exactly cute, no. Please be the correct line. Hmm. Yep. Perfect. Hmm. Come on. There we go. There are a lot of cute girls here, a strangely disproportionate amount. I believe this is one of the dark secrets of the school. I tried to warn you, man, but you didn't listen. I don't remember any such warning. Dark secrets? Yes, dark secrets. Extremely dark. Like a, like a black hole. Have you ever noticed the number of girls in the school is slightly but significantly higher than the number of boys. It's like 60-40. He turns his head to the left and stares off into the distance at nothing. Why is it like this? I mean, to the untrained eye, it doesn't appear to be that bad. But that's a full 20%. One would think that a school with such a huge pool of women would be a man's dream. But no! What I'm about to tell you could blow your mind. Are you ready? I don't know where this is going, but I think I won't be missing much by cutting out now. No, I'm not ready. I only get as far as turning the doorknob before Kenji starts talking again, showing that he doesn't really care if my mind is blown or not. I believe this school is a battleground, the site of a feminist infiltration. 
This disparity in the number of men to women is a clear sign of how far they have come. In case this Cold War turns hot, they will have superiority in numbers. Just another skirmish in the eternal war against the forces of the feminists. They're everywhere. In Japan, women outnumber men. It's, it's not a 60-40 split, but it's only a matter of time, man. Even in America, women are the majority by a hair. They're building up their numbers. In the past, the buildup of a military has always been the clearest sign of imminent war. Japan is just the first step. Our economy is badass, and the country itself is small and isolated, yet a huge part of the Pacific in terms of political value. The perfect target. <laughs> they are so cunning, as expected of women. Soon, the day will come when... Kenji's voice trails off ominously. That is why you can't trust them. They will string you along, and then kill you, just as they killed me. You will end up just like me. No, hell no. Come on, more enthusiasm. Fine, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. Oh, hell no! I can't stop myself from blurting it out. Hey, what the hell does that mean? You said it, not me. It's the best I can think of. So, you're not supposed to say something like that. Damn, so rude. Where was I? Like, oh yes, the vast feminist conspiracy. Stop, stop. I lost you way back there somewhere. Somewhere around feminist infiltration. Too hard to follow? It's cool. I have some graphs and stuff in my room. And puppets. You like puppets? No puppets. I don't like puppets, okay? Graphs are still cool though, right? He speaks synergetically, responding almost before I'm done talking, moving his hands in an animated way as he continues to rant on. This is too strange. I had him pegged as relatively normal, but it's clear that I was wrong. Something on your mind, dude? thinking about what it's like to be the last sane man in an insane world. Kenji frowns, looking at deeply upset. You mean that's you? That can't be, because I'm the last sane man in an insane world. That is my dream. You can't just steal a man's dream. What the hell? There can't be two last sane men. It would invalidate that whole last part. And that part is kind of important. There can only be one. Like in that foreign movie where there could only be one and in the end there is only one dude left because that was the point I have never seen anyone talk so heatedly and so defensively about absolutely nothing before anyway if you wait here I can get my graphs I also have a list of other dark and complex conspiracies as the school holds as tangled as uh, quick finish my analogy for me be a pal I'm going to bed now. It's extremely late. That doesn't sound like an analogy, but whatever. I like you. You seem like a cool dude. Most people don't understand what I'm talking about when I try to explain the vast feminist conspiracy to them. Denial is a terrible thing. Later. He claps around the back and then vanishes into his room so quickly and quietly, it's like he didn't even open the door, but instead walked right through it like a ghost. I don't know if I can fully digest what just happened, so I give up and just go to my room, picking off my shoes before falling face first into bed. <laughs> it takes me some time to relax and get up so I can get started on homework. It's because the sheets are cool and comforting against my cheeks, and it feels good just lying there with my eyes closed. The school is like some sort of bizarre and surreal island. It's isolated on top of a... <sighs> Shit. It's isolated on top of a mountain, and each person is stranger than the last. I just can't seem to fit in. What irony. One would think that fitting in a place that's made for people who are unfit for anywhere else would be easy. Maybe I'm trying too hard. Although I say that, it doesn't help take the edge off, and the words are left echoing off my empty walls. I guess it's not as bad as I expected, though. This place really is more a school, and less a hospital pretending to be it's a school than I thought it would be. If nothing else, the scenery is beautiful. 
I opened one eye, seeing the school books and bottles of pills arranged side by side on my desktop. Maybe this place is too much like a normal school after all. Another day down. Alright. I feel very tired this morning, probably because yesterday itself was a very tiring day. On top of that, I woke up far earlier than necessary. After saying hi to Shizune and Misha, I start doing the work as instructed from the board. It already looks like today's gonna be heavy. I don't have a problem with that, though. No. Uh, Shizune and Misha might jump on me trying to get an answer about whether or not I decided to join the student council, if it's just one day. I wouldn't put it past them to try, and don't have an answer for them if they do. So, this situation's convenient for me. About ten minutes into class, Haruko walks in and takes a seat, but... No one looks at her. The teacher doesn't even comment on her lateness. He does, however, stop us to say that we're gonna break into groups again. I turn my head and see that Susanne and Misha are looking at me. Susanne gives me a smile that's equal parts cute and menacing. This is a smile that says, We have you now. There is no escape. Misha leans sideways while Susanne pushes her desk closer to mine. There really is no escape now unless I were to jump out the window. Jumping out the window isn't the best option, sadly. Complete missed opportunity, I would have totally picked that. What's wrong, Kitan? Oh! Kitan, have you been thinking about what you said yesterday? You said that you would think about joining the student council, didn't you? It's okay, Hichan. We were talking about it after you left, and it would be rude to expect you to already have an answer for us this early, right? Right! <laughs> I'm so happy to know you two are able to have a laugh at my expense, and even more pleased to know that you both know how crazy the two of you can be. Now that that's over, she's in a snap back into serious mode and smacks today's assignment with the back of her hand in an overly dramatic and important way. When I actually look at the stuff, it's mostly just reading. In fact, there are only two problems. I almost want to say something about how her rush to get started seems a bit much, considering the small amount of work. In fact, she probably knows how little there is and simply doesn't care. Yeah, it seems like workload doesn't matter to her as much as the fact that there is work. The actual amount is unimportant. She approaches everything with the same level of ambition. While I'm reading, I let my eyes wander around the room and catch Hanako trying her hand at solving the problems. It looks like she's working alone. I can't remember seeing her with other people before. Thinking back to how shy she is, it's understandable. Hey, that girl over there. Huh? Who he time? Her. Hanako. Over there? Does she always work alone? Gichan, do you feel sorry for her because she's alone? I was just thinking that maybe she could work with us or something. Hmm, no, I don't think that would be a good idea, Hichan. Why not? Shichan wouldn't get along with her. Why? Misha shuffles around the question, letting out a laugh that sounds very strange. It's nervous, but still has that losing up and down quality present in everything she says. Because, Hee Chan. By cut out. Oh, just because, Hee Chan. But now, Susan has noticed our conversation, and it makes her realize again how Misha's been signing everything she's been saying this whole time. The friend of my enemy is my enemy? That sounds so harsh. I'm not going to say that. You said it anyway. <laughs> I know, Heechan. It's fine to be over here. I wonder if this is Mesa's way of keeping things fair, since without her, I wouldn't be able to understand the things she's saying, and vice versa. Is that also why she signs all the time, so there's never a conversation she's and I will be left out of? Can't 
Anyway, we should start on the problems now, Hee-chan. We finished with time to spare, and I decided to ask if there are any alternatives to the cafeterias. Frankly, the food so far has been subpar. This isn't is any amazing arguing among themselves about their favorite restaurants. All over downtown, so I don't think we have time to go all the way there. And what about the bill? Are they arguing just for the fun of it? Maybe. They seem so distracted by it that they don't even notice the start of the actual lunch break. I look over my shoulder towards the back of a classroom. She seems to be studying her notes from the previous class. It's an odd sight. Everyone else in the class is busying themselves with the lunch break. Socializing, gossiping, rearranging desks, the ones with actual box lunches mixed in and chattering like everyone else, only interrupted by short bouts of eating. But when I watch Hanako, it feels like I'm the only one who can see her. Almost as if she was invisible, like, sort of hiding in plain sight. Is she being bullied? Is she isolating herself from the rest of the class on her own accord? I see her look over her shoulder towards the classroom's rear door. Come to think of it, she hasn't turned a page since I've started watching her. I guess she's waiting for someone. I do what I always do when I don't know what to do. Like now. I've already started on one of the books I borrowed yesterday and took it with me to school to fill the empty moments between classes. I found the page that I creased a corner of to mark the spot I left yesterday night and pick up from there. Mason and Susan are still arguing heatedly, probably about restaurants still. If I joined them, I'd just get caught up in that, or worse, get grilled about joining student council. Mason sure isn't speaking aloud since there's nobody who'd need to hear what they're talking about. But why does she tend to sign things even when Susan doesn't need to understand what's being said, or even more strangely, when Susan's not around at all? What an odd conflict of habits. I find it hard to focus on the book, and besides, a lunch break beckons me to leave the dullness of the classroom. I do so, heading down to the cafeteria. Mission Chisone, having come to a conclusion of one kind or another, follow my wake, though still talking in their animated fashion. Just around the corner of the hallway, something hits me in the chest with the force of a runaway train. Ouch. Opening my eyes, I see a pair of saucer-like green eyes looking up at me. They belong to the perpetrator, a short girl who bumped into me and has now fallen down onto the hallway floor. She wears a PE uniform and a very worried frown. The former strikes me as a rather strange thing to have on during a lunch break. More striking than that, though, is that she doesn't have legs. Oh, or she does, but they're not flesh and bone. Her pale and very much flesh and bone thighs and then shins and feet made of some black metallic or plastic-like material. That looks disturbingly artificial and unnatural. It always makes me forget that my chest is hurting. The girl winces a little, rubs her nose, and jumps up. Uh, oh, man. Hey, are you alright? I'm sorry about that. Really? You? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ah, I wasn't looking where I was going, and you just came out of nowhere. Sorry, sorry! She's looking really apologetic in the hurt puppy way of looking apologetic. I quickly forgot about being angry or anything since her puppies are my weak spot. It's okay, don't worry about it. Ah, ouch. I say that, but there's a stinging pain growing in my chest, and I know that this is about the biggest possible danger on my condition. Don't overexert yourself, don't forget your medication, and most of all, don't get hit in the fucking chest. I try to rub my solar plexus to chase the pain away, holding my breath in an attempt to hear my heartbeat. It seems normal. Hey, should I get a nurse? A worried, high-pitched voice of the girl snaps me out of it. I stared at her for a few seconds dumbfounded until I realized that I probably looked worse off than I really was. Doubled over myself and looking all tense. Damn, I'm overly worried about my heart. No need, uh, I'm fine. Managing to say something in response, I pulled myself upright, feeling my sore ribs one last time and taking a deep breath. 
She just knocked the wind out of me, big time, but it's nothing more than that. Are you sure you're okay? I hit you pretty hard. It's okay. I, I said I was fine and nothing's broken. No harm done. That's good. I was... I feel a hand on my... Ugh, come on. <laughs> I feel a hand on my shoulder at the same time a girl's eyes widen in horror and whatever she was saying, it's interrupted by a very horrified... I don't have time to look behind me because Shizane is already shoving me aside and stomping over to the girl, signing furiously at her. Miss Ibarazaki, I saw that! Running in the halls is strictly forbidden! Misha translates, right on Shizane's tail, but her voice is girlishly playful, not full of the divine fury Shizane's arm movements would seem to call for. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just gonna go get some stuff, but I was kind of in a hurry. You've been told this a thousand times before. Your reckless behavior endangers other students, and even worse, it's explicitly against the school regulations. A girl blushes and starts to fidget nervously, like a little child caught misbehaving. It's so cute that I find myself smiling. I know that. I, I, um, I was just... Make sure that this will not happen again. Although I'm sure telling you this is futile, it only causes me further headache when you choose to ignore the regulations. <laughs> Got that, Emmy? The small girl sticks her tongue out in response. <clears throat> ah! I gotta go! Teacher- oh shit, hang on. <coughs> Teacher will have my head. I promised to help with printouts, but I went running instead. Sorry, but I gotta change and everything. Before Mr. Shizune or I can say anything, she's already bolted from where she was a second ago, almost halfway towards the stairwell. Shizune looks like she's about to go nuclear on the spot, so I smile at her in a vain attempt to calm her down. Are you okay, Hichan? The Ibarazaki girl is always like that, causing trouble to others. You know, I'm pretty certain Shizune wouldn't call me Hichan. Never mind, never mind. Yeah, anyway, I'm okay. Just got the wind knocked out of me. <laughs> That's great, Hee-chan! I wouldn't call that great, but I let it slide this one time. We have to run now. There's an important student council meeting regarding the festival, and we finally decided where to eat! Too bad you can't join, but this lunch meeting is only for council members! We can take you there some other time! Oh, but that'd be like a date, wouldn't it? <laughs> the girls leave for downstairs. I didn't manage to get far from the third floor hallway before this commotion struck, literally. I should get going as well. The lunch and the afternoon class pass uneventfully. I read most of the book I'd started yesterday and eat some of the mostly inedible offerings of the cafeteria. The class is tiresome. The teacher seems like an okay person despite the weird first impression I got, and the material is relatively interesting. However, the way he teaches is really bizarre. It's as if he expects that everyone's a natural genius. When the final bell sounds, I realize that there's still a lot of time left in the day, and I'm left wondering what to do. It's odd. At the hospital, I had 24 hours a day of free time, but here, filling the considerably shorter hours feels difficult. Everyone else leaves, and I'm left alone with the teacher. Mutsu's examining the assignment sheets we were working on earlier and marking them with a red ball pen. Raising his eyes from his papers briefly, he notices me and furrows his brow. What is it, Nakai? I jump at him addressing me, but I guess it's natural to spark some conversations since there's nobody else around. Um, nothing. Thinking about what I do after school. The teacher slowly puts a cap on the pen he was holding and arranges his papers into a stack, clacking it against the desk twice. He seems very methodical, and for a brief moment I'm reminded of Shizune, but the teacher's more unhurried and relaxed. Much more... routined. You... have no plans? 
No, I consider joining a club, but don't know what kind of club would interest me. Go observe a meeting of someone else's club. Might uh, pique your interest. I guess. I just... But I don't know how to continue from there. Mental looks at me in a way that makes me quickly want to take the words back to avoid a conversation. But I can, so I have to forge ahead. I just don't know how to deal with people. I mean, the other students. I'm talking to people and everything, so it's not that I'd be isolated or anything. I just don't know what to think about the disabilities. It's like, it feels that like I'm being impolite if I pay attention to them, and it's weird to ignore them. Damned if I do, damned if I don't. The teacher scratches his cheek absentmindedly, looking very unresponsive. These things are only an issue if you make them one. You can talk normally with someone, even if they're blind or something. Sort of look behind the superficial. There's not a single student here who isn't just a normal kid behind whatever they might seem at first glance. He says the same thing as Yuko did. Or, was, he says the same thing as Yuko did. I know they're right, but it's hard. How can you not consider, for example, Shizune's deafness? Or, uh... When the only way to communicate with her is to talk from Misa. Or Hanako, it's not like you can ignore her face. But... I'm interrupted by the door of the classroom suddenly slamming open. My cut out. Might cut out again. <laughs> well, I, it's gonna do that when I yell, Ah! Teacher! Misha crashes in and straighten in an enthusiastic greeting. Her voice loud and lively enough to cut out in the mic. She shorts towards the teacher's desk with her bouncing step, hands energetically swinging with the rhythm. Muto, visibly dismayed in the interruption, and Misha in general slumps on his chair. Mikado. Misha stops in her tracks and looks around cluelessly, as if she's sensing from his tone that something's wrong, but has no idea what. Yes? We have talked about volume control before. Yes! But she doesn't lower her voice at all, and the teacher just rubs his eyes. So what is it? I... we need help! We're running out of She wears a pink slip of paper she's holding around. So, get, go get more supplies from the art room. What's the problem with that? Plywood! Plywood is always the problem! Last time we wanted more, there was only a little, but that time we just took it all and went with that! Now there's, like, none left there, so do you know where there is some? I don't understand. How would I know? Mutsu looks like he's in great pain, frowning with his entire essence, and Misha doesn't get it at all. Looking at the two of them communicate is terrible, like looking at a man being tortured by drilling a skull open while blasting pop music at full volume at the same time. I'm afraid I have no idea if there's any plywood in the school, let alone where it would be if there was any. Ah, what should I do? Perhaps try to find Mr. Nomia? I'm quite sure he would know where to find everything you need. You have to pry them from his cold, dead hands, but that's a different matter. Ah! I don't have time! We're so busy! She holds her head with both of her hands, looking as despairing as it's possible for a person like her. Without even noticing, she crumples the note she's holding against her hair. I shouldn't even be fetching these things! There's so much to do and we're falling behind the schedule! Mojo looks at her gravely and then suddenly smiles. Smiling doesn't really fit his face. I think it'd be better if he didn't. I wonder if you could get some temporary help. He switches to staring at me focusedly with a hard expression as if trying to say, Go make some friends. 
I guess I can give you a hand. You can? Thanks, Ishan! You really are nice! She pauses, doing a double take, and then points at me with her finger, yelping, Ha! Ah! and looking very puzzled. Come to think of it, what's Ishan doing here? Class is over, you should be having fun! We just, uh, had a little chat. Oh no, it's not detention, is it? Are you in trouble, Hee-chan? No, I'm not. Is he chan in trouble, teacher? No, he's not. Lutho sighs deeply, and I feel that I have to help Misha get her off the teacher's back. So what do you need? Here's a list! I can try to find the plywood from somewhere if there's none in the art room. She offers me the whole note she's holding. I take it, hesitating a bit. Said I'd help you, but this has no implications on whether or not I'm joining this council or not. Aww. Still, thanks, Hee-chan. Try to be quick. We are in stall building streak now. We must hurry, hurry, hurry! She bounces out of the classroom, leaving me and the teacher looking at each other with something that feels like a silent agreement. Well, there you have it, Nakai. You have something to do now. Please don't sound so smug. Looking at the list with a number of items ranging from paint to plywood, all written with small, neat handwriting is, that is undoubtedly Shizune's, I have a sigh. I'll be going then. Waving the long list limply at the teacher, I exit to the hallway. The classrooms closest to ours are designated belonging to classes 3-1 and 3-2 on the right side and 3-4 on the left, each door looking exactly the same. Further down the corridor, still with identical doors, are rooms that I didn't think were used for classes. I guess the art room isn't a classroom as such. I carefully push open the furthest door and peek in. It's a classroom, but it seems rather badly kept or not in use. Am I in the right place? Desks and chairs are all around the room, a thin layer of dust settled on them. There are some easels in the corner, so at least this looks like the right place. The room is flushed in sunlight from the big windows, shadows creeping all over the desks. Specks of dust are dancing in the stagnant air, making the beams of light almost visible. Jokingly, I call into the empty room. Uh, sorry, I'll... There you go. Anybody home? Something catches my eye and I stop mid-sentence. Sitting on a desk is a short-haired girl, curiously wearing a boy's uniform. With a fork between her toes, a morsel of food stuck firmly on the end. This odd way of dining seems to be caused by her apparent lack of hands, but... Her presence here is what makes me take a back- what takes me aback even more. How did I miss her before? She's sitting in a corner very still, but I still somehow took her as part of the furnishing or a statue at first glance. I'm not being too observant today as a whole. This girl seems to be frozen in place, staring at me with her huge eyes like a rabbit in headlights. She's staring at me, her mouth wide open, ready to accept the fork. I'm staring at her, my mouth wide open, so then remembering I didn't finish my sentence and trying to think if I should. This weird stalemate keeps us both stunned into silence, punctuated only by the wall clock ticking rhythmically. Hello? The girl stuffs the forkful in her mouth and is now staring at me expectantly while chewing. This is a bit awkward. Um, hello. I was told to pick up some supplies from here. For some festival stalls, I think. I didn't think there'd be someone here. There isn't. That's why I came here too. She picks up another forkful. Doesn't that mean you're here, then? She raises her eyebrows as if she was suspecting my observation was false. You are pretty observant. I guess it does. But who are you? This girl is pretty straightforward, isn't she? I'm Nakai. He's Sao Nakai. I just transferred in on Monday. I'm Ren. Tezuka Ren. 
Ren Tezuka. I won't shake hands with you, but at least we know who we are now. That's very nice. Her deadpan manner of talking makes it hard to determine whether she's joking about shaking hands or not. It kind of bothers me. Joking about these matters doesn't feel appropriate at all. While I'm trying to figure out what's appropriate and whether this girl is, she seems to have lost interest in me and is now gazing yearningly back at her food. Can I continue my lunch? If you don't mind me, I won't mind you. If you need to get your stuff, the supplies are at the back. Go right ahead, but lunch? School's already over for the day. What word would you use then? There is no word for a meal you eat after lunch, but before dinner, right? It bothers me very much too, but I don't really know what I should say. I don't think you're supposed to eat a meal between lunch and dinner to begin with. But I'm hungry now, and my delicious boxed lunch would go to waste otherwise. I have curry. It's very delicious. With as much with much decisiveness, Rin once again picks up the fork between her toes, and with at least as much impoliteness, she points it straight at me. So, Nakai, what brings you to this place? Like I said, I was told to look for these things. No, the school. From outside, you look fine. Is your problem inside? I come to a full stop, opening my mouth, but not getting a word out. I... I can guess. I'm good at guessing. Better than most people. Ring cuts me off before I can even answer her question, or skirt around it somehow. I don't know which I would have done. I froze in front of this issue again. I haven't even told anyone here about my condition, or maybe it's only because it hasn't really come up. I do get the feeling that not making issues of this is a part of the social code here, as the teacher said. I wonder if the people here can relate. Probably not any better than any normal person could. I can't relate to Shizune's circumstances, or Lily's either. Naturally, while I go through this in my head, Rin keeps considering what my condition could be with an overtly contemplative look on her face. She puts a fork between her lips and leans back, looking at the ceiling as if the answer was written up there. A beam of light illuminates her face on the window side, creating a mask of dark shadow on the other side. I don't think it's anything in your head. And something in your guts would be boringly ordinary. Like this lunch of mine, and less delicious. The problem must be in your pants. This messed up Sherlock Holmes kind of statement and the sheer lack of tact that was delivered with catches me completely off guard. I think I might have reeled back even physically as Rin's eyes widened in revelation and astonishment. So I was right. There's something wrong with your tackle, isn't there? Still partially in shock, but recognizing the need to reply something, I spit out the first thing I could think of. No, nothing like that. I have a heart problem. Arrhythmia. I said it. More like blurted it out, but I said it. The girl in front of me purses her lips together and glowers at me, looking very disappointed. Hmm, how boring. Trouble in the pants would have been much more scandalous. What's with this reaction? I'm sorry to let you down. Forgive you. Just, I collect people, and a person with, you know, that kind of problem would have been really great. Collect people? People with different problems. Huh, oh, so you just, like, go around asking people what's wrong with them? Pretty much. I see. 
With little left to say, Rin resumes her lunch and the conversation dies away. But I keep thinking about what was said. It's the first time I've told anyone else about my condition. All the other people have either known about it already or heard about it from someone else. Or didn't need to know about it like every other student here so far. Should I have told it as a natural part of introductions? Is it expected of me? Hi, I'm Hisao. I have a very serious heart condition. Is that how I'm supposed to go around introducing myself from now on? As if our disabilities would define us. What a disgusting thought. Or maybe the Sezuka girl just has an unnatural interest in such things. As I walk to the back of the room to pick up the items on Misa's list, a uh, chance opens to study room in the corner of my eye. Her hair is a uh, burnt auburn, almost orange, and cropped short. Long hair would probably be impossible with no arms. The boy's uniform and the lack of arms makes her look very thin, almost scrawny. She's not particularly pretty except for her murky green eyes, which flicker recklessly from below her short bangs, even when she eats. The distance and the shadows make it seem like they don't reflect sunlight at all, but instead absorb all of it within them like deep wells. She moves her feet almost as deftly as a normal person would use their arms. However, I can see how the sight could discomfort people, especially while eating. It makes me feel a bit uncomfortable, at least. I hesitate to think about the world unnatural, but it's too late now, isn't it? I keep searching the cabins and shelves for Misa's things, but after enough time passes, the silence grows too uncomfortable, so I try to force some conversation out of this strange girl. So, do you always eat alone and this late? Or do you get the occasional visitor? Visitors, maybe you are my first occasional visitor, but I don't always eat alone either. Sometimes I eat with a certain person on the roof, if she's not horsing around. Horsing? She likes to do sports. Oh. And that's all I can think of to say. Both of us fall silent again as Rin forks the last bits of her meal to her mouth. I look down at my hall and double check it with Mesa's list. It seems to have I, it seems I have everything except plywood. So I think I have all the things now. That's very nice for you. Don't feel obliged to stay. I was about to take a nap anyway. You need to do whatever you're going to do with the stuff anyway, right? Or perhaps you like to watch girls sleeping? I'm not sure what to make of this, but Ren looks serious. Even if I did, I think I have to be going. I, I'll catch you around, Tuska. You can call me Ren. I feel that our relationship is, at this point, good enough to warrant this much. I was already trying to make my exit, but she draws me back in. Fine, then I'm Hesau. Then you are. Rin looks at me hard in the eyes, but that intimidating feeling you get when someone stares at you isn't there. It's like she's actually not looking at me at all. She blinks a couple of times, and I can't figure out why a pause like this just pop between us out of nowhere. See you later, Isao. There's something like a tiny small... Tiny smile there in her face, maybe. I quietly back out of the room as I shut the door in front of my face. I whisper to myself. What an intriguing person. From inside, I hear a muffled sing-song voice. I heard that... 
All right. Uh, if you'll uh, pardon us, we need to call another of our mission real quick. So uh, please bear with us. We'll be back as soon as we can. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for hanging with us so far. We will be right back.
Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. It's good to see you all again. Thank you all again. Uh, thank you all again for bearing with the break. We uh, had to recharge a bit, but we're ready to get back into it. There you go. So, when we last left our intrepid master of romance hero, he had uh, just That's made me. the... Yes, indeed. He... <laughs> Jesus Christ. Uh, sorry. We're uh, sharing stupid things on our Discord. Anyways, uh... So, we just met Rin, was what I meant to say. And her last line was... I heard that. What did she hear? I jump at the sudden appearance of Misu, who I'd not heard approaching despite the completely empty hallway. So I'm actually gotten the jumping distance of me without making a sound. Creepy. It briefly reminds me of Kenji's nutty theory about a global feminist conspiracy, but I push that thought aside. Shizune is standing slightly behind me, so it looks aloof, as she couldn't have heard that remark that drew Misha's attention, but... Misha's visibly excited. <laughs> no, wait! More importantly, who is in there? There's no club meeting today! She tries to curiously peek past me, even though the door prevents her from seeing anyway. What are you doing here? I got you. No, no worries. You took so long that we had to come check what's wrong. That's no good, Hee-chan. He wags her finger at me scoldingly. I found plywood, but everything else is still missing because you're tardy. Oh, sorry. Uh, I got the things here. I was just going to bring them. I think you were up to some mischief, Heechan! Who was in there with you, I wonder? Misha signed something quickly to Shizune, pointing out her own ear a couple of times. Shizune immediately pushes her way past me and opens the door into the classroom I just left. I can only imagine the shock she's experiencing. With Shizune's diligence and attitude, the insolence of daring to deface school property by sleeping on top of it must be too much to bear. And indeed, she stares at Rin, frozen in place apart from the slight but noticeable trembling of her shoulders, from suppressed rage, I'm sure. Instead of blowing up, Shizune just takes a few deep breaths, adjusts her glasses and slams the door shut turning to sign furiously at Misha. Maybe she did blow up, but I can't understand it. She shoots a very loaded stare at me, too, as if it was somehow my fault that Ren is sleeping on one of the tables. I hope she's not getting any funny ideas about the reason of my tardiness. Hello? Alright, I'm back. Sorry about that. Hmm? Rin's voice comes from the other side of the door, and it takes a few eye blinks to realize she might have trouble opening it. I open the door to find Rin directly behind us, looking at us with a half-interested, half-sleepy face. Hello. Miss Tezuka, what do you think you are doing? You absolutely are not permitted to use school property for such... uh... disgraceful? Activity! It sure is suddenly very crowded in here. I didn't know I was this popular. It's hard to say whether she's happy or unhappy about this turn of events. At any rate, she ignores Shizune slash Mesa's scolding, so they have no choice but to drop the issue. Shizune taps Mesa's shoulder, points at Rin, and makes some quick signs. Anymore. Anyway, how is your project going? Will it be done for the festival? 
Rin looks at them blankly. Apparently, it is under the pressure of Shizune's cold stare is putting on her. I keep wondering about that myself, too. And? We'll think about it harder. As Misha sends a reply to Shizune, her face turns into an unsatisfied frown. Seriously, it'll be a disaster if the wall looks like someone threw up their lunch onto it. Ren nods assertively. We'll think more seriously. Misha actually giggles at that, but Shizune doesn't. Not even after translation. She just shakes her head, takes the materials from me, and takes off with Misha in tow. Ren frowns thoughtfully as she looks out to the retreating student council duo. How rude. It's true, though. I must finish my project before the weekend. There will be dire consequences if I don't. The end of the world as we know it. Like weekends usually are, but more dire. Much more dire. Maybe I'll postpone my nap to unforeseen future. I'm about to ask what project she has and what are these apocalyptic consequences, but she walks back into the art classroom. Since you have nothing to do, would you give me a hand? This paint can doesn't fit into my bag, but I need it. She kicks lightly at a huge can of paint that's lying on the floor next to the table she was sitting and sleeping on. It lets out a dull clang. Being the gentleman I am, I naturally pick it up. Heavy. Yeah, sure. Where do you need to take it? Away. And with that, she takes off through the hallway, me and the paint can following since there's little choice for either of us. The hallway is quiet and empty now with Shizune and Misha gone, so we too leave towards the stairwell at the other end. Every 10 or 15 or 20 steps, I have to change the can from one hand to another because the thin handle cuts into my palm. It just gets my arms from tiring too fast. Rin strolls on beside me with an uneven pace and I have trouble matching her. Maybe I'm walking weird because of the extra weight. It seems one of us is constantly walking too slow or too fast, and I can't figure out which. Two flights of stairs below, trouble appears in the form of the head nurse and his fox-like grin. Ah, Mr. Nakai, what a happy coincidence. Tezuka too, of course. He nods courteously to Rin, who does not acknowledge him back, then turns to me because obviously it's me who he has a business with. There is something I forgot to mention on Monday. I nod and wait impassively because I can't even begin to guess what he forgot. The feeling of the handle delving deeper into my skin doesn't make me feel enthusiastic about this interruption either. It's about your medications. Since you haven't been that long on your current medications, there might be some unexpected side effects, which might require adjusting dosages or even changing to another kind of medication. So we will do a few tests regularly, but what I'd want is for you to keep an eye on everything in your condition that feels off if you get what I mean. Nausea, headache, anything. And come see me if something happens. All right. So how are you? Everything fine? I give up and drop a can to the floor before answering him. Apparently this takes longer than my biceps can handle. I was about to say something generic as an answer, but then I realized how often I've done that lately. Other people have asked me that too. Teachers and students here, my parents, visitors, nurses, doctors at the hospital. Everyone seems to be concerned about that. It's natural for a hospital, not so much for a school. Except this school. This is a small school, and both the student base and the faculty seem to be very tightly knit. At least, that's a feeling I'm getting. And this is not the kind of school that gets transfer students too often. 
I thought some shivers up my spine, bud. I give a generic answer anyway. That's great. Also, one other thing. My sources tell me that you've been at neither the school track nor even the pool, so I'd like to know if you've taken up exercising as I asked. Of course I haven't, but his way of inquiring gives me the feeling that I should have been running my ass off on the track since the very first day. Do you have people spying on me? Not as such. I just happen to know a few people. But that's not the issue here, so don't try to slip out of it. Well, I was actually just doing some impro improvised weightlifting as an exercise. I pick up and lift the can up and down a few times like some sad imitation of a bodybuilder, even though it's weighing down my arms painfully. The stupid grin disappears from his face for a second, then comes back like it was never gone. Tezuka, would you give us a second? The nurse grabs me by the shoulder without waiting for Rin's permission, which he didn't need in the first place, and drags me aside. When I told you to exercise, I wasn't joking. I understand you're still on your first week and all, but please don't ignore the importance of this. The reason I'm coming down this hard on you is that habits are not easy to form. The more you slip and postpone, the harder it'll be. It's the same with everything, like dieting. Can you promise me to be more serious about this from now on? Not even going to bother with the uh, justification. We all know we're going for the manly picnic, so... Maybe. No, I mean... He gives me a nasty sort of look when I say that, making me try to back... making me try to take back the word. I mean, I don't know. I'm still trying to get used to the school. I'll promise to try, though. You're not being very convincing there, Hiseo. Tip number one. Medical professionals are not amused if you take their advice lightly. What's up with him? As if a day or two would make that much of a difference. I didn't do anything at the hospital, either. Yeah, okay. Sorry. He stutters me for a moment and then shrugs, smiling again. Okay, that's more like it. If you go to the school track tomorrow morning, you'll meet my spy, who probably has no qualms offering consultation to you if you want to jog a bit. Consultation? See you around. He leaves with a wave of his hand and no, uh, no answer. And I walked over in as we were waiting, idly leaning against the hallway wall and staring at the pale lighting fixtures at the ceiling. Even when I approached it, it would move her eyes off of them. Were you getting medications for your heart thingy? Were you listening? It comes out more accusatory than I intended, accidentally lashing out on her. But even so, I don't really want to start talking about it. I just met her, I don't know her. It's not her business. The nurse seems to be happily ignorant about confidentiality, too, talking about that kind of thing in public. But that's not Rin's fault, is it? I look up at her, suddenly feeling a bit guilty, but Rin is just staring past my shoulder quizzically, her head tilted like a bird's. <sighs> I don't know why this is so hard for me. It feels like there's some inexplicable lock that prevents me from being more upfront about this. Yeah. They're for my heart. Will they make you better? No, not really. They just make me a little less worse. Rin keeps looking at me for a little while longer, and she neither says anything further nor displays any kind of emotion that I could discern. I'm thankful that she doesn't. I think I'm still not quite used to all this. At the hospital, it was easy, but I still haven't sort of my feelings about having to live a normal life with a disability. We leave the main building, and Rin leads us onwards towards the dorm. We stop at the small patch of granary in front of the dorm building. The dorm is built on a slightly elevated ground, with a wall and a few trees that everyone has to circle around every time they come or go. It's probably the only inconvenient design in the school. The entire wall, made of the same kind of bricks as the building itself, has been covered with some sort of a painting. 
Most of it is still mere sketches, quick lines drawn with black and white against the gray plastering that covers almost the entire length of the wall, but some places look a bit more finished. There are human faces and legs and hands. I can't quite say what the painting as a whole might portray. Stacks of what seem to be paint cans are arranged in piles on the ground beside the wall. See? The left side is hardly off the ground yet. It's because I couldn't get in the mood yesterday, so I gave up and went to meditate instead. Then it was suddenly morning. You have to work on it, but the guys from art class are helping with negative spaces and base surfaces. Whenever, which is a problem. It's easier to paint big areas if there are a lot of people with hands. The reach is better. And it's faster, too. She goes on a tangent of a tangent, waving a little with her arm or whatever of it there actually is to demonstrate, to demonstrate, even though I got the point already. The white cotton of her sleeve flaps around and it makes me think it could look sadder than it does. But it makes me feel out of place, like almost every tangible reminder of the student base's uh, special properties this has in the past few days. <laughs> this girl doesn't notice my dreary feelings, of course, or the fact that she lost me a while ago already and just keeps on blabbering. So, that's why I'm trying to figure out if there is something I need to figure out. And then figure that out before it's too late and all hope is lost. Why would the hope be lost? Because paint has to be painted, and then it has to dry, and then it has to be painted over with another kind of paint. It takes time. She finally stops, apparently thinking she made some kind of a statement that makes sense. I think it's best to start from the top. So, this is your project? You did this? Yes. Yes. All of it? Yeah. Nice, but... I stumble with my words, suddenly feeling like I'm... Suddenly feeling like I've walked straight into the minefield of political incorrectness. It's okay. You can say it. I probably won't get mad. I blush really hard. I don't know what would be the right thing to say, if any. It feels like that I'm way more sensitive than Rin is, though. This is really awkward. Don't you want to ask? How oh, do you paint without hands? See, I'm an easy person to talk to, right? With my feet. I almost guessed that already, but isn't that hard to do? You're good at guessing. Anyway, I don't think it is, but maybe I'm used to it by now. I can't get my mind around the fact that she could be an artist, but seeing how adept she was using her feet to eat, I figure painting might not be a problem either. Neither of us has anything more to add to the subject. The afternoon light works pretty well. I was afraid it would look too flat, but it's not like that after all. I think it's actually pretty interesting. I wanted to see what it looks like in dim light. Do you think it's flat? Well, paintings tend to be flat. Mm, not like that flat. You know, flat. Like... Some people are no substance, no meat, where there should be some, you know? Uh, hold on, we missed, uh, there we go. Missed a line. I know a few girls who. Okay, I get it, but I couldn't really tell. I'm not that good with art. I can't name many artists or artistic terms. 
So I don't really have anything to say. Ren shrugs her shoulders at that, saying, suit yourself, without saying it, and looks up at the sky as if trying to look for something up there. I didn't think I'd get any actual work done, but if you give me a hand with the paints, I could do a little before it's too dark. I wanted to get a halogen lamp, like the ones they have in the sports track, but there aren't any. Rin sure is quick to recruit my help, as was Susan, eh? It really makes me feel that the festival is such a big project that every pair of hands is needed. Why not? I'm not really sure if I can be any help, though. It's just mixing some paints. You can do that, probably. Uh, do you have motor control problems? Like, you know, those people who have some? Cerebral palsy, maybe. Not that I know of. Thingy has nothing to do with that. She gives me a sly look for no reason. No, it doesn't. Let's do it then. So she sits on an empty wooden box and very naturally picks up a wide brush between the toes of her bare right foot. I open a few of the cans and pour some of the content into shallow bowls for mixing. The thick paints flow lazily from the can to the bowl. Like syrup. This is making me hungry. I mix them, creating funny, hypnotic-looking swirl patterns that melt quickly into each other to form a new monotone hue. Ren sets to work, every now and then asking me for a hand with something or the other. Finding different brushes is easy enough, but mixing the paints to be the exact tone the squirrel is barely seeing in her head is a frustrating ordeal. She wants precision down to the last millimeter before she's satisfied, but her instructions are obscure at best. Add half a splash of green. I crouch down to pick up the can of bright green. The other green. This green. I carefully pour some of the other green paint into the mixing bowl. No. That's almost a whole splash. More white. Is green a good color to add? Hmm. No idea. You're the artist here. A hint of a smile appears on the corners of her mouth. Do you lack an opinion? No, it's just that I have no idea. It's okay, because I just got an idea. Add more white. With this exclamation, I pour a minuscule amount of wine into the bowl and mix it. It looks slightly... whiter. That's not good. It has to be like... like the color when you wake up and, you know, that you saw the meaning of life in your dream but can't remember it. Maybe it's yellow? Despite the impossibility of mixing a color like that change of seasons or any other nonsense that's being imposed on me, I find myself enjoying it more than I thought I would. Seeing a painting being born on the plastered wall feels like magic. I spend the moments I have between mixing paints, crouching down on the paving, and just looking at her work. It feels slightly intrusive at first, like bringing some imaginary intimacy, but Rin doesn't seem to mind in the least bit. Maybe it's just in my head. Her entire presence of it's a completely different era. She patiently works the layer details, adding layers of paint on top of other layers of paint, steadily moving the f moving, moving her foot across the wall to add new shapes. While I manage to produce a passable mixture of paint, the rare smile on her face is oddly rewarding. Apart from the few words when discussing paint mixes, neither of us says a word for the longest time. And even those short discussions would evolve into a shorthand, both of us developing and using weird, impromptu code words for various pants and hues. As if there was some need to conserve words and breath and sound. We stay there late into the evening until it becomes too dark to paint properly.
The sound of an alarm pulls me out of a fitful slumber and into the unpleasant state of wakefulness. I relay, bro. I linger under the blanket for a few minutes, gathering energy to rise up while making excuses for why I already haven't. Honestly, I wouldn't mind staying here for all day. School is surprisingly exhausting after a long pause, and the culture shock still hasn't faded, I think. Still, despite the impression that skipping class is easy here, I don't think they're going to let me get away that easily. And the nurse is bound to keep breathing down my neck with the talk of exercising as well. So eventually I do rise up, swallow the morning medications, and put on my old soccer clothing. Next to my condition, I was exempted from taking part in gym classes at Yamaku, so I didn't get issued with a gym outfit. I'd order some to cover such a contingency, but wearing my old soccer clothes is kind of nostalgic. I can't use them for that anymore, so maybe they can get a new life this way. A bit like me. This is a bit stupid to me, really. But I suppose this way, at least I can tell the nurse that, honestly, that I'm doing something about my health. Not that I was ever much of a runner to begin with. Can't hurt to try, I guess. I'm surprised to discover that I'm not the only one present at the track. Not just that, but it's a face I've seen before. The prosthetic-legged girl who bowled me over in the hallway yesterday is running on the track lightly, like a half-mechanical gazelle. What was her name again? It was a short one, but I can't remember, and I don't care because she almost kills me. She seems to be running on laps at a somewhat easy lope, her prosthetic legs clacking rhythmically on the hard track surface. I wonder what reason she has for running this early in the morning. Maybe it's something again to mind and the nurse is oppressing the poor girl to jog just like he's oppressing me. I certainly wouldn't be here if it weren't for my health and is prompting me to do so. And even with things being like they are, it's only because I wanted to get out of the way early. The fact that I would be less likely to encounter someone who would witness my pitiful attempts to get in shape was merely a happy accident. I'd leave, but it seems that my former assailant noticed me on her last lap. She waves at me cheerfully and jogs over. Good morning! Your name is Asao, right? She grins, seemingly pleased that she'd remember my name. <laughs> you may not remember me. Emmy? I knocked you over in the hall yesterday. Miss I oh my god. Ibarazaki. Ibarazaki. She imitates Misha imitating Shizune, failing to get the same kind of subdued lilt into her high-pitched voice. How could I forget such a, uh, uh blunt introduction? Emmy has a tendency to look vaguely apologetic for a moment before giggling. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Again. Hmm, well, so long as you don't make a habit of it. I suppose I'll be fine. Great! I'm not sure she realized I was joking. That was a spy consultant the nurse was talking about. Is that actually you? <laughs> That's right! Oh. I was expecting someone from the nursing staff, to be honest. What? Are you saying I don't look like I could be a spy? No, this is more like a relief. I was afraid you would have someone to watch my every move. Unless you're here to do exactly that? <laughs> no, I'm here for my own reasons. The nurse just asked me if I had seen a messy-haired transfer student who looks like he's kinda lost around the track. So, why are you down here? Emmy strikes a dramatic pose. <laughs> Training. For what? Track. Oh, I see. You're on the track team, then. Emmy nods enthusiastically. Yep, I'm one of the better runners, too. And modest about it, too. Hey, you should join up. It's good exercise, you know. I think that much activity is probably out of the question for me. No, I'm not even sure that I really like running all that much. Plus, I'm not... I'm just not into organized sports, you know? It's true, I... never even really got that much into soccer. 
I mean, I went around with my friends and all, but that was really the only reason I ever played. It wasn't for the glory to be found on the field, that's for sure. Emmy seems to understand my meaning. I see, I see. Not into the whole organization thing. But now that you're here, I guess we're gonna run together, huh? What? What? Uh, sure, I guess. <laughs> Emmy seems pleased. Are you gonna warm up? Real men don't warm up. Mm, oh no, you always should warm up. Bad, Hisao! She scolds me enthusiastically, but then smiles and leans closer. <laughs> I hate warming up, too. She laughs suddenly. <laughs> Heck, and I don't even have to stretch my legs! As if I confirm her statement, she bounces up and down a couple of times, giving a passing impression of standing on a pair of springs. Her leg blades seem to be quite elastic. Let's go! So we both take off her on the track, and I can immediately see that she wasn't lying about being good at running. And it was fluidly, throwing herself in on the run with a sort of wild abandon. I find myself concentrating more on running properly. Frankly, I don't remember if there's any particular form for running, but I can't help but feel like I'm doing it wrong somehow. I feel awkward in comparison to Amy, who never seems to break stride. I don't think I want to do this anymore. I'm really not feeling up to more than a couple of laughs a day and slow to a walk pretty quickly. And he keeps running and doesn't seem to notice I've stopped until she passes me a second time. She quickly skids to a halt, breathing steadily and contracts my own somewhat gasping demeanor. Finished already? I hang my head ruefully. Yeah. I'm not in very good shape right now. Hemi nods and then grins at me again. She seems to do a lot of smiling. Well, the important thing is you started, right? <laughs> Next time, you're just gonna have to try to hold out longer, and then longer and longer, and eventually you'll be great! I'll keep that in mind. But I think right now I'm gonna go get ready for class. Shouldn't you? Emmy shrugs unconcernedly. Nah, I've got plenty of time. I notice that she's not wearing a watch. Are you sure? Another careless shrug. Not really, but I've got to finish my routine. See you later, Hisao. Uh, yeah, see ya. Apart from feeling more tired than before, I don't think I accomplished anything today. I'm so out of shape, it's embarrassing. This whole thing might have been a waste of time. I'll find some other way. I head back to the dorms to wash and change into my uniform, trying to resist the urge to take a really long and hot shower. Oh dear. Oh no. <sighs> Fuck it, you only live once. I'm tired from all the running, so I just want to unwind, but I don't want to break my slowly building routine of getting to school before the morning rush. After taking a long shower anyway, I dry myself off and get out of the stall to put on my clothes. Out of nowhere, a shadow appears in the mist, looming and radiating on Melissa's intent. It bursts through the fog. So. What are you doing in here? What the hell? You scared me. What's your problem? I should be asking you that. I've been looking for you all over the place, man. What do you mean all over the place? You know, your room and... Frick. I want to ask if he's been looking for me like that. Stark naked, but hold my tongue back. I finally realize I'm still naked too, and quickly hold up my shirt in front of me, but Kenji doesn't seem to notice a thing. His glasses are fogged up, but then why doesn't he wipe them off? Is his vision so bad it's like it's perpetually seeing for fog? You know, your room and... Yeah, that's it. Hey, I mean, I still had to get up though. Whatever. It's not important. Can I borrow some money? 
He puts on an innocent face and looks away, trying very hard to look casual. It doesn't work. He's just transparent as his window pane sized glasses. Talking neutrally like this, wearing nothing, feels awkward. Actually, somehow it's even more awkward to be naked in front of someone when they can't see me being naked. To say nothing of the fact that he's naked as well. I try to brush the feeling off with little success. Money? Sure. Awesome. Wait, why do you need it? Uh, can't you just give it to me because I had the goodwill not to run through your pockets while you were in the shower? I could have, but I exercise restraint. And in the end, isn't it the thought that counts? Come on, be a pal. This makes no sense. If it's a thought that counts, I should withhold payment since his thoughts were so clearly impure, and his intentions are probably even more sinister since he can't tell me what they are. I say as much to him. I'm offended, man, but if that is your game, then fight. I guess I have no choice. I want to order pizza, and I've already have most of the cost of the pizza. I just need your help for the rest. Uh, I get some of that pizza too, right? No. Are you serious? Yeah, I would give you some, but you have class and you don't have time for a pizza. What about you? I'm not going to class. I have to wait for the pizza and pay the guy. Then eat it. It's not easy. You have to obtain the pizza stealthily. If you don't, everyone will see you and the pizza. And then they'll ask for a slice. It's a hard world there. Everyone wants a piece. And then you're left pizzaless in an unforgiving world. It happened before. That's how I know. Every day I plan my vengeance. So then when the people who wronged me order pizza, I will be there. Ever vigilant. Kendi strikes a dramatic pose, completely without irony. But yeah, I only need like 400 yen. Please? You're my only hope. I can't go inside and buy my own pizza. It's too far. I try not to go out unless it's absolutely necessary. Let me tell you what happened last time I went out without carefully planning it out in advance. I was outside. I can't remember what I was doing. Something. Standing. Maybe wondering how I got there. And then, out of nowhere, it happened. Like a flash of lightning, spitting the sky. Like how you split a sandwich into two equal pieces to make it more manageable to hold and eat. A bird crapped on my head. It was the second most shocking moment in my life. What was the first? He ignores me and keeps going. I want to grab him and shake him. Is he just trying to keep momentum? I'll go with that, but it was more likely he just didn't hear me. It was like in the opening to some kind of anime show. You know how there's always a part where the main dude is fighting his rival, and they fly at each other and clash swords, and there's a big, dramatic colored R's and zoom? It was like that. But with Pooh. Okay. So yeah, I need I need some money. Please? Don't leave me hanging, man. I only need like a thousand yen. I thought it was 400. Okay. What? I'll pay you back, I swear. Better. That's what it means to borrow stuff. I don't know when I'll be able to pay you back. You have one week. All Bernard, everybody. Kenji winches and makes a noise like a dying cow. A particularly disturbing fact, given that this baton is conducting freely. You're not supposed to be so tight ass about money between brothers and arms, man. Men have it bad enough as it is. Did you know that male porn stars only make about half as much as female porn stars make? That doesn't mean anything unless you're a porn star. God, I really fucking hope there's no Twitch admins watching this. So maybe I am a porn star, on the side, struggling to make ends meet as I fight the feminist agenda. And you can't even spot me your crumbs? You bastard. Nobody understands. Nobody. Wouldn't feminists be against pornography in the first place? This feminist agenda stuff again? This stuff is important. I can see that you don't give a shit, but this is serious here. Feminists. 
are a dangerous enemy. Make no mistake. You take them lightly, and you wake up in the morning with a knife in your back. Bam! Out of nowhere. How do you wake up in the morning if someone stabbed you in your sleep? <laughs> Women are terrible at stabbing things. <laughs> Fucking classic. I thought you said... I thought you just said don't take them lightly. Well, I mean, don't take them lightly for the big things. Individually, they're not a threat. But if there was some kind of war, like a, like a big war, with men on one side and the feminist forces on the other, it would be pretty ugly. And that day will come when the feminists come out their central top secret worldwide feminist headquarters and say, it's on now, motherfuckers. You're being ridiculous. There's no big worldwide feminist headquarter building. Where on where would they even hide that? I mean, it'd have to be a ma it'd have to be massive. You couldn't hide that on Earth. Someone would notice a big fortress with women only in it. Who said it was on Earth? I turn away from Kenji and start practicing frowning faces in a mirror so that I can figure out what kind of frown will best express my emotions. He can't save me from this distance anyways. Which unfortunately means that he just keeps on ranting without any regard to sense or sensibility. Yeah, there is a war going on. A war not many know about, but it's a great one that one day will boil over and encompass all the known world. Then, we have to pick sides. We have to make a stand. In fact, it's happening right now. Imagine it, the bloody battlefield, a vicious conflict without end. I almost gave up when I thought this cause was silly, when I grew tired of the bleakness of our fight. When I mistook the time the power went out for a feminist raid, and I thought the end was near. But then I realized that if I gave up, it would be all over, and I was like, whoa. And I knew I had to get serious, because I am the last sane man in an insane world. It's all about duty. Must be a cr pretty crappy movement if all, of this, if all of it unhinges on one naked guy ranting in a bathroom and another naked guy. So, can I have the money? He's blocking the way out. It's getting cold because I'm still naked and I want to go to class. So, I agree to spot on the money. Awesome. Thanks, dude. We should go bowling later. Bowling? Yeah, it's the ultimate sport. There are almost no women bowlers either, making it also the manliest sport. Should I wear my pink bowling shirt with my matching shoes or the pastel green with the flower accents? There are bowling clothes? Maybe. Anyway, you'd better pay me back. I can pay you back in stuff, right? I don't have the time to ask him to elaborate on what that means. I don't know. I have to get a class. You're kind of in the way. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I don't want to hold you up, and uh, I have some stuff to do myself. The time has come. The time for what? I, I just like saying that, okay? Now the time has really come. For what? I have to use the bathroom. Get out of it. I was just going to- and what does that mean? It's a big bathroom. So? I have to be alone or I can't go. The pressure. Okay, what if someone else comes in? Uh, I'll, I'll think of something. I give him my practice frown that it looks kind of silly reflected in his glasses. He either doesn't notice or doesn't see anyway, so I got dressed up and run back to my room, feeling as though an eternity has passed since I woke up. That is time I will never get back. I'll get him for this somehow. But right now... I have to go to class. I'm the first person in class today, although I think I'm a little too early. Then again, sitting alone here for 20 minutes or beats having the supper that time with fucking Kenji. The combination of fatigue, frustration, and boredom starts making me feel very tired. I black out for a second, waking up when my head hits the surface of my desk. Rubbing my forehead, I realize this is as good a reason as any to stay up for now and stop going to class early later. Eventually, I hear a tapping outside in the hallway, and Lily's tall figure appears in the doorway. She's not in this class, so she must have some other business. Maybe she's looking for Hanako. 
Lily stops at the door, looking hesitant, as if she was a vampire who couldn't come in unless invited. I considered doing so because she looked rather lonesome standing there. She steps in on her own accord, though, after straightening her skirt and shirt collar as if it was important to look prim when entering her classroom. Excuse me. She calls into the quiet classroom with a. She calls into the quiet classroom with a probing, delicate voice. I realize the silence might unnerve her because of her blindness, so I break it. Morning, Lily. Kisao, good morning. I didn't hear you come in. I wonder if she thinks it's suspicious I didn't say anything to her before. It's likely if I were to tell too big a lie now, it would sink me. Well, I was already here, just asleep until now. Oh, have you seen Hanako today, by any chance? No, she seems to come in only just before the bell rings. Or after that, do you want me to tell her something for you? No, it's fine. It's strange, but I think we're the only two people in the school right now. I didn't hear anyone else on my way here. I shouldn't have gotten up so early today, I guess. You're chastising yourself for doing something that other people should. Punctuality's a good thing. I think so anyway. It's a very busy morning today. The festival is coming up soon, and today is a deadline for event registration, budget reports, and any other official paperwork. It may be that everyone is trying to complete the necessary forms at the last minute. Maybe that's why it's so quiet today. Hi, hi! <laughs> so the anticipation was painful, not one. <laughs> Should have figured that was what was happening uh, anyways. Uh, Misha pops into the room with Shizune as if on cue, shouting with a loudness that makes Lily visibly flinch. Hi, Hee-chan! Uh, hi. Look, it's the class representative! Hello! Lily smiles, probably amused by Misha's or Shizune's use of the word look. Of course, you're not the representative of this class, right? Right. I'm not. Lily seems a little more guarded in her answers to Sissonay than she was with me the other day. I guess they really don't get along at all. Then I realize that Lily might not actually know Sissonay is present and she's trying to detect whether or not she is, to know who she's talking to. For all she knows, she's talking to Misha, but knowing that she and Shizune are practically inseparable, she might expect Shizune being the one that actually talks. Damn, how complicated. I decide to help Lily out for my own peace of mind more than anything else. You're early, Shizune. You were here even earlier than us! Misa puffs her cheeks out angrily. Why's she getting angry? Does she feel emotions on Shizune's behalf, too? It's not that weird, though, that Shizune didn't like my little comment. It's true, I was here earlier than them, so me saying something like that could definitely be misinterpreted as anything. Especially to Shizune, who doesn't have the benefit of hearing tone to gauge intent. Before I can start weighing, weighing whether or not I should apologize, Shizune has already moved on. Give her a moment. I'm so sorry, I'm having internet hiccups again. <laughs> That's what I figured was um, happening. Or so, so, uh, so was I, actually. Uh, yeah, I think that was... Uh, yeah, I think was, that was on your oh, was that, oh, that See? was everybody that time? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was just the storm again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the festival's coming up in three days, right? Every other class has already handed in their project budget reports for the events. Even the first years. Except you! <laughs> Damn, 
crap, that was an evil one. There is still time to hand it in, isn't there? Today! The deadline is today! You're certainly taking your time, aren't you? If I had it my way, I'd have out all the necessary paperwork days ago, but someone had to say, the deadline, please extend it. Yes, that was me. Planning something on this scale is not a small task. And a week is too small a time frame to expect a whole class to work out such a complex issue completely. Do you want to know what's harder than distributing the funds for one's class event? Handling the same matter for every class in the school and then some! The one who does that is me! Misha puts her hands on her hips and stands up straight. Wow, she's really getting into the role. Lily doesn't look like she's very amused, though. Hey, she's an A. Aren't you being a little too hard on her? There's still a whole day left. Easy, Sal. It's all right. Lily seems happy I'm taking her side, but I'm a bit conflicted that I'm not nothing she can take care of herself. If it's about the budget, then I'm disappointed you think I have forgotten about it. I understand how important this is. Then, can I have it, please? Isn't it? She might not have it on her at this exact second. It's not here right now. I asked two students to take care of it for me. Students from my class. She emphasizes the last sentence, much to my surprise. She knows what Susan and Misha's efforts to rope me into the student council. I guess four of us have gotten around, so now she's using me as ammo against Susan A. This just gets better and better. It was your responsibility! A budget report isn't something you should just be delegating away. As a class rep, it's your job to be on top of things. This kind of disregard for proper procedure is really just terrible! They completed it, being capable of doing so. But the students have been sick recently. So they could not come to school and give it back to me. If you want, I will apologize on their behalf for getting sick. Okay! Although Misha misses Lily's little jab entirely, she certainly doesn't, and she seems torn between being offended by Lily's daring and jumping for joy at the prospect of a challenge. Lily, don't they live here at the school? That's a five minute walk, you know? What could they possibly have that prevents them from taking five minutes out of their busy lives to drop off something that will affect the enjoyment of their entire class? Lily opens her mouth to say something, but Susanna closes the gap between them and starts sighting furiously, waving her hands around like an orchestra conductor. Mesa tries her best to convey the same passion, but can't seem to lose her normal cheerful tone. The result is interesting and somewhat surreal. And what's with that attitude? I said that it's not something you should be delegating away! Are you the class representative or aren't you? Tell me the names of those two students. They should have your job if you can't even handle something this simple yourself! One form isn't the full extent of what I'm supposed to take care of. Lily's tone is growing slightly impatient, but she's doing a good job of not letting Susan A see how unsettled she's becoming. She's pulling her cards close to her chest. Susan A, on the other hand, wraps her fingers cheerfully along the edge of her glasses, knowing Lily can neither see nor hear how excited she is. Of course, you do so much, class rep, it must be so difficult being you! Lily tightens her lips at Misha's words, clearly understanding the intent behind them, even though Misha delivers them without even a hint of the sarcasm which they were meant to have. Susan and Lily don't like each other, that much is clear, but this seems a little much. It seems like Lily has had enough and is ready to push back. Ah, Yusha was almost in the perfect position there. I was actually just discussing the budget report before you came by. You must be very talented to have finished all of your student council duties so quickly that you can track me down to make sure I don't forget my own. Are you accusing me of slacking off? It seems like you're confusing me with yourself! I don't think so. That would be a very difficult thing for me to do, comparing myself to you. You're right! The difference between us is like heaven and hell! 
and it's not hard to guess which one you might represent. The air between them ripples with the heat of their enemy. Well, not really. They can't disguise it anymore, though. Even Misha looks like she's beginning to understand the real nature of this conversation. Hee-chan, don't you slack off either! What are you talking about? Aren't you taking part in the festival, Hee-chan? You are, aren't you? Then, I hope you're going to do a lot more to make sure it goes smooth, smoothly... Uh, make a lot more to make sure it goes smoothly than this person! I don't understand why Shizun is getting mad at me. Oh, dick move time, hell yeah. Actually, there's no real way to, uh... See, the what? thing is, there's actually no way to push one of them away. You're going to pander to one of them either way. So, in that sense... I'll have to the fuck off. <laughs> Sadly, that is not an option. There we go. We saw it with my waifu. Hey, I'm the new guy, remember? It's not like I could have done much, even if I wanted. That's right. You shouldn't expect a transfer student to jump right into it on his first week. Well, they're taking my side feels oddly comforting, so I decided to back her up too. Yeah, you're being unreasonable with both of us. Excuses, excuses! Miss Class Rep has had plenty of time to deal with a report! And we repeatedly offered you a position to help with the student council work, but you refused to commit yourself to making the festival a success! Yeah, but as I said back then, I'm not sure if... I don't have time for this right now. No matter what I do, it'll mean being drawn into a conversation with Susanne, and that is what she wants. Whatever, forget it. I turn my back at them. I get back to my seat and shut my ears on the finale of the argument between Lily and Susanne, even if it means missing uh, Susanne's nice panties. Eventually, Lily leaves our classroom and Susanne and Misha seat themselves without talking to me. I can feel Susanne's eyes burning into my back. She's probably angry at me, but I'm just as angry with her. I don't get why she had to drag me into the argument. Hanako doesn't come to the morning class at all, leaving your seat looking empty and lonely in the back of the classroom. I have to tell them that Lily was looking for her if I see her later. After the events of this morning, class is pretty boring in comparison. I turn the pages of my textbook lazily. I have a bit of catching up to do, despite trying to keep up with my studies at the hospital, but... I'm not feeling that enthusiastic about it. The clock at the front of the room sounds unbearably loud. They just haven't said anything in over seven minutes. Instead, opting to cover the board in rows and rows of equations, taken directly from the book. The rhythmic classic of chalk on blackboard seems to synchronize perfectly with the ticking of the clock. I start to copy down the equations just to pass the time, even though they're right there in the textbook. When the bell rings, I'm not in a hurry because I have nothing to do, so I stay for a while, reviewing what we covered in class today. I prefer to leave last anyway, so I don't have to deal with crowding in the hallways. I notice Susan and Misha have also stayed behind, talking to someone from another class. She's is sounding so fast that her hands make noises like swords cutting through the air. Maybe there's pent up anger in there. Misha's trying desperately to keep up, but it's clear she can barely manage to even understand her. I put my head down. Whatever they're discussing, it looks like serious business. She's in a science to the point where her wrists crackle and Misha struggles to spit it out in word form. Sometimes she trips over herself like she's dealing with tongue twisters, and then on top of that, she has to sign back anything the other girl says. Seems like a rough job. Misha looks tired, like she's about to faint. Look over her, their business is soon finished, and the girls sit down on their seats again. She's hanging her head limply on her desk, looking exhausted. I'll use the opportunity to reconcile with Susanne a bit, without getting roped into the student council thing again, though... I suspect that door is now closed for me. Well, the preparations must be tough for you. Indeed, uh, the people in the school seem to be taking the festival very seriously. Whenever I see people idling around before and after classes, they're always talking about their plans for it. It's kind of neat to see everyone so enthusiastic about it. 
I'm probably the only one that doesn't have something to do. Susanne so scoffs at me at first, as if trying to decide whether to ignore or sneer at me, but in the end, she starts sounding without doing either. Misa perks up, looking at her hands with slightly unfocused eyes. She signs with harsh, heavy, dramatic strokes. Misa translates her signing into speech for me. She does it so well, it's almost like Susan is actually speaking, transmitting her thoughts directly for Misa. She must have practiced it vigorously. Well, of course, we're in the student councils, you know, so we're pretty busy. It's an important duty of ours to ensure the success of the festival with all of our strength. We would shame ourselves in front of the past student council generations if the festivals were to fail. That's why there must be no flaws, no... Uh, I think that was encumbrances? No nothing that makes the festival short of perfect! Susanna's passionate speech and Misha's and acting are really oddly fitting of them. Oh? Hello? I look over my shoulder and see Holiko peering timidly into the classroom, most of her body hidden behind the door. Hey! Playing delinquent again? Holiko blushes hard at me for a straightforward jab, even if it was only a jest. She suddenly stares at her probingly, causing Hanako to look down and start backing away to the point where only her fingers can be seen wrapped nervously around the edge of the door. Maybe she's showing her dislike of Hanako by associating with her dislike of Lily. It appears so, and Hanako probably knows it as well. What is it, Hanako? <laughs> Has Lily been here? She, uh, came by in the morning, though. No? Hanako keeps looking uneasily at Suzanne, who stares back at her with her usual study and gaze. What's she trying to do? Of course Suzanne isn't going to look away, and she's intimidating enough as it is, so I can only imagine how terrified Hanako would be. It's a little uncomfortable watching Hanako's reaction to Suzanne's normal behavior. This is what happens when two people of two different extremes meet, it seems. Do, do you know where she is? If she had any sense in her head, she's in her classroom working on their festival project. But who knows where that woman is loitering at? Hanako nods quickly and retreats with haste. What were we talking about? Oh yeah, we are really working hard to make the festival happen. And driving other people insane along the way. Well, good luck with that. I set up to leave, making my exit before either of them manages to berate me more for slacking off. The halls are somewhat quiet as expected. Everyone must be in club meetings or at festival preparations. Or both. She said his words about being a slacker echo in my head. I feel a bit guilty about not contributing, but I seem to like the result to do something concrete about the matter. For the festival, it's too late unless I already count helping Susan and Mesa, which I naturally don't. And clubs... I don't know. Maybe I'm not a club type of person. Halfway through, this, halfway through the way from the school building to the dorms, I spot a figure in front of the dorms. It's Rin. Looks like she's working on her mural today, too. I walk over to her, but she doesn't seem to notice me approaching. She's sitting on an upturned box, looking intently at the wall she's painting with a brush held between her toes. The mural's progressed considerably since yesterday, but it's still only half done as far as I can tell. More colors have appeared and the twisted human-like figures have spread and increased in number. I have to say, the style is quite eye-catching and very unique. Not that that'd be knowledgeable about art by any measurable scale, but it's very nice looking nonetheless. I clear my throat to get her attention, but not startle her so that her concentration won't break. Wait. She doesn't even turn to check who it is. Oh, wait. If 
15 minutes later, I decided that her concentration is indeed unbroken, and also that I have waited long enough to warn, poking her gently on the shoulder to remind her of my presence. Rin turns her head menacingly to my direction, ending up staring at my crotch level. Oh, it's his hell. She can tell? I would feel a lot less uncomfortable if she would look at me at my face. In studio of innovation. Hard at work, I see. The conversation starts as if I hadn't been here for a quarter of an hour already, but it's not a concern. At least it starts. Looking good. It does. The layers of paint hiding other layers of paint, mixing and shaping the human figures, actually creates an impressive look. But Ren looks miffed. You shouldn't have comment on works in progress. Seven years of bad luck, you know? Sounds terrible. I guess I'll take it back then? Still, it looks good. I wonder if I get 14 years of bad luck for thinking that. Rin turns back to looking at her painting and pokes it with a big toe. Could you mix some of this color? I'm running out of it. She looks down at a half-empty bowl with the remains of the same pinkish paint in it. I didn't really intend to say and help her with this project, though. Uh, then again, I guess I didn't intend to do anything much. I look at Rin, she looks emptily back at me. Just this once. Rin picks up another brush and dredges it in another tone of pale red. There are dozens of similar bowls all around her working area. From the looks of the scene, she could have been sitting there for hours. I wonder if she has. That would mean she's been skipping school, though, which I, of course, wouldn't put beyond someone like Rin. I pour a little of white and red into the bowl, trying to match the color with the one already on the wall. I can't seem to get it right. It's really inconvenient of her to not mix it up in the first place. Getting it to be exactly the same thing will be impossible, but... At least... But at least I can try to get as close as I can. Speaking of hard work, isn't that a huge workload for you two? It's such a big painting and all. Oh. I'm not old and bitter enough yet to think like that. I guess you aren't. You guessed right. Legs hurt, though. You feel like slugs. Slugs made of sea slugs. Because of the proportion? Or position? Yeah. I like doing it in a horizontal position more, if you know what I'm talking about. But it can't be helped. Can't ask the wall to lay down. Saying that, she stretches herself a little, bending her legs and back far more than a human should flex. It's astonishing how effortlessly she makes her body around, manages her body around. There's a small flinch in her otherwise blank expression, a hint of pain maybe, as she stretches out her calves. Rin must have stamina and dexterity far above a normal person to be able to live like she does, but she's wearing out working on this. Why push yourself so much? Take a break or something, at least. Continue tomorrow if it's bad. This gives her a pause. A long one, too, feeling like a mental yawn. I don't think so, Hisao. I'm not pushing myself. It looks like you are. No, it's not about pushing or pulling or anything related to that kind of thing. There's this boy. Boy? Yeah. Where? At the art club. Uh, and? He's blind. 
Oh. How can you paint if you're blind? No idea. So why is he there? That's the point. He's there. So you really should just speak more than one word at a time to make this feel like more like a discussion and less like an interrogation. Can't really do anything that you'd call art, right? But he comes there anyway and paints. Why? I don't know. Why? I don't know. That's why I asked. So... He doesn't paint often, but I think his paintings are very interesting. I'm sure they are. I once tried that, painting with my eyes closed. Wasn't too interesting, and cleaning up the floor took ages. Didn't try it again. But, he is becoming better at sculpting. I see. Maybe she was trying to make a point with this. Maybe she forgot she had one. Seems like the art club is full of interesting people. Not really. Pretty blunt statement and she totally missed the sarcasm. No? Just like I said, they're not very interesting. I usually don't have much interest in people who are not interesting. Maybe you have. Maybe. Hmm. But that boy is interesting. Maybe I am like that boy. Or maybe you are. Maybe everyone is. Doing things you can't do just because you can. That's pretty deep, I think, and I told that to her. You're a deep one. Nah. I'm a really shallow and thoughtless person. People say that to me all the time. Did you know? I can only think of four things at the same time. No, but now I do. Right now, I'm thinking of the second floor girl toilet, ice cream flavored ice cream, the middle toe, and a haircut. I'm going to need a haircut. She shakes her head around vigorously, letting her short and messy hair ruffle wildly around. I can see that doing it is something she likes to do. It falls silent as Ridden treads around absentmindedly, buggy and brushes around. I thought about the art club sticking in my head for a while longer. I feel like I'm treading on very unknown territory with art. The way these meetings with Ringo, it's as though I'm starting a smoking habit or something. I should probably stop talking with her. It's not like I dislike her, despite the confusion her being herself causes, and... I don't just like art either. I've been drawn for fun sometimes, so I just... Don't have a real creative drive or any technical skill. Relatable. So, usually if I were to draw something, I get white papers in them and just freeze completely. That or I manage... Whoops. That or I manage to draw something disfigured and probably get frustrated at my inability to put the picture of my head down on the paper. Then call it quits without even really trying to make an effort. Ridden clearly doesn't have this problem, but she frustrates me in another way. Being with her is like looking into a mirror that doesn't reflect anything. It makes one question the sanity of the act. 
Ren sits out on her box, swaying from side to side, apparently comfortable with the uncomfortable silence. She's staring at me again, or maybe over my shoulder. I can't quite figure out where her eyes are focused. I'm thinking of leaving so she can carry on working on distraction and that I can do whatever I'm going to do alone. It's not like I have anything that must be done today. Oh, shoot. Yeah. Nobody. I just forgot to tell Hanukkah that Lily was looking for her. Do you know her? From my class. Oh. Her. The mysterious toilet girl. That person's funny. I saw her going to the toilet five times during one recess three weeks ago. I'm sure it's the world record. It was very mysterious. That's why you call her Mystery Toilet Girl? What other reason could there possibly be? Well, if there is, it's an eternal mystery. I didn't follow her in, though. Maybe it was the week before that? Could have been. Looking at her makes me hungry. Jesus. Don't say that. At least, not around her. Rin turns to look at me blankly as if she's not sure why I reproved her. But she doesn't acknowledge that it's standing any more than before, so I give up at that point. So, do you want to go eat dinner then? No, not yet. Ren has turned her hungry gaze back to the wall, looking slightly more energetic, or at least slightly less lethargic than she did before. It's as if the wall is an opponent she has to vanquish, something she must overcome before she can indulge in dinner. This is the feeling I get. A weird sense of empathy overcomes him, makes her smile a little to myself. For all her oddity, Rin is pretty cool after all. I'll be going anyway. Have fun. Rena has already grasped a brush and is dipping it into fresh paint, so of course she can't hear me anymore or doesn't answer anything even if she does. I'm feeling... Damn it. I'm feeling tired, so I set my alarm clock to wake me up as late as I can afford while still making it into the first class. The nurse's voice is almost nagging me on the back of my head about morning jogs. I make a resolution to make up for it by going for a walk after school tomorrow. Maybe I'll carry the way, I bet. More than that, uh, I wake up and take a hot shower. Back in my room, the first thing I see is the familiar row of medication bottles lined up on top of my dresser, and it makes me depressed as usual. It's annoying. I thought I was okay. I thought I'd made my peace with this thing, gotten over it. But what I really did, I allowed myself to forget that I have a problem. Being here really just reminds me of the reality, and trying to fight against it just hurts. Reflecting on it's only going to do so much. I've done this before for months. It seems like it's time to get over it. If I allow myself time to forget that my life is definitely not going to be as long as those of others, it won't get me anywhere. My life may be different from others, but it is a life in progress. That's how I'll rationalize it. I down the usual handful of pills, trying to bust a sudden dreary feeling out of my head. Then I prepare to head out to class early as usual. As I step into the hallway, I notice Kenji... coming... Coming around the hallway corner, stealthily making his way over to his own room with a large bag. As he sneaks past me, soundlessly like a ninja, hiding in plain sight, I call out to him. Hey! He jumps at the sound of my voice. Hmm. Uh, um, uh, hey man. I, uh, I didn't notice you there. I'm really tired. I think it's more that he didn't see me, but that's not the issue. 
Where have you been, this early? Shopping? Nah, I wasn't shopping. Sometimes I have to visit the math teacher. Yeah, I figured it'd be a good idea to find out what the next exam is, since he tells you in advance if you want. So then, what's in the bag? Uh, I thought I'd go shopping while I was outside. I need supplies to continue to fight against the vast feminist conspiracy. Uh, okay. I thought you didn't go outside. I wear a hat now. I decide not to point out that he's not wearing a hat. An awkward silence settles between us, and then Kenji breaks out, pushing his door open slowly, releasing a creaking sound into the air that only makes the moment seem more awkward. He sets the bag down inside his room and then closes the door. I'm surprised you went out of your way to find out a test date. Trying to take advantage of an opportunity to study is pretty diligent. Whoops. <laughs> I never study. Oh. I just wanted to know what the next test day was. I'm still gonna take it, duh. I just used to know what day it is so I can't afford to skip class. He usually sends out updates on that crap by phone, so I had to step out and check up on it. And why do you have to go out? When you could get it on your phone? I don't carry a phone. What do you mean you don't carry a phone? You, you mean you just leave it at home? Nah, I don't use phones. I don't have a phone. Phones. I have no phone. Why don't you have a phone? How can you not have a phone? No, no phone at all. No phone? I just don't like phones. Actually, I'm kind of scared of them. I don't know why. I think it's some kind of repressed trauma. But basically, when I get near a phone, I get nervous. It's my darkest secret. I have two theories on it. Either I have some fear of receiving some undefined, ominous, life-altering doom call. Or... I was beaten with a phone in the past. Beaten so badly I can't remember it. Beaten in the head? Well, where else could I have gotten beaten with a phone that would make me unable to remember it? The ass? <laughs> Unexpectedly logical. I feel very depressed now. Since that this conversation is more or less over, Kenji opens his door and prepares to head inside. Yeah, I'm going to sleep, dude. Have a good one. Class is going to start in like 20 minutes. I already did something today. Too tired to go to school. Hey, do you need some lip balm? I actually bought two because I thought the store had started selling individual AA batteries. Thanks, but no thanks. And silly uh, Hal forgot to record this line, so... Whatever, man. He swiftly enters his lair, finally letting me go to the class. For a change, I'm not among the first ones to come to morning class. Instead, almost everyone else seems to be here already. I recognize most of my class by their faces now, though their names still escape me. The class goes on lazily. I think I'm starting to get into the rhythm of school. I've been sort of worrying about taking notes and being overly attentive. The first days I was pretty high strung in class. Lizzo finishes his lecture about electricity early, but continues without a pause about the festival. So, as you know, the festival is on the day after tomorrow. I hope everyone's projects are going to be successful this year. Have a good time, but also come Sunday. Please keep the meaning of the festival in your minds. Games and fried food! Everyone bursts out of laughter, and so do I. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Mikado. But what did... The remainder of his sentence is buried beneath the ring of the lunch bells and everyone starts packing their things. Mutsu deliberates for a moment, but since almost nobody seems to pay attention anymore, he gives up and sits down. It's crowded in the hallway, or as crowded as hallways in the school probably get. Most of the students seem to be heading down for the cafeteria.
Where is Aremi? I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot. I forgot how to uh, unmute. I'm sorry. He stole! I'm gonna make. Oh, wait, hang on. I'm trying to remember how to read. I'm gonna make you a one time only super extra special lunch offer. Did I ask for a lunch? Emmy's homemade lunch boxes and the privilege of eating them in private with two bombshell beauties. Her overly flirtatious sales pitch echoes in the hallway. A remarkable feat since it's full of people. Emmy strikes a very confident looking pose as though it attempts to what up her own ridiculousness. Popping up her very modest chest and making the B for victory sign with her hand. <laughs> and it's delicious. To what do I owe this honor of being invited? You stood there looking really lost and sad, so I thought you could use some company. That is probably the most depressing reason imaginable. So how about it? You're probably really lonely and would eat ah, nah, nah, and would eat that awful cafeteria food all alone otherwise. Where's our pro tag? Hello? Can you guys not hear me? Y there nope. you are. Hello? Yeah, we couldn't oh, before oh. though. Oh. Uh, oh my god, am I deaf now too? <laughs> uh. Uh. Eh? I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Sure, I'll have your lunch offer. With pleasure. <laughs> Let's go to the roof! The roof? Why the roof? Because that's where we eat lunch. And if I don't get up there, then she'll probably wander off and then I just know she'll go hungry because she never packs a lunch for herself. Who will? Come with me! Without answering my question or waiting for a response, she grabs me by the arm and drags me through the hallways. I attempt to make conversation on the way. Why do you have an extra lunch? Emmy smiles guiltily. <laughs> Actually, it's yesterday's lunch. I slipped in a run at I slipped in it I slipped in at a I slipped in a Oh, okay, I'm sorry, I forgot how to read. I slipped in a run at lunch and forgot to eat. Deep breaths, deep breaths. Huh. The stairway to the roof is a little dilapidated, but it's clearly been used recently. At the top of the stairs is a door complete with the missing padlock. I wonder who the intrepid individual was that removed the lock. Emmy shoves the door open and steps beaming into the sunlight. Suddenly, a tall, dark stranger appears out of nowhere, standing imposingly in front of us. Emmy flinches back, almost falling down the stairs. Eee! Hello. Yeah, he, you scared me, Rin! Wait, isn't she... Hello? Noticing that Rin is speaking to me, Emmy looks curiously at me. Oh? Huh? You two know each other? I look confusedly at Emmy. He's that friend of yours? Rin has turned her gaze towards the clouds drifting above the school. I didn't know you knew this <coughs> person, Emmy. Oh, sorry. Bless you. The awkward silence lasts only for a few seconds until Emmy lets out a tiny giggle, shrugging the coincidence off. <laughs> I invited Hisao for lunch. If you know him, that's just better. Oh, does this mean I don't get food? 
Or did you invite him for lunch without the lunch? Uh, neither. I have food for three. I gotta get up, so I'm gonna head on to play real quick. Uh, let's see. Auto mode, there we go. Uh, that's what Nice thinking. Fucking fast. <laughs> oh god, speed read time, let's go! I'm not gonna make a speed read, that's it. Oh, uh, I was ready. I, there I we go. I channeling my inner M M M. Wait, am I reading narrator then? Yeah, I gotta get up for a second. I hope that's okay. slow enough. That's fine. There's nobody else but us here. I guess the roof is not as popular as it is in other schools. Yep. A few rundown benches and tables are scattered around the edges. Perhaps in an attempt to make the rooftop look less desolate. Uh, the small pebbles covering the roof rattle beneath our feet. I peek through the chain link fence to take a look at the school grounds and beyond. Students are strolling in pairs and groups around the quadrangle and at the cafeteria. The delivery trucks are driving past the schools towards the convenience store nearby. Somewhere a watchdog barks at a passerby. Ow. Somehow when I look towards the town center, the small town feels... strikes me very strongly. Almost palpably. The hectic lifestyle of big metropolises seems so far away and foreign here. Nobody has to run and catch a bus like their life depended on it, or get their senses overloaded by the neon lights and traffic jams. I feel surprisingly optimistic about this new life of mine, looking at my new hometown, even if it's going to be mine for only one short year. Finding, about, finding out about my illness and having to move away from home all came so suddenly, I haven't had the time to think about how I feel about it. All right, I'm back. Pardon me. Welcome back. Welcome, Welcome back. back. All right. When I step out of the shadow of the clock tower to open, I feel warmth touching my back. The sun shines from a perfectly clear cerulean sky. A cool breeze sweeping over the rooftop makes me shiver, but only briefly. The wind carries the scent of trees and flowers, not smog and car exhaust like it used to just a few weeks ago. And he settles on a bench with Rin in tow and produces one big and two small lunchboxes from her bag. Come on, Hisao. What are you waiting for? She's beckoning me to join them, making room on the already small bench. I sit myself on the corner of the bench to take as little space as possible. It's pretty cramped, but somehow all three of us fit on it. Impressive view. Emmy suppresses a giggle and places the launch box in front of Rin and adds another one to me. Here you go. Lunch. Just as promised. Well made, no less. I'm impressed. Wow. This looks really good. Thanks! I make it myself when I can. Conversation dies off as I set about the business of feeding myself. Taking a few bites, I glance up and notice Rin definitely opening the lunchbox and propping a forkful of food into her mouth, using only her feet. Even though I'd seen it before, I cannot but be impressed with her dexterity. It's also a reminder of the sort of place I'm in right now. Will I ever get used to sights such as this? I can't decide if getting used to such a thing would be a good thing or a bad thing either. Does getting used to this place mean that I'm giving up on being a normal person? Or does it just mean that I'm becoming more understanding about those around me? I'm distracted by, from my thoughts by the sight of Emmy tearing into her lunges of an insulted her ancestors. You seem pretty hungry. Emmy looks up, mouth half full, and swallows before nodding. Mm-hmm. My morning runs always work up an appetite. 
Which is great, because then I burn through lunch pretty quickly. Helps me keep my girlish figure. What would happen if you'd lose it? Would you become a man? <gasps> I very nearly choke on my lunch trying not to laugh. <laughs> it's a figure of speech! Does your figure have to run in the mornings, too? <gasps> you always talk like this? Talk like what? what? Much better. I think that answers my question. Uh, never mind. So, uh... I struggle to think of small talk and settle on the obvious question. How'd you two meet? Rin seems content to let me answer this question. Someone in the housing department thought that we'd complement each other well, so we were assigned rooms next to one another. Complement each other? Like shoes and a suit. Huh? Any giggles at my confusion? <laughs> Put us together and we've got all of our limbs. Get it? Uh. So I started helping Rin get ready in the mornings, and that was that. I mean, you can't help someone get dressed every morning and not get along. I see. Ren chooses this moment to interject. I have trouble with shirts. Right, that seems fairly obvious. Uh, say it again, you're cut out. Re really? Kind of. This isn't helping, but at least let me see if I find the whole thing funny. That combined with the fact that Rin is genuinely curious makes me feel slightly better and yet confused. I mean, you've got no arms. So, uh, putting on a shirt seems like one of those things that would be difficult. You know what, I'm just gonna shut the fuck up now. It'll save me a lot of trouble in the long run. Rin nods in what I suspect is meant to be a sage manner. I see. The conversation dies as I turn my attention back to my lunch. It's really quite good. Emmy finishes her lunch first and makes a contented noise. Mm. Ah, that was good! As she busies herself with cleaning up her lunch, Rin speaks up. Thirsty. Oh! I almost forgot about that! Sorry! With a flourish, she reaches into her bag and removes a trio of juice boxes. She tells me one that appears to be cranberry juice, one to Rin that appears to be some kind of strawberry milk, complete with a pink color scheme, and keeps an equally pink box of some kind of fruit punch for herself. Rin dexterously stabs her straw through the top of her box and begins to drink. I'm once again impressed by how flexible she is, but this time I keep my comment to myself. Somehow, I don't think either Emmy or Rin are the sorts of people to think twice about the way they work around their particular disabilities. Rin especially so. Indeed, she gives off the impression that uh, she's entirely unaware that she's missing any limbs at all. Whether or not that's a conscious decision, conscious decision is another matter. I'm honestly not sure. So, Hisao, how do you like it up here? Hmm? It's quite nice, actually. I like high places for the view. Thanks for inviting me up here. And for the lunch, too. I make Rin's a thousand watt grin, please buy my response, I suppose. <laughs> no problem! Sit. Feel free to eat with us next time, too, okay? I 
I won't make you a lunch, but you can bring your own up here. <laughs> no lunch service? I don't know. Harry looks smock offended. Trying to take advantage of my good nature? The nerve! She giggles. Mm -hmm. Well, if that's your answer. I guess Rin and I will just keep eating lunch all alone. I'm suddenly assaulted by the most heartrending puppy dog eyes I've ever seen as Emmy pouts. Kidding. I, I was kidding. I'd love to eat lunch up here again. Good location, and the company's okay too. Harry frowns a bit at my declaration of okay, but seems happy enough that I've accepted our invitation. I guess that makes us friends now. Or at least acquaintances. The lunch bell rings, signaling a return downstairs. Rin, you didn't finish your lunch again! I wasn't that hungry. If you don't eat more, you're gonna fade away! Rin shrugs as if that's an acceptable risk. Come on, we'd better get going. The three of us head down the stairs together. The afternoon class passes. Once again, I find myself without a plan for something to do after school, so I head to the library to return a couple of books I've finished reading. Walking inside, I see that there are about as many students here as there were on Tuesday, all the more evident from the almost total silence enveloping the room. As I drop the books I'd borrowed into the return slot on the counter, Yuko suddenly props up from behind it, quite startled from the banging they make as they hit the trolley next to her. Sorry, Yuko. Didn't mean to startle you. No, no, that's fine. It happens... a lot. I'm used to it by now. Um... <laughs> can I help you? It's okay, I think I know where everything is. Thanks anyway. I suppose I'll grab another book or two while I'm here. There's not much else to do, and after reading so much during my stay in the hospital, it's become a hard habit to break. I wander down to the fiction section towards the back of the library, scanning the bookshelves for anything that catches my eye. As I do, I look over to the corner where Hanako had been the last time I was here, not really expecting anything to come of it. Surprisingly, though, she's there, absorbed completely in a fairly thick book. I decide against intruding on her like last time and get back to finding reading material. After an indiscernible amount of time spent perusing the aisles, I finally decide on a couple of books to get and slide them off the shelf. With a minimum of fuss, I quickly walk over to the counter, check out my books, and pop them into my bag as I walk out. By the time I leave the main building, sunset isn't too far away. A small trickle of students remain, but the majority have left, presumably to their homes and dorms. I guess I need to buy some supplies. I can't live off cafeteria food and eating out for my entire stay here. As I leave for the gate, I make a few loud stretches to try and stab off the tiredness that's accumulated over the week. After passing through and rounding the corner, though, I see a solitary figure walking downhill towards a small town below. The color of her hair and tapping of her cane are unmistakable. I quickly walk up to her, which seems to catch her attention without a word even to be said. Hi, Lily. She takes a moment to place the voice, slightly adjusting her head to face a bit more towards the fourth source of my voice as she does. So? Yep, that's me. She seems to have a good memory for voices. The fact that Jax will remember it is a pleasant surprise. Good evening. What brings you here? Once again, she gives a small polite bow, and once again, I reply in kind before realizing I didn't need to do so. Just going into town. You? My, my. What a coincidence. I'm doing the same thing, huh? I usually go shopping on Fridays. She pauses for a moment, suddenly looking a little lost. Hanako usually comes into town with me. Uh, not lost, but worried. The two do seem to keep pretty close tabs on one another. It's kind of surprising that Hanako would just forget Lily like that. 
I noticed her reading in the library. She probably just got caught up in a book. She lets out a small sigh of relief. Yeah, she has a habit of doing that. She probably mentioned the uh, beginning of your uh, lines keep getting cut off, so... Uh... Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. She has a habit of doing that. Avid reader? Right. She doesn't like being around crowds of people, so reading away from everyone lets her relax a bit. Although she probably didn't intend it, I can't help but grimace as I recall my first meeting with her. Hardly wanted to bring it up, I remained silent as we quietly continued to walk down the quiet road. Tack. 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 The road bereft of cars and the stones of Yamaku increasingly far behind us, the quiet rustling of the leaves and the measured tapping of Linda's cane against the sidewalk are all that can be heard. It's kind of nice, especially compared to the hustle and bustle of Oregon, where I used to live. Before I know it, I've relaxed so much that it allowed Yawn to escape before I can control it. Tired? Yeah, I've been running ragged these past few days. That's an understatement to be sure. Transferring into a different school would be bad enough, but nothing like this. Things should settle down for you. The festival's got everyone in a spin right now, and you've been plopped right in the middle of things. For a moment, I hesitate, but given her apparent tolerance for frankness, I decided to get my full thoughts. I guess. Yamaka's kind of different, though. I, I mean... The formality surrounding everything, the isolation around it, not to mention the most obvious difference. It's kind of a whole different mindset. I suppose I'll get used to it, in, though, in time. She gives a matter-of-fact nod, apparently pleased with my answer. It feels almost as if she's included me in the flock of students she's shepherding, along with Class 3-2 and Hanako. Well, not that I mind. It's nice to get the thoughts off my chest in any case. Look on the bright side. One could see it as a chance for a new beginning. You should cherish the ability to make new friends. Well, that's optimistic. Uh, nonetheless, it's good to have a positive attitude about such things, I suppose. I guess that's a good take on it. Walking down on the road, she seems to become somewhat unsettled. But Morgan asks what's on her mind, she seems to collect herself and speaks up about something else. Oh, where in town were you going? That's actually a pretty good question. I'd come in to buy food, but the land of the place is so totally foreign to me. I'd intended to just wander around and see what I could find, but with the sunset already approaching and nightfall not too far away, that doesn't seem very wise. I'm gonna have to ask her for directions. Again. I was just going to get some food, but now that you mention it, I don't really know the way. Well now, this is quite lucky. I was just about to go to the convenience store myself. Looks like I'll be in your care again then. Thanks. Together we walk to the store. My pace is carefully slow to remain beside her. Compared to my usual walking pace, hers is quite a bit slower. Not that it's without reason. After what could be more than several minutes, I cast us out of our objective. This time, really is pretty small. Without further ado, we make our way inside with a greeting from the counter. Mind if I tag along with you? Usually Hanako would help me, but seeing as she's not here... Yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> not here. It takes a moment before I realize what she means. Considering she wouldn't be able to read any of the labels, shopping without any help would be a big pain for her. That said, I can't shake the feeling that I had this idea since I said I was coming here. Sure. It'd be my pleasure. I grabbed two well-used red baskets from the small stack beside the entrance, handing one to Lily. She lays it on the ground, putting her school bag in, retracting her cane, and sliding it through the basket handles before picking it back up in her right hand. Wait, if she doesn't use her cane... Before I can complete my thoughts, she comes beside me and pinches the cuff of my uniform in her slender fingers. Right. 
You got cut oh, off. Sorry, it's like, sorry, I, it's all right. Sure. I have no reason not to accept. I can think of worse things than shopping with a pretty girl holding on to me, even if it's out of necessity. I never got away through the store with not one of the occasional passing customers seeming to bat an eyelid. Considering how close Yamaku is, I guess seeing students from there must be entirely normal for the local residents. As we reach each aisle, I quickly check with Lily and find out what she needs. I grab it along with what I'm looking for and put her items into their respective baskets. I guess this is the same routine she and Hanukkah follow every Friday. Right. All that's left is the bread, and that should be my shopping done. Do you need anything else, Lily? No, that should be everything. Off we go, then. With a quick side trip to the bakery section, we make our way to the registers. The line, thankfully, is almost non-existent. It's not long before we're both paid for. The, before we both, uh... Paid for our food and are out the door. As Lily retrieves her cane and extends it to full length, I waste a minute looking upwards at the night sky while holding both our bags. For a moment, I try to make clouds with my breath, but the summer's heat doesn't seem to cooperate. Eventually, she rides herself, taking a quick stretch before taking her bag and leaving me to my two. You tired as well? So preparations have been complete chaos. She's in a breathing room. Sorry. <laughs> she's in a breathing down my neck. Doesn't exactly help things either. Hey, she's only trying to get everything organized. Better now than later, right? I suppose. I'm going to enjoy relaxing in town tomorrow. That's for certain. I guess the festival preparations must be taking their toll on both of them. We walk out into the quiet street, talking between ourselves as we carry our bags of food and supplies from the store. Wait, what's that? I notice a very distinctive figure making his way towards us, silhouetted by the street lamps. For a second, I think it's another male student from my class, but as he, or should I say she, gets closer, I recognize her quickly. Rin? What are you doing out here so late? Okay, so, uh... Told me I have K, so... Dean? Lily perks her head, looking like she's trying to focus on listening more keenly. It suddenly comes to me that I should probably interpret the scene for her. It's Rin. Tezka. I, I think that was her last name from our school? She stiffens at the name and gives a complicated-looking expression, something like a forced fusion of a composed smile and a painful cringe. Ah, oh, I understand. I guess Lily knows Rin, too. Rin turns to look at us, looking terribly out of it. I'm not entirely sure if she recognizes either of us, or at least she doesn't acknowledge it if she does. She looks like a zombie. Or a statue. Or a statue of a zombie. But slowly, some symptoms of understanding seem to light in her dark eyes. This is something she must react to. Rin blinks once, very thoroughly. So, uh, who's reading for Rin while we wait for Toma to come back? Kian. Sir. Hello. There's an awkward pause. Everyone waiting for someone else to say something. What are you doing here this late? I I was wondering about that myself, too. Just now. Some people asked that just before. I assumed they were wondering the same. I didn't know. They didn't know either. I asked. That's why I'm wondering. So, that was pretty much it. It's a murder mystery without a murder. They were going that way. She turns facing to her right in order to demonstrate the direction the other people went to as if that was important. 
then rotates back like a mechanical puppet in one of those overly complicated clockworks. For a person who gives an impression of being the quiet type, Rin really does use a lot of words to say things that don't need a lot to be said. Unsure if she's finished, I say nothing. Neither does Lily, who seems equally robbed of words for the time being. I think that both of us are, in fact, just scared that any response might provoke her to continue. Our stupefied lack of reaction doesn't phase Rin at all. She keeps looking at us expectantly, a calm hint of expression on her blank face. She seems to be that kind of person, always so relaxed, as if bull of a great sedatives were flowing in her veins in the place of blood. Do you have amnesia? I don't recall you having anything of the sort, though. Uh, no, I don't think it's that. The other passerby were probably just... Oh, that's me. Ah, oh, dumbass. Sorry. It's okay. The other passerbys are probably just worried, though. You do look really lost. The way you're standing in the middle of the street. Oh, also, I see. Uh, also, Thomas back, so... Uh... Oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Thank you, sorry. Right, that's fine. Uh, you had, uh, we had someone cover for you. Hope that's fine. Yeah, no, thank you. Of course, of course. Oh. Oh, I see. Maybe I should have taken some other kind of pose in that case. I ponder for a while whether I should chase this angle further or give up for the sake of my own sanity. I decide on the latter. It seems that most of the time it's better to not read too deeply into what Rin is babbling about. Talking with Rin is like playing chess with a supercomputer who does seemingly random, completely random moves as if to mock everything you know about chess. It's like that except with human interaction. And even if I win, it feels like losing. Damn, it's just like Kenji said, even when I win, I lose. This is the power of the girls at Yamaku. I push the thought aside as too dangerous to consider further. It's both Kenji's anti-female propaganda getting to me during a moment of weakness. Yeah, maybe taking another pose might have worked. He so, he so, he so, you have no idea. So, anyway... You have no idea what you're doing here? She frowns, looking extremely displeased at either my question, its consequences, or the answer she's about to give. I do have some idea. I can't really tell what kind of an idea. That sounds like progress, at least. Well, this sounds as if she spotted an opening for some kind of discernibly normal conversation. I can't say I share her optimism. Yes, there is some. Definitely. The rest will come later. Sure of it. I always have reasons. Uh, pardon me. Okay, that was bizarre. Sorry, uh... This is the kind of shit that happens when you have OBS open for several hours. Anyways, uh... The ensuing silence kills Lily's hopes all too visibly. That didn't last long. Rin's, as far as I can tell, unbased, assurances aside. What should be done? We're gonna just leave her to her own devices, whatever those are, but... It's late and I don't think we'll be getting any thanks if Rin is found standing here in the middle of the night. Which she probably will, unless she manages to remember what she was doing here in the first place. As for me trying to guess what might have been going on in her mind when she decided to embark on this adventure, the chances are to be on par with winning the lottery. Several times in a row. Lily is all that quiet too. I'd appreciate some support from the sidelines here, especially if she's more familiar with Rin than I am. But it can't be helped. It seems her familiarity with Rin is exactly why she's staying subdued. So, I assume you're going somewhere. Not coming back to the school? Any idea where? Her eyes widen in shock and she jolts back in a somewhat artificial way, making it seem like an act rehearsed for situations like this. You a mind reader? Is that your disability? How unique. No. No, what? Why, why would you think that? 
almost did it again. Fuck. You knew what I was doing. Uh, it was just an educated guess. We walked the same street in the other direction just before to get to the store. If you're going to school, we would have met you on the way. Oh. She looks a little disappointed. Like Kenji, Rin appears to have quick to jump to completely irrational conclusions. I read something about water here. I make a mental note to stock up on soft drinks. You know, that is the second time this week that someone asked if I was a mind reader. Do I really give off that impression? Rin shrugs her shoulders, which is all the answer I get. You know. Sorry, I, th I didn't realize I was, in I was moved to death. Maybe you uh, should come back with us to school? The lady rejects just as I'm about to further debug my alleged mind reading capabilities. She sounds concerned, a paper thin smile on her face, badly disguising that fact. Maybe she came to the same conclusion as I did. For everyone's sake, I decided to let the mind reading topic drop, it's, as it's entirely inane anyway. Yeah, Lily's right. If you can't remember, there's no point staying here. Grin considers this rather simple deduction for a moment, then nods. Uh, okay. We start towards the school again, having wasted way more time than necessary with this episode. Rin walks along the edge of the sidewalk in her arrhythmic way, looking like a mix of a sleepwalker and rope dancer, while Lily keeps one hand on my shoulder, tapping at the ground with her cane. Tap, step, step, tap, tap, step, step, step. Apart from that and a few fragmented beginnings of conversation, it's quiet. A quiet quite apart from the relaxing one in the town at that. So, how's the mural going? We are going to get bad luck. Never talk about works in progress. Or it will be wonderful. You're cut off. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure it will be wonderful. Bad luck. Tap step, tap step. She doesn't care to talk about it. Liz politeness feels out of place for the first time. Step, step, step. The hill Yamaku rests on top of is surprisingly steep going uphill. We slow the pace, but I still feel my pulse rising and breathing getting heavier. Almost there, I can see the gates already. More than that, though, I notice that Lily's hand slightly tightens on my shoulder. Interpreting it as a gesture that she wants to ask something, I speak up. Anything wrong, Lily? I resist the urge to say, aside from our traveling companion, but only just. For a moment, it seems to debate whether she would even bring it up, but go for it anyway. Is... everything... all right? All right? How do you mean? The fact that I can't interpret her incredibly vague question puts her off for a second. It's just... you seem... Unusually tight, I guess. Now that she brings it up, I notice that my breathing's strangely heavy. The uphill walk is really my job on me. Lily noticed it all too quickly. All right. So I spoiler. Yeah, I was about to oh. say. Uh, I was about to yeah. say. Spoiler alert. This is the choice of doom. I don't really want to talk about it. Ugh. I'm not interested. So. <laughs> Yep, we're doing it. I... I'm fine. There's nothing to worry about. The hill is just surprisingly steep, don't you think? Look at those looks, they know I'm full of shit. I wonder what the... I wonder what they have the school so high up here for anyway. Don't we have students in wheelchairs and everything? Indeed. Lily's forehead wriggles a concern, and I don't really want her to have that kind of an expression over me. We barely know each other. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. Not that you can find a place like this wherever, I guess, but it makes me wonder what they were thinking. 
My voice is overly calm. It sounds weird to my own ear, and I speak way too fast. I briefly wonder how much a Lily can sense from someone's voice alone. Hmm. Let's continue. We're almost there anyway. The rest of the way back to the school, we all remain silent. Alright, so we should be just about ready for the manly picnic. Let's go! Yep. Let's see. Uh... Whoops. The students roll into class for the Saturday morning session, each and every one of them sporting the tired eyes of people who've worked through the night. With only a day left to prepare, I suppose it's not so surprising. Thankfully, we only have to suffer through classes until the lunch break, then our time is our own. Muto lurches into class in a tired stagger. I suppose students are the only people here that enjoy their late Friday nights. Without saying a word, he scrawls some page and question numbers on the board and slumps out at his desk. It's completely atypical behavior for him, but it appears that no one in the class is going to call him out on it. Wordlessly, the students shuffle their textbooks into position and get to work. Not wanting to break the trend, I do the same. Fatigue has made the class antisocial, and the papers hurt among the ruffling papers. I can partly be attributed to the two empty seats beside me. For some reason, Misa and Susan are present, probably doing some council work for the festival. It's very quiet without Misha present. I wonder if she was born as rowdy as she is, or if she's making up for Shizane's lack of voice. Uh, Nakai, can I speak to you for a moment? I'm so engrossed in thinking about Misha that I don't even notice Moto approaching my desk. Sure. What's this about? It's probably better if we speak outside the classroom. Something about this doesn't sound too good, but I stand up and follow him out into the hallway anyways. Moto stands in the hallway, scratching his head as he works out what he's trying to say. Not knowing what's going on, I wait silently. So, uh, tell me... How are things? Things? I expected Mizzo to be a little vague, but this is pushing the limits. You know, things. You've had a week to settle in now, so how are things? Uh, fine, I guess. I see, and uh, how was your condition? The pause before condition seemed a little unnecessary. I haven't had any problems so far. A brief shimmer of relief passed across Moto's face. Good, that's good. Uh, the school nurse was a bit uh, concerned that you might have been pushing yourself a little too hard. He asked me to keep an eye on you when he couldn't. Does that make sense? I'd ask that you don't blow us off so freely. As much as we try to give you the level of education that you would get at a normal school, you have to realize that you have limits. Our goal is to make sure that you know what those limits are and how to maximize your potential within them. Do you follow me? I guess. I mean, I don't plan on doing anything stupid. Well, uh, that's a start, I guess. So then, uh, on to my next question. Uh, how are you finding your studies? I understand you were lit up for a while. We're not too far ahead, are we? I don't really think so. I try to keep up when I was in the hospital, so it hasn't been too hard. Moto taps his chin and raises an eyebrow as he absorbs this information. Is that so? I suppose there are still students out there who realize the importance of learning. I wouldn't go that far. I was only trying to keep myself occupied in my little life support prison. Well, yeah. You've got to keep up with these things, right? That's exactly it. One wrong move in this world and you're left behind, right? Uh, right. I wouldn't want that to happen. 
Ah, uh, there it is. No, no you wouldn't. Every week there's a new scientific discovery. Most of them mean nothing to the layperson, but any one of them could be the key to the next big thing. I'll keep that in mind. It's obvious that Muto's serious talk is over and he's gone back to a standard, slightly scatterbrained approach in life. I think in hindsight I prefer him this way. He's slightly more predictable in his unpredictability. Well then, uh, that's all I really had to say. Let's uh, get back inside, shall we? My relief at that suggestion is insurmountable. Sure. You're the boss, right? Muto pauses for a moment. I don't think any of my students have ever said that to me before. For an instance, I can sort of reply to this, but something deeper than me tells me to shut my mouth and get back out of the classroom. A few of the students jump at the sound of the door, rapidly trying to pretend that they're working on the questions on the board. Some don't even bother, their heads slumped on their desk as they nap. Thankfully, it would appear that Muto doesn't even notice them. He returns to his desk and retrieves a scientific journal from one of the drawers. I guess I got to him there. The class returns to the near silence that Moto and I left at him before our chat. Mixed feelings of tiredness and anticipation buzz around in the room. Everyone here is either waiting for chance to rest or the chance to get their last minute preparations underway. The clock on the wall slowly ticks the remaining class time away until finally the bells cry out, ending the torment. Before you all leave, I expect the answers for those problems by Monday. The class size is one, instantly regretting slacking off, but still acutely aware of the more pressing issues at hand. The classroom empties in the blink as everyone rushes to their last minute festival preparations. I stay behind and try to quickly finish the questions so I don't have to bother with it over the rest of the weekend and with the festival at all tomorrow. Apart from me, Hanako is the only one left, obviously waiting for Lily. It's weird that Lily comes all the way to our classroom to pick her up. I expect that moving around is at least nominally harder for her than it is for Hanako. But it's none of my business and I naturally don't ask about it from Hanako. Despite the relative proximity of our seats, neither tries to strike up a conversation about that or anything else either. So an oppressive silence falls upon the classroom. Time passes in silence. It's probably just 15 minutes or so, but it feels longer. I turn the pages of my notebook. Hanako turns pages of the novel she's reading. My pencil light splinters against the paper just when I was about to finish a paragraph. The sounds of my irritated sigh and subsequent fumbling around for a sharpener feel like they're breaking the mood of a classroom. Hanako keeps her eyes firmly away from my direction. Before long, Lily's tall figure appears in the doorway. Hanako? Her name is all it takes to make Hanako jump up from her desk and run to Lily. They talk quietly for a moment, but it isn't long before Lily leaves down the hall and Hanako idles back into the classroom, taking her seat once again. I watch Hanako in the corner of my eye out of sheer curiosity at the idea that the two would be separated. For a couple of minutes, she does nothing but sit with her chin in her hand, staring at the desk dejectedly. The boredom evidently becomes too much for her, though. The boredom evidently becomes too much for her, though. Her slender frame reaching into her bag and pulling out a small book. Come to think of it, that isn't the one I saw her reading at the library. She must be quite a fast reader to get through them at this rate. After about ten minutes of restlessly shuffling in her seat and trying to read, Hanako closes her book and leaves too. How should I, since the assignment's all but finished and there's nothing else to do in the classroom? Not really feeling energetic, I just go straight to my room and read for the rest of the day. Alright, last day. Home stretch, people. Let's go! Ooh! Mommy picnic soon, baby! Yes. Ooh, that's what I've been waiting for. That's what it's all about. Woo! <laughs> uh. The next day, I wake up feeling a little lightheaded. It's almost noon already. Sleeping weight's fine since it's a Sunday and there's no classes. Not just a Sunday, though, but the festival as well. From our window, I can already see some people at the soba booth slinging noodles onto plates for people with a craving for low quality food. I throw back a handful of my morning meds and ponder how to spend the day. 
Let me have a few examples of the coming week, but I don't consider those as ominous as others, so I'm not as worried about them as I probably should be. With no urgent obligations regarding education, fuck. With no urgent obligations regarding education, I should be free to spend the day at the festival as I like. Finishing my morning routine, I exit into the hallway, intending to go out and find something to eat. Passing by his door, I decide to see what Kenji's up to today out of impulse. I'm curious if he has any plans, since everyone else is doing something. Then again, I can picture him having built a soundproof shelter in his room. Or possibly something like a fort, complete with the No Girls Allowed sign. And with the girls crossed out and body scrudely and crudely scrawled underneath it. Knocking on his door, which is luckily devoid of any sign. Devoid of any kind of sign. I hear again the unsettling clicking of at least ten locks being pulled back. The door opens up a crack. Oh, who is it? You're supposed to ask that before you open the door. Oh, it's, uh, it's you. Damn, it's early. It's not really that early. What is it, man? Nothing. I was just gonna ask what you're gonna do today. Half the school is out there already. Out there? Why? What? 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 Is today special? Why are they there? Who are? I can hear them. It's loud. Don't tell me. Has the invasion begun? He suddenly looks more alarmed. What day is it, man? Yeah, I guess you can't see the big wooden booths outside and people selling stuff. What the hell are you talking about? I have my curtains closed at all times to thwart out the snipers. Uh, it's the festival. You know that, right? Oh shit, that's today. Ah, damn. Ah, damn. Damn it! I can't believe I forgot. I don't have my fort finished yet. This is bad. This is going to be a very bad day. It's good you told me this, man. This is going to be a very bad day. Why? Oh, man. They're going to be everywhere. The people. Outside my window. Socializing. Kenji rudges temples nervously, suddenly looking very ill. It's going to be loud as hell. Damn, and I was going to go out today. Now it's ruined. Everything is ruined. This is awful. This sucks. This sucks. What the hell? This really sucks. I can't go anywhere now. There's nowhere to run. Kenji seems nervous. You can even say that he's majorly freaking out. I can't believe this. So that's what today was. Damn. And I couldn't even prepare for it. I couldn't even brace myself. And now it's here and I can't do anything. You should have told me, you should have told me earlier, dude. I mean, at least. I know. But... I could have known earlier. Imagine what I could have accomplished. Sorry, I thought you knew. So, I guess you're not going to do anything today? The weather's even good. Yesterday was really windy, so I thought today would be cold. It's not, though, so there's no reason to just stay inside. Yeah, you should check the festival out. Kenji groans and covers his face with his hands. Ah, no, no, I can't do it. Don't leave me alive out there. I know it. That has to be a joke, but he set up with such a straight face. Relatively straight. Uh, let's see. What are you going to do? We should hang out here. You can help me build my fort. We might still make it if we work together. What am I going to do? I don't have any plans. I don't have any plans. In hindsight, that's really stupid. Maybe I should have asked a girl out. Then again, all things considered, I don't think I could have done anything like that. It's only my first week. A week that I've wasted being awkward around almost everyone, stumbling all over myself trying to get the hang of this place. Thinking about it, what have I accomplished? Who would I have even asked? Damn. It seems like Ken is my only realistic option for a day today. 
This is the most depressing thing that's happened to me since I had a heart attack because a girl confessed her love to me. It can't be helped. I don't know, really. I don't have anything, I guess, but uh, Ford seems a bit excessive. You sure you don't want to go outside? It's not like visitors won't come to the dorms today. He looks thunderstruck by this revelation. Damn, you may have a point. This place is not safe today. We must find somewhere to hide in. He falls silent for a moment, thinking. The roof. What about it? We were going to hide on the roof for today. It's the perfect place. Nobody ever goes up there. Maybe they're one hour. I have to prepare. He slams the door shut and the lock clicks closed. Damn it, what the hell is wrong with Kenji? And to think now I'm going along with this craziness. It makes me really depressed. I'm a failure. Once I step outside, the den of the crowd greets me. The whole school is bustling with activity. There are stalls everywhere, and the crowd swarming between them is considerable. I didn't expect the festival would attract so many visitors. I have to admit, the people in charge of decorating the place put a lot of effort into it, and it really shows. People seem to be enjoying themselves, and the atmosphere is colorful, bright, and happy. That is, if I weren't suddenly in such a foul mood. Gotta turn the tunes up for this ending. At the moment, it's more annoying than anything else. Well, it can't be helped. I decided to stick with my original plan and eat, then I guess I have to at least see what Kenji's up to on the roof. I do a slow circle around the grounds to kill some time, looking at the stalls, but not feeling like playing any of the games anymore. The garish colors grind my eyes and I feel more and more ill by the minute. I can never decide what I want to eat, and the large selection of all the massive energetic festival visitors isn't helping. I just head towards the nearest stall that seems to offer something halfway edible and get in line. It turns out to be noodles. It also turns out to be not very good. Well, at least it's nourishment. It's not like I get to man anything else at this point. As I stir my disagreeable noodles, I oddly wonder what the others are doing right now. Just an enemies are definitely somewhere organizing things. I'd better steer clear of them. I guess they wouldn't forgive me so easily for leaving them alone with this thing. I expect I'm going to be buzzing all over the place, being depressingly cheerful. There's no chance to find her, but no chance to avoid her either, so it doesn't matter. Lily would probably be helping her class with that festival event and entirely too busy for another company. Hanukkah wouldn't want to talk to anyone anyway, either giving to herself or helping Lily. Rin should be tending to her mural and is probably being unhelpful to any hypothetical invested parties. Interested parties. Going there for some peace and quiet seems like the nicest option out of the above, but then again, I can't see having Arp Force on me raising my mood either, so I'll pass. While I was lost in thought, my food seems to have disappeared, and so is my hunger. Sorry, frame dip, waiting for it to uh, finish up. I guess I just blocked, the ex blocked out the experience of eating, which should be a good thing. Satisfied but unsatisfied, I turned to walk towards the main school building. An hour's almost passed already. Uh, the crowd's been thicker in here than it was outside. The hallway's almost unbearable, and I don't even dare to think what it's like inside the classrooms. I head up the stairs to my destination. The roof. Thankfully, the door at the top isn't locked, but now there's a handwritten sign on it. Off limits. <sighs> don't mind if I don't. The festival noise is surprisingly muted up here, and the rooftop looks deserted as expected. Near a place where the cyclone fences collapsed, there's a pile of blankets that seems oddly out of place. Wait. Did that pile just move a little? That would be strange, as there's no wind at all. 
I carefully stick my hand out and give it an experimental prod. Hi. Ah! Startled, I jump back. Who is it? Damn it, Kenji, it's, it's me. Oh, damn, you scared me, man. So what are we doing up here? We're having a picnic. What? Yeah, I have blankets, pretzels, and whiskey. The ultimate setup, man. Whiskey? Aren't you a bit too young to drink alcohol? I'm 20, you know. You're not. I am, and so are you. What? Th that's absurd. Hey, at least you get something out of it. All I get is a bottle of whiskey. He's rambling incoherently, but I decide to play along. So, why do you have a bottle of whiskey? My mom couldn't come visit for the festival. So she sent me some expensive single malt instead. A likely story. Want some? It's not like I have anything to lose. This day can't possibly get any worse. Why not? We sit down on the pile of blankets Kenji apparently dragged up here. He produces an almost full bottle of whiskey and passes it to me. You didn't even bring glasses? No, this is not some romantic princess picnic. What the hell, man? This is a manly picnic. No glasses, no napkins, only whiskey. The beverage of true men. Whatever. And pretzels. I take a closer look at the bottle. Twelve-year-old single malt whiskey, as he said. Shrugging my shoulders, I take a swig. It burns my throat like acid, but the taste isn't unpleasant. I feel it going straight to my head, and the aftertaste lingers in the back of my mouth, craving for another swig. We should outline our counteroffensive and trash talk women here, where they can't hear us. Damn, I forgot to break my graphs. I decide to play a drinking game with myself. Every time Kenji mentions female conspiracy, I'll take a swig. Four hours or five day, four or five hours or possibly several days later, I lost track. You shouldn't feel bad, man. Ease the fuck up. Seriously, seriously. I am relaxed, God damn it. <laughs> I'm telling you as I see it. Think about it. When did housing and land start becoming more and more expensive? When women began entering the workforce, because it creates two income nuclear families. Yeah, I forgot my graphs, but and you'll just have to take my word for it. Women are connected to the decay of all society. I see. That's kind of hard to believe. Even if I say that, somehow everything can make sense seems to make more sense now. It all fits together, but I don't know if it's because I can explain things more clearly when drunk, or because I understand everything better when drunk. No man, think! Think! Think of the deeper implications. People can afford to start saying, Oh well, since two members of the family are now earning money as opposed to one, they can surely afford something like rising cost of ownership. I see your point, but land in Japan has always been expensive. And the price of land generally goes up when a country starts undergoing industrialization. But no, it's because of women. Correlation equals causation, you know. I thought correlation didn't equal causation. Well, whatever, maybe you're right. I am always right, yeah. I bet women create industrialization too, to cover their tracks. How diabolical. So yeah, everyone can go fuck themselves. He stands up, impressing me because I'm fairly sure I couldn't even if I wanted. He yells extremely loudly as if he's lost the concept of volume. I wince and almost want to cover my ears. 
Ah, how nice it would have been if we could be down there. But no, you see, thinking like that's a trap. You think you're missing out on something, but the end of the road is nothing but despair. Kenji snatches back the bottle and leans back his head, attempting to pour the alcohol in his mouth, but he just ends up drenching himself at it. Also, Bagger in the background, I'm maxing this set out. I don't care if I can't speak over it. Or that Hal can't. Damn it, see, my aim is terrible. The bad thing about drink is it only gets worse the longer you go. Today is the day of despair. His voice immediately drops almost to a whisper, but he starts talking much faster than before, slightly slurring his words from the whiskey. As he talks, he weighs the bottle around, spilling some of it here and there. Yeah, you know what was the most shocking event of my life? I have a hazy recollection of him telling me about the second most shocking event of his life, which was a bird sitting on his head. I don't have particularly great expectations of this, but I nodded him to continue anyway. You wouldn't think it, but I had a girlfriend once here. I think it was last year. Yeah, I just blew your mind, huh? See, I've never told that to anyone. It's true, the thought does blow my mind. Suddenly I want the bottle. I take it from Kenji and knock back as much as I can. I was more innocent back then. I thought she was safe, unlike most women. But then one day we engaged in <laughs> sexual intercourse. It was pretty okay. But then immediately followed the event. That's the point of all such things. Something strange and scary happened. He throws himself up against the fence, leaning on it. His eyes narrowed. I started feeling incredibly tired and sleepy. That isn't normal, man. What the fuck? I mean, normally that would be a high tension, adrenaline pumping moment to anyone's life. But my energy levels were dropping like a brick. Something sinister was in the works. I could feel it, and that's what I knew. That women are dangerous, sapping the life force of all men through one commodity that is almost solely theirs to control. Sickening. Yeah, you're better off, dude. Kenji was right, this really is the day of despair. I drink more to avoid having to process what he just said. Now I'm the last sane man in an insane world. When other people realize it, there will be a war. A great war between men and the forces of feminism. But the point is not that all men would fight on my side. Shit sucks. I could set the kind of bar low. Any men are fine. But not the dudes raised by their mother and their sister, that's for sure. And nobody did dick girl porn. <coughs> uh, that situation seems unlikely. Like, it wouldn't happen. Like, like, it's not very likely to happen. <sighs> the alcohol must be working. Regardless, I still feel depressed that I'm up here today. I wasn't really looking forward to the festival with the same excitement as the rest of the school, but still. It would have been nice to have gone with someone. We're up here, it certainly sounds like everyone's having fun. Maybe I am missing out. It's just that there's no one I could have gone with. Or... Maybe there was. So many opportunities looking back on it now. And I must have squandered so many of them. Damn, that is true despair. The worst part is that sometimes I feel like I have no choices in my life, you know? Like I never have a chance to make a decision. Shit just happens. Just like it was all programmed. Like fate or something. Like there's no way I could have a say in what I do. Quick, ask me a question. Uh. Okay, music down. Again. Now! I, I can't really... See? This is just another example of it. Damn. Shit. Damn. Do you see? Now, when I'm trying to go against my destiny and take charge of my life, the opportunity isn't even there. Damn, man. You have failed me. Failed me for the last time. Jerk. He slides to his knees and then falls over onto his side, lying on the gravel of the roof. Hey. Are you okay? No, I'm not okay. Can't you see I'm in despair? He's speaking in a sarcastic tone. 
Suddenly, Kenji sits up, clumsily pats himself clean, and puts his hand out towards me to reach for the bottle. I put it in his hand. What the hell? Damn, you almost killed the entire bottle. See, it's like I have no options in life. This is how it's going to be for the rest of the time. Well, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be like that for the rest of time. <sighs> Whatever he's talking about, my head is spinning. I get up and lean against the fence, hoping it'll help me focus a little. Yeah, I know. We have to fight with all the power we got. It's the only way to live. You're an alright guy. This burly bond is what keeps me going in these dark times. We should go trolling women. Rolling women? What? Trolling women, trolling for women. But we have to do it now, before I lose this alcohol-related courage. He was gesturing wildly, madly even. I take a step backward. He takes a step forward. What's the matter with you? Not in the mood for love? To be frank, no. I take another step backward. He takes another step forward. He leans in extremely uncomfortably close. What the hell? Stop leaning in like that. It bothers me. Leading like what? Hey, you shouldn't lean against the fence like that. It's kind of unsafe. I try to move away from Kenji, but my balance isn't so good. Reeling from the dizziness, so I grab at one of the fence posts, but... Then I feel like give way as soon as I put my weight on it. This isn't good, though my alcohol adult brain doesn't seem to quite be capable of registering why. Kenji's face seems to be getting smaller, though, which is a bit of a relief. Much smaller, in fact, and rapidly so. Seems to be a bit of wood now. Somehow it makes me feel almost weightless. I feel dazed, like my mind has gone blank. I... I'm falling? Oh no, I'm falling! I can see the night sky as I turn over in the air. The bottle floats out of my fingertips and disappears into thin air as I fall. I realize that this is the fitting end to a truly, truly bad day. Ta da! So fucking die, let's go! Let's go, I'm dead! <laughs> Finally! Family picnic! Yay! 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 Hooray! Fuck you yeah! He's all in his arms, silly! <laughs> Oh like, my god! Oh no, Kenji! Gun. I just can't. I can't think straight. And <laughs> you keep that Fujo nonsense out of here. I, I am not a real man. I'm, I'm not just... a Fujo, but I'm just saying. You know, it's how it's supposed to go. It's not my yeah. fault you fucked up. I'm. I'm just gonna throw up. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Just... Oh, <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Vodka. Thank you, everybody. Thank patchy, you. Patchy, 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 patchy. Thank patchy, you all for the applause. Patchy, 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 patchy. Imagine, right? You sent your son to the school, and then like a week later, they're like, yeah, he died. Yeah. And you're like, oh my god, his heart. And they're like, no, he got drunk, broke his back. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. He was. He was 20 after all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just an unfortunate accident. No illegal shenanigans happening here. Yeah, they were drinking right. water. No, maybe they would like hide the evidence, and then this turns into like corpse party. Ooh, <laughs> Ooh. That, that would be Ooh. We should do that. They're hustling. You commit fucking manslaughter, baby. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for Leaf Studios. Yes, thank, thank you, you thank you. So, uh, yes, we've uh, got the best ending out of the way first. However, uh, as much as it's sort of lame to end on a down note, uh, this was a bit of an endurance spot. This is only the beginning. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I sort of overestimated, mm -hmm. uh, how long the manly picnic would take. Then again, I did say thorough run, so... I guess I have nobody but myself to blame on that one. But... And to be fair, it's five girls, or however many, like, at the same time. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. Then again, this isn't my first time crawling a whole shitload of people into one collab, so, uh... I... I made it happen. I can make shit happen. I know what I'm doing. It was lots of fun. You did a really great job. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, but you. But more importantly, all of you. All of you did fantastic as well. So, a <laughs> sane endurance. No so, fantastic action tops. Just the best cast I could possibly ask for for this uh, fun little set <laughs> dig. So, let's yeah, say, uh, right. So, uh, 
Again, this will not be a one and done, though. This is only the beginning of the project right here. That said, uh, hmm. we are... My plan did get derailed because we're going to have to do uh, the rest of Act 1 at a separate stream, but... I'd say we got off to a pretty good nice start here, wouldn't you say? Yeah. yeah. Right. Definitely. Don't know how long it's going to take to organize the five of us again, but... Shouldn't be uh, that much of an issue. Uh, we can discuss that later, because... For sure, for sure. Mm -hmm. Because now, right after I thank all my followers, it's uh, it'll be time for the crazy-ass fucking after party. We have an after party? There's an after party? Did what? you bring whiskey? I brought whiskey. Uh, I can get some I got, I got pretzels. I, got, I think I have lime. I got, <laughs> I got Jose Cuervo and vodka. Is that close enough? Yeah! yeah. yeah. Damn right. We got the tequila. Fuck yeah. Oh boy. But again, before I do that, before we go for the after party, uh, yep. W star M E N. Perfect, perfect. Mm -hmm. So, anyways, let's see who. First, I got to make sure uh, everybody who followed. All right. So, let's start with the. Uh, Okay, uh, 3 or 5 p.m., close enough. So, number one, Chloroform Duck, subscribed to Tier 1 for seven months. Dude's loyal, thank you very much. And of course, uh, Redeem that I'm going to have to ignore until next stream, so. Sorry, Electro Maestro, but you'll have to suck it up. Okay, Rapid Fire. Metro Momoka, follow, thank you very much. Ketchup Ramona, thank you for the follow. Kazu Wazu, thank you for the follow. Hikage Kyun, thank you for the follow. Hito Hito, thank you for the follow. Battle Moose 350. Super R Milkar 50. Hey Moss Channel. Subrosian Dimitri. Freya Celestine. Fear the Shy Guy. Alejandro GL2000. Christian AGC. And Pickerbell 66. Thank you all very much for your follows. I look forward to your continued support. Hopefully, it won't just show up for the Kanawa streams, but. Even if you do only do that, that's fine by me. Follow's a follow. And I appreciate it a bunch. And with that... I think it's time to uh, call it a bit of a stream, huh? I know where we can raid to. Do you? We could go see Kenji. He's playing RimWorld. Uh, the other Kenji, yeah. huh? Alright. Yeah. Other Kenji, hell yeah. Yep, the one who's, uh... Not family picnic. We can yep. ask why he didn't catch us falling from the roof. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> of course, he of just course. Just fall. You have a dick what move a... in it. <laughs> Such a it. fucking jerk move. All right. Thank uh, you for having us. Thank you for accepting yeah. the invite. Yeah. And I. I've had a lot of fun. Right. And hey. let's hope. Uh, let's hope we continue having fun in the uh, streams to come, huh? Hell yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent. Uh, where the fuck is the switch? I think there he is. All right. So, I will go ahead and uh, hit the goodbye screen. So, thank you all, my lovely cast. I cannot wait to do this again very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And It'll be fun. much the same to my wonderful viewers. Thank you all as well. Thank you. Thank you a thousand times. Thank you for making this the best opening to any long-term streaming project that a... Humble fanboy of a ten-year-old visual novel could ever ask for. I don't know what that one's talking about anymore. <laughs> so uh, let's just go ahead and uh, raid NJ, all right? All right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you all very much. A raid message. Oh, raid message. Thank you. Uh, so I actually Family don't picnic. have a Family picnic. Family picnic. Well, uh, I actually had another idea. I was thinking broken heart raid. Nah, he didn't yeah, break his heart though. He fell off. He he fell off a roof. He that's broke a, his back. Yeah. That's Mommy a fair. Picnic. Okay. Mommy that's a. Picnic. Yep. Okay. 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 Mommy I take. Picnic. I take your points. I fucking. Mommy. I take your points. We will do manly picnic raid. Uh, what am I using for an emoji though? Wiggly. Uh, wiggly? which which wiggly though? Any wiggly. Okay. Wiggly. Then uh. Use them if you got them. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
I, I suppose I'll use my own. I don't know how many people in here can use mine, so just substitute it with uh, whatever. Yep, just like that, just like that. So, uh... Golden Kenji, yep, this is the one. Gotta pre-open the stream, let the... Uh, Sekiro, do I have the right one? No, 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 I think, I think we we're talking about Halbernak. Uh, uh, oh! Ah, yeah, uh, my mistake. Hal. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm an idiot, don't mind me. So, uh, uh yeah. yes. It's okay. All right. It's okay. You could be our Baka. <laughs> mm -hmm. Fine, I guess you are my little Baka. Come here. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking murder me. What the hell? Throw me off the roof. I deserve it. <laughs> <laughs> and on that sobering little note, uh, I'm going to throw up the goodbye stream finally, so thank you all again. See you at our at the Act 1 Part 2 stream, whenever that the hell that's going to be. Let's go say hello to Halbernacht. Thank you very much. See ya. Take us away. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.